गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो वी आर डिस्कसिंग दिस कस्टम्स एंड एफ टी पी रिविजन फ्रॉम दट सेट बुक एंड यू कैन सी पेज नंबर वन फोर्टी एट पेज नंबर वन फोर्टी एट so this sec uh, customs and ftp overall put together 25 marks in that customs on an average 20 marks 20 21 marks like that from ftp sometimes 4 marks sometimes 5 marks so this is the usual uh, weightage but actually this is a neglected area because many students will feel like customs and ftp is difficult so therefore we cannot prepare and all but actually customs and ftp portion is not that much the volume wise if you see the volume is very very less but definitely there are some standard areas where we can definitely get the questions like valuation types of customs duty then warehousing provisions duty drawback and baggage these are some standard areas from where definitely we will be getting questions constantly every attempt so we are starting with segment 21 so that is taxable event under customs so first of all when we refer to customs we need to refer to the customs act 1962 and uh, customs act 1962 so we have section 12 as the basis of charge or the levy so as per section 12 if four conditions are satisfied then there will be levy of customs duty what are those four conditions first there must be goods and that goods must be dutiable goods what is the meaning of dutiable goods those goods which are specified in the customs tariff act 1975 are called as dutiable goods so therefore customs act 1962 and customs tariff act 1975 so these are the two acts that we need to understand customs tariff act contains the list of goods import and export of which will be chargeable to customs duty so that list of goods which is there in the customs tariff act is only called as dutiable goods and the other goods are not called as dutiable goods which means we don't have to pay customs duty so what is the first condition there must be goods and the goods must be dutiable goods and such dutiable goods must be imported or exported so import means what so bringing goods from outside india to india is known as import and export means taking goods from india to a place outside india is known as export and that import must be into india or export must be from india so therefore what is the meaning of india for the purpose of customs for the purpose of customs india is up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline but for the purpose of gst so india is up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline but for the purpose of customs india is only up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline so that is called as territorial waters so when the goods are said to be imported into india so whenever goods enter into the territorial waters so then the goods are said to be imported into india whenever the goods cross the territorial waters then the goods are said to be exported from india so the meaning of india for the purpose of customs is only 12 nautical miles however the provisions of customs act will be applicable up to 200 nautical miles for the purpose of the procedures offenses penalties and the powers of the customs officers etc but for the purpose of import or export that is only 12 nautical miles so then whether government goods are also treated on par with uh, normal goods yes because government is also a person under customs so just like government is a person under gst so central government state government is a person under gst like that government is a person under customs also which means any import or export by government so if it is dutiable goods they are required to pay unless otherwise it is exempted through any notification etc so government is also a person under customs act they need to pay customs duty then customs duty is irrespective of whether we get a consideration or not because in case of gst majorly consideration is important only in case of four activities consideration is not important that is drip drip so disposal of business asset on which it is availed related party transactions including distinct persons then import of service from a related person or a principal agent transaction only four places consideration is not required it will become supply but in case of customs consideration is not at all required in order to pay the customs duty so if you are importing the goods for your own purpose you yeah, definitely you need to pay customs duty same way you are exporting goods so that goods are exported as samples etc means we are not going to get any consideration even then we need to pay customs duty if it is dutiable so therefore here consideration is not at all a criteria then we have some important definition so these definitions 
so will not be asked in exam because in new syllabus they have not asked this definition so far but in old syllabus they used to ask these definitions for like uh, four marks two definitions they used to ask for two marks each so therefore it is good to know these definitions and uh, you don't have to buy hard this just try to understand that is sufficient first we need to understand what is the meaning of goods so goods means vessel vehicle and aircraft that is generally how the goods are imported into india the goods are imported into india or exported from india through either airways or waterways or through roadways or railways so then imports will be categorized into three imports by aircraft imports by vessel or imports by vehicle so the vehicle or the vessel or the aircraft which is bringing the goods so not only the goods inside that conveyance but that conveyance itself is also treated as goods for the purpose of customs so which means we need to pay gs customs duty on that conveyance also yes provided that conveyance is imported for using it in india if that conveyance is a foreign going vessel or foreign going aircraft we don't have to pay for example definitely we are not manufacturing aircrafts in india so suppose if there is an indian airline company is importing a aircraft for passenger transportation on the aircraft are they required to pay customs duty or not yes they need to pay customs duty on the aircraft same way we are not manufacturing ships suppose if we import a ship for transportation in india definitely we need to pay customs duty on the ship so therefore that ship or the aircraft and vehicle is also goods and then stores stores refers to passengers uh, like consumption or for the consumption by the vehicle or conveyance during the journey will come under stores like water or beverages or food items spare parts fuel these are all called as stores which are for consumption during the journey whether or not for immediate fitting so then it will be called as stores so the stores is defined below stores means goods for use in a vessel or aircraft and includes fuel fuel spare parts and other articles whether or not for immediate fitting then it will be called as stores and stores will also be treated as goods then baggage refers to passengers luggage passenger or crew luggage is known as baggage in the form of baggage also goods can be imported into india like a person who purchases some articles outside india so in his regular bag he may bring those articles like jewelry or it can be like electronic gadgets etc even those goods also dutiable so we have baggage duty and the rate of baggage duty is 38.5% is taken as a baggage duty rate so therefore we have to pay customs duty on baggage and baggage is also considered as goods then currency and negotiable instruments is treated as goods for the purpose of customs but actually currency and negotiable instruments is not goods for the purpose of gst because money is excluded from the meaning of both goods and services but for the purpose of customs currency and negotiable instruments are treated as goods so which means that whenever i am importing so any currency there is a prescribed limit as per fema so that much only i can import as currency if i am importing more than that as currency so then i need to pay customs duty on the currency that i have imported so which means that i have to pay only the customs duty but i don't have to pay gst why i don't have to pay gst because currency is not covered under goods for the purpose of gst say for example i am bringing some uh, 10000 dollars 10000 dollars 10000 dollars and all is not permitted under fema but in my bag i am bringing some 10000 dollars into india so then in that case whatever is permitted under fema say 2000 dollars is permitted under fema so remaining 8000 dollars i need to pay customs duty and along with customs duty should i pay igst no i don't have to pay igst because money is not goods for the purpose of gst so just the customs duty i need to pay and whenever i am importing why i need to pay igst also along with import because we had something called as cvd and sad countervailing duty and special additional duty in the past so that was to counterbalance excise duty and sales tax as excise duty and sales tax got subsumed into gst so therefore the cvd and sad also got subsumed into gst so in the place of that cvd sad we are paying igst so on import we need to pay even igst also then uh, then goods includes any other kind of movable property so whether it is tangible or intangible every kind of movable property will be coming under goods then stores already we have seen import and export import means what bringing goods into india from outside india export means what taking goods from india to a place outside india is known as export and what is the meaning of india 
India for the purpose of customs includes only territorial waters of India. So, territorial waters is up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline. So, all provisions of Customs Act will be applicable. There is something called as exclusive economic zone. Exclusive economic zone is up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline. So, but this exclusive economic zone is not considered as India. That exclusive economic zone is only for the purpose of powers of the customs officer to arrest or search a vessel or vehicle etc. So, for that purpose only we have this exclusive economic zone. Then high seas is beyond 200 nautical miles from the baseline is known as high seas. That is not at all considered as India and the provisions of customs act will not be applicable there and these are considered as international waters. Now, we have something called as customs area and even Indian customs waters if you see. So, as the meaning of India is only up to 12 nautical miles, but the provisions of customs act is applicable up to 200 nautical miles due to that reason. Indian customs waters means it is not 12 nautical miles. Indian customs waters means up to 200 nautical miles that is exclusive economic zone will be considered under Indian customs waters. Then what is that beyond 200 nautical miles known as high seas? Customs area means in every customs port or airport not entire area belongs to customs authorities. There will be some selected area or a notified area where the customs authorities will operate. That area where they operate is known as customs area. The area under customs station includes any area in which the import or export goods are ordinarily kept before clearance. Then dutiable goods. What is the meaning of dutiable goods? On which we need to pay duty and we have not yet paid duty is known as dutiable goods. Upon payment of duty, it will become duty paid goods. So on goods which are chargeable to duty, when we know that it is chargeable to duty, if they are covered under customs tariff act, then it will be called as dutiable goods. So only those goods which are covered under customs tariff act are called as dutiable goods. So therefore, only when those goods are covered under this tariff act, then we call this as dutiable goods and then only it will be chargeable to duty and on which duty has not yet been paid. So upon payment of duty, it will become duty paid goods until that point of time, it is dutiable goods. Then export goods means the goods which are to be taken outside India and who will be called as exporter. Exporter will be owner or beneficial owner or any person holding himself to be exporters. For example, if I am manufacturing the goods and I am exporting the goods, I will be called as owner of the goods and I am manufacturer exporter. If I am manufacturing but I do not have the license to export but you are exporting it. So then you are called as merchant exporter. You are holding yourself to be exporter, but you are not the actual exporter. You are holding yourself to be exporter. I am only the owner of the goods and you are exporting the goods. So you are also treated as exporter for the purpose of customs. I am the beneficial owner of the goods. I am also treated as exporter for the purpose of customs. If I am manufacturing, I am exporting, I will be called as manufacturer exporter. If I am manufacturing and you are exporting, I will be called as supporting manufacturer means I am the beneficial owner, I am also exporter. And suppose if I am manufacturing and you are exporting, you are the beneficial owner of that, uh, I am the beneficial owner and you are holding yourself to be exporter, that is merchant exporter. So literally who will be traded as exporter? Manufacturer exporter, beneficial owner or merchant exporter, all these three will be traded as exporter. Beneficial owner means who? On whose behalf the goods are imported or exported is known as beneficial owner. I am the owner of the goods, but I am not exporting, I am not importing. You are doing it on behalf of me. Then on behalf of whom you are doing import or export, so that person will be called as beneficial owner. Then imported goods means any goods brought into India from a place outside India. Then importer, same way like exporter, how exporter is owner, beneficial owner or any person holding himself to be exporter, same way importer is owner or beneficial owner or any person holding himself out to be importer. Then baggage, baggage includes unaccompanied baggage also. So baggage generally is what passengers luggage and baggage includes unaccompanied baggage. Unaccompanied baggage means a bag which is coming either before passengers arrival or after passengers arrival is known as unaccompanied baggage. So that is sometimes the bag will come first and thereafter the passenger will come. So that is unaccompanied baggage. Sometimes a passenger will come and the bag will not come. The bag will be struck somewhere. So then thereafter 
So after arrival of the passenger, the bag is coming. So that is known as unaccompanied baggage. Then, but does not include motor vehicle. So no one will bring a motor vehicle as a baggage. But if they bring that motor vehicle, so that will never be considered as baggage. So that will be treated as normal commercial goods which are being imported. Then coastal goods. Coastal goods means, so goods which are transported between a port in India to a port out uh, in India that is between port in India to another port in India which means it is, these are not imported goods or exported goods. Coastal goods are those goods which are being sold in India. So between one port in India to another port in India. So like say for example Mumbai port to Surat port or uh, Mumbai port to Chennai port. So these are some situations within India only the goods are transported but it is not transported in inland waters it is transported in coastal waters then it will be coastal goods. Foreign going vessel or aircraft, any vessel or, going, vessel or aircraft which is going from India to a place outside India, so carrying the goods or passengers that is called as a foreign going vessel or aircraft. Not only that, even a navy vessel which is belonging to foreign government but taking part in any navy exercises will also come under foreign going vessel or aircraft. And any vessel or aircraft which is engaged in fishing operations, not carrying goods or passengers, but is going for fishing operations beyond the territorial waters, that is also called as a foreign going vessel or aircraft. Then vessel or aircraft proceeding to a place outside India for any purpose, means not carrying goods or people. So, but for any purpose, means like army aircrafts or navy vessels, etc. So, which are taken outside India for what so purpose it may be. So jet flights etc that will be called as foreign going vessel or aircraft. So why we need to understand this because so till the time it is a foreign going vessel or aircraft. So whenever we are making supply of goods to a foreign going vessel or aircraft it will be treated as exports for the purpose of duty drawback. There is something called as duty drawback. Duty drawback means whatever customs duty we paid on import we will get as a refund. When we will get that as a refund whenever we are making sale that is export we will get the refund of customs duty paid on import. I am importing some goods and I am exporting those goods. Upon import whatever customs duty I paid I will get it as a refund upon export. So therefore export not necessary physically export even if I sell goods to a foreign going vessel or aircraft it will be treated as export. So that is why we need to know this definition. Then next what are the various options available to the importer for import of goods? There are two options available to the importer. Once the goods are you know brought into India, the goods will be unloaded in the customs area. After the goods are unloaded into the customs area, so importer is having two options. Option one, the goods can be taken directly for his home consumption by filing a bill of entry called as bill of entry for home consumption and he need to pay the customs duty. So the goods are imported in port or airport. So now I wanted those goods. So I can file a bill of entry for home consumption, pay the customs duty and take those goods to my place. That is known as, so clearance for home consumption upon payment of customs duty and by filing bill of entry for home consumption. Option two is I can import the goods and deposit the goods in the warehouse without payment of customs duty. And only upon payment of customs duty, I will clear the goods from the warehouse. For import of goods and depositing into the warehouse without payment of customs duty, I need to file into bond bill of entry. And again for clearance from the warehouse, at that time I need to pay customs duty. I do not have to pay customs duty at the time of deposit, only at the time of clearance I need to pay customs duty. So then it will be called as ex bond bill of entry. Without filing bill of entry, the unloaded goods can neither be cleared for home consumption nor cleared for warehousing means the goods will be under the control of a custodian till the time we file, importer files the bill of entry. So there are three bill of entries, bill of entry for home consumption, bill of entry into bond bill of entry or ex bond bill of entry. Bill of entry for home consumption is for clearance of the goods directly to the importer's place upon payment of customs duty. Bill of entry into bond bill of entry is for depositing the goods in the customs warehouse without payment of customs duty. Ex bond bill of entry is for clearance of goods from the warehouse upon payment of customs duty. Now I have to file either bill of entry for home consumption or into bond bill of entry then only the goods can be taken outside the customs port or customs airport. Until that point of time the goods will be under the control of a person called as custodian of goods. So goods can be cleared to warehouse without payment of customs duty but thereafter for clearance we need to pay customs duty and bill of entry can be filed 
before arrival or after arrival but the time limit prescribed is before the date of arrival so which means if today the vessel or aircraft arrives i need to file the bill of entry by yesterday so let it be holiday or not public holiday sunday whatever it may be so if I, if the vessel or aircraft arrives today i should have filed the bill of entry by yesterday so before the date of arrival otherwise there is a late fee that is payable for delay in filing bill of entry then as clearance of goods from the warehouse is the taxable event here so only when the goods are cleared from warehouse at that time whatever is the rate that is there that should be taken even for the purpose of levy for example goods are imported at the time when we are importing we don't have to pay customs duty because they are non dutiable goods not covered under customs tariff act but at the time when we clear the goods from the warehouse so at the time of deposit the goods are exempted or non dutiable but at the time of clearance from the warehouse the goods became dutiable should we pay the duty or not yes we need to pay the duty same way at the time of import and deposit of goods into the warehouse the goods are dutiable but at the time of clearance from the warehouse the goods are exempted so we don't have to pay customs duty which means clearance of goods from the warehouse is the taxable event and therefore at that time whatever is the rate or whatever is the levy that is only relevant then customs warehouse means it is not a warehouse which is owned by the customs department because long back customs department stopped owning the warehouses so then these warehouses are licensed by the customs department so therefore customs officer will give license to the warehouse and any person who is satisfying the eligibility criteria can take a license to operate a warehouse so which means can importer convert his own warehouse into a customs warehouse yes he can do that what is the advantage that importer will get so that the goods can be imported and it can be kept in his warehouse without payment of customs duty and only when he clears that goods from his warehouse for production at that time only he will pay customs duty that advantage is there and many importers will take a license for their own warehouse as customs warehouse so they can defer the customs duty payable they don't have to pay customs duty now only when they are actually utilizing the goods from the warehouse they will pay customs duty if importer has a warehouse for which license is obtained then he can defer the customs duty payable till the time he uses such goods as clearance from warehouse is only the taxable event due to that reason then what are the various documents involved in case of import and export in case of import so the import can be by airways or by waterways or by vehicle and same way export can be by these three modes so import there are two parties that is person in charge and the importer person in charge means the person who is person in charge of the conveyance for example vessel the person in charge will be master of the vessel or the captain of the ship in case of aircraft the pilot in case of vehicle the driver or guard etc will be person in charge so that person in charge of the conveyance is required to file one document with the customs officer so in case of import the document name is import manifest in case of vessel arrival manifest in case of aircraft and import report in case of vehicle these are the three documents so depending upon the mode of conveyance they need to file and this document contains what this document contains the details of the goods which they are bringing into india so that conveyance in that conveyance they are bringing some goods so that details will be mentioned in this import manifest arrival manifest or import report now the customs officer after verifying these goods will allow these goods to be unloaded until that point of time customs officer will not allow these goods to be unloaded then importer parallelly has to file one document called as bill of entry bill of entry is a document which will be filed by the importer for claiming the ownership of the goods and for payment of customs duty so therefore in case of import the document to be filed by person in charge is import manifest in case of vessel then arrival manifest in case of aircraft and import report in case of vehicle but all these three cases <coughs> the document to be filed by the importer is bill of entry then in case of export the document to be filed by person in charge is export manifest in case of vessel departure manifest in case of aircraft and export report in case of vehicle so these are the three documents parallelly so therefore at the time of export also person in charge should tell what goods they are taking outside india so therefore that detail should be mentioned in these documents export manifest departure manifest and export report then what is the document to be filed by the exporter in case of vessel and aircraft the name of the document is shipping bill and in case of vehicle the name of the document is bill of export so to 
to claim that this is my goods and to pay the customs duty at the time of export they need to file this document. Then person in charge means master of the vessel, pilot of the aircraft, conductor or guard of the vehicle. And only after filing import manifest, grant of entry inwards is given for the vessel to enter into India. So until that point of time, the vessel cannot enter into India. So person in charge of the vessel has to file one document called as import manifest. So that import manifest when he files with the customs officer. So customs officer will grant entry inwards. Only then the vessel can enter into India and the goods can be unloaded. Until that point of time, the vessel cannot enter. But the concept of grant of entry inwards is not applicable in case of aircraft. In case of aircraft, because till the time they give grant of entry inwards, the aircraft cannot be staying there because we don't have parking space in the sky. So to park the aircraft, so therefore the aircraft will come here and thereafter after filing arrival manifest, so they will be giving grant of entry inwards not to come into the airport, but to unload the goods. So the concept of grant of entry inwards is not applicable in case of aircraft and vehicle, but arrival manifest or import report should be filed before arrival. Along with bill of entry, bill of entry is a document to be filed by importer. So along with bill of entry, the importer should prove that he is the owner of the goods. How to prove that he is the owner of the goods? For that he need to present one document of title to the goods. What is the document of title to the goods? Airway bill in case of aircraft, bill of lading in case of vessel and lorry receipt or railway receipt in case of vehicle. Who will give these documents? The shipping company or the conveyance operator or the transporter will be giving this document to the exporter at the time the goods are handed over to the shipping company. And now the exporter should send that document, email that document to the importer. And the importer only when he submits the document, bill of lading or airway bill or lorry receipt or railway receipt, the goods will be handed over to him. Otherwise, he cannot be treated as owner of the goods. Then, so these are required to claim the ownership of the goods and invoice raised by him by the supplier outside India should also be filed. So at the time of import, the importer has to file three documents, bill of entry to pay the customs duty or bill of entry for warehousing, either in home consumption or for warehousing that is into bond bill of entry. Second document will be document of title to the goods to claim the ownership of the goods and third document will be, so that is, you know, invoice which is raised by the exporter to importer that document also should be filed. Then what is the taxable event and relevant date for determination of rate of duty? So the taxable event in case of import is as and when goods are coming into India. So that will be called as as and when goods are coming into India that is what is the meaning of India here territorial waters. But date of crossing the customs barrier will be called as taxable event. That is, whenever the goods are imported into India, so that is it crosses the territorial waters, but that is not the taxable event. So whenever it crosses the customs barrier, that will be called as taxable event. So as per Kiran spinning mills case and garden silk mills case. So as per these two cases, it is given that so only when goods cross the customs barrier, the goods are said to be imported. What is the meaning of customs barrier, customs control? That's the reason why when the goods are imported and kept in warehouse, we are not required to pay customs duty because still the goods are under the control of customs. So which means only when you cross the customs gate or in case of warehouse goods, whenever you are taking the goods out of the warehouse, at that time only we need to pay customs duty. So because <coughs> the taxable event is at the time of crossing the customs barrier but not at the time when it is imported into India. Then which means when the goods are imported into India and kept in the Porter airport but we did not take it out of the Porter airport from there it is exported to other country. Is the goods said to be imported? No. Because the goods did not cross the customs gate so it is still inside the customs only. So from there itself when you are taking outside India it is not treated as import. Only when you cross it and it enters into the land mass of India, then only it will be called as goods said to be imported as per Kiran spinning mills and garden silk mills case. Then what is the relevant date for determination of rate of duty? In case of option 1, option 1 is what import for home consumption, option 2 is import and depositing it in the warehouse. In case of import of goods for home consumption, 
the relevant date for determination of rate of duty is date of presentation of bill of entry or grant of entry inwards whichever is later. So that is whenever we present the bill of entry or whenever the grant of entry inwards is given. So grant of entry inwards is given by whom customs officer will give grant of entry inwards to the vessel and importer will be filing bill of entry whichever is later will be taken as the relevant date for determination of rate of duty. So here which will be later usually, usually when we need to file bill of entry before the date of arrival itself we need to file bill of entry. So definitely whichever is later is grant of entry inwards. Suppose if you file a bill of entry late then already vessel has arrived and thereafter we file a bill of entry. So whichever is later will be the date of filing bill of entry. So therefore whichever is the later date that should be taken as relevant date for determination of rate of duty that is date of presentation of bill of entry or grant of entry inwards whichever is later. Whereas in case of aircraft and vehicle as grant of entry inwards is irrelevant there that is why we are taking instead of grant of entry inwards date of arrival. So date of presentation of bill of entry or date of arrival whichever is later. Now you may get a doubt here that is in case of presentation of bill of entry is before the date of arrival but the rate of duty is whichever is later in the bill of entry I selected one rate that is say 10 percent but whichever is later so on the date of arrival it became 12 percent then how much I need to pay 12 percent I need to pay at the time of presenting bill of entry the rate was 10 percent at the time of arrival it is 12 percent so whichever is later will be 12 percent so therefore I have to pay 12 percent but already in bill of entry I paid 10 percent then that extra 2 percent how I can pay so we need to amend the bill of entry already whatever bill of entry that has been filed if there is a change in rate we need to amend the bill of entry and we need to file the amended bill of entry so that the relevant rate will be whichever is later so now we need to amend the bill of entry for 12 percent and we need to pay 12 percent as the rate of duty that is this then in case of option 2 option 2 is depositing the goods in warehouse so and clearance of goods from the warehouse at a later point of time here what should be taken as the relevant date for determination of rate of duty it is ex bond bill of entry that is at the time when we actually clear the goods from the warehouse we will file one bill of entry called as ex bond bill of entry at the time of filing ex bond bill of entry whatever is the rate that should be taken for rate of duty at the time of depositing the goods in the warehouse 10 percent at the time of clearance from the warehouse it is 12 percent so therefore the relevant rate is 12 percent because at the time of clearance whatever is the rate that should only be taken then in case of exchange rate so because usually in case of import the goods will be invoiced in foreign currency then we need to convert it into Indian rupees for converting it to Indian rupees what should be taken as the relevant date for determination of exchange rate in case of option 1 we file bill of entry that bill of entry only will be taken only one bill of entry we file in case of import of goods for home consumption only one bill of entry we file that is bill of entry for home consumption so on that date bill of entry whatever is the exchange rate that should be taken whereas in case of warehousing we file two bill of entries one for depositing the goods in warehouse another for taking the goods from the warehouse so which bill of entry is relevant for depositing the goods in warehouse we file one into bond bill of entry now that into bond bill of entry will be relevant for determination of exchange rate so for rate of duty in case of vessel so option one date of presentation of bill of entry or grant of entry inwards whichever is later in case of aircraft and vehicle date of presentation of bill of entry or arrival of the aircraft or vehicle whichever is later in case of option two a relevant rate for rate of duty is ex bond bill of entry for exchange rate in case of option 1 date of presentation of bill of entry for home consumption whereas in case of option 2 it is date of presentation of into bond bill of entry then export in case of export what is the taxable event date of crossing the territorial waters is considered as taxable event as per Rajendra dyeing and printing mills case and sun exports case that is whenever the goods are crossing the territorial waters so territorial waters is up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline in Rajendra dyeing and printing mills case a ship is going and within the territorial waters the ship has sunk within the territorial waters 
Now the goods are not said to be exported because it did not cross the territorial waters. Suppose if the ship has sunk after territorial waters, will the goods are said to be exported? Yes, the goods are said to be exported. So remember, ship sinking, Rajendra dying. So that is Rajendra dying and printing mills case is related to that ship getting sunk in the territorial waters. Then sun exports case. In sun exports case, what has happened? The goods cross the territorial waters, but because of the engine trouble, the goods return. So then whether the goods are said to be exported? Yes. As it crossed the territorial waters, it may return due to engine trouble, but still it will be treated as export as and when it crossed the territorial waters. So therefore, that is the meaning of export as per these two cases, date of crossing the territorial waters. Then relevant date for determination of rate of duty as per section 16. For import, the rate of duty and exchange rate is section 15, just like time of supply in case of GST. So therefore, section 15 is for import and section 16 is for export. Then what is the relevant date for determination of rate of duty in case of export? Let export order. That is, as and when we present the shipping bill or bill of export with the customs officer, the customs officer will pass a let export order. So that let export order will be taken as the relevant date for rate of duty in case of export. Then for exchange rate, import exporter will be filing one document. What is the document to be filed by the exporter? Shipping bill or bill of export. You can see various documents to be filed by the exporter. Shipping bill or bill of export will be filed. So on the date of shipping bill or bill of export, whatever is the exchange rate that is there, that should be taken. So in case of export, just two points we need to remember. That is rate of duty is on let export order and exchange rate is on the date of submission of shipping bill. Then exchange rate determined by whom should be taken? Exchange rate determined by CBIC should be considered. And in case of improper import or improper export, relevant date is the date of payment of duty. That is, we are not filing any bill of entry or shipping bill. The goods are improperly imported, exported means smuggled goods. In case of smuggled goods, as and when it is caught, at that time they will be collecting duty. So on that day, whatever is the rate, that is only relevant for payment of customs duty. So these are the basic points that we have. So three sections we have in this introduction or taxable event. <coughs> that is section 12, levy, section 15, that is relevant date for rate of duty and exchange rate in case of import. Section 16, relevant rate for rate of duty and, ex and exchange rate in case of export. Now we are moving on to the next segment that is classification of goods under customs. So here, so we have in the classification of goods under customs, so tariff we need to understand. So for the purpose of interpretation of tariff, they have given some rules. So whatever imported goods and exported goods will be specified in a tariff called as Customs Tariff Act 1975. The tariff will not be arranged in a simple manner. The tariff is divided into sections. So like group of now items will be grouped into one particular section. Thereafter, the section is divided into chapters and thereafter in each and every chapter, we have the headings, different, different headings with rate of duty. So now, so general interpretative rules, they have given something to understand the tariff. So first rule number one says, the titles of the sections and chapters and subchapters are for reference only and classification is based on headings read with relevant section notes and chapter notes. For example, for every section and chapter, there will be some notes. So just based on heading itself, we should not classify. We need to read the section note or chapter note. If the section note or chapter note says that this product will not come in this chapter, then it will not come in that chapter. So therefore, just based on headings itself, we cannot classify. We need to read the section notes and chapter notes. Right now, you remember that that is enough. So therefore, classification is based on section notes and chapter notes along with headings. Then number two, any reference to goods includes, so incomplete or unfinished goods. For example, I am importing a car. Car is having a heading. So car, motor car and there is a rate. Now I am importing a car without wheels. So car without wheels is nowhere in the heading. So now car without wheels should also be treated as car only. And car without seats should also be treated as car. So any reference to completed goods includes incomplete or unfinished goods. 
so when we are importing some incomplete or unfinished goods so where it should be classified it should be classified as completed goods and whatever is the rate applicable to the completed goods the same rate should be taken for that incomplete or unfinished goods also means WIP when we are importing some goods in WIP stage so then its finished goods will have a rate now the same rate will be applicable for WIP also that is the meaning of rule 2a rule 2b is any reference to a material includes combination of that material with other material for example we are importing so coffee we have coffee separate heading and chicory separate heading we have suppose if you are importing coffee with chicory so usually filter coffees and all so they will be mixing so chicory which is a plant extract so that plant extract will be mixed along with the coffee in order to reduce the caffeine content in the coffee so this usually 80 20 ratio the coffee will be there so 80 percent will be coffee powder and 20 percent will be chicory so we have coffee separate heading chicory separate heading but coffee with chicory so we don't have any separate heading so therefore any reference to coffee includes coffee mixed with other material so therefore this coffee with chicory will be coming under so this coffee only so any reference to material includes combination of that material with other material another example we have natural rubber so which is taken from the plant and synthetic rubber which is taken from this HDPE granules that is plastic granules so that is synthetic rubber so therefore when we are importing natural rubber mixed with synthetic rubber it should be classified as natural rubber only same way article of gold partly with gold and partly with copper will also be classified under articles of gold only like that any reference to a material includes combination of that material with the other material then rule 3a says that when there is a specific heading and there is a general heading we need to always prefer specific heading over general heading say for example we are importing electric shavers electric shavers can come under two headings heading number one is electromechanical domestic appliances with self-contained electric motor so which means so there is a domestic appliance with motor so that's a general heading not just shaver any domestic appliance will come under that heading whereas another heading is there which is a specific heading shavers and hair clippers so the shavers and hair clippers is a specific heading for electric shaver than electromechanical domestic appliances so when there is a specific heading and a general heading we need to always prefer specific heading over general heading then next rule 3b says classification shall be as per essential character if a particular product is mixture or composite of goods containing different materials say for example we are importing a geometry box and that uh, geometry box will have one steel box then drawing instruments pencil eraser etc so but what is the essential character there pencil eraser is essential character or the steel box is essential character or the drawing instruments is essential character drawing instruments is essential character so this entire geometry box will be classified under drawing instruments like that whenever we are importing article which is composite of multiple articles we need to classify based on the essential character then rule 3c if both the goods are if the both the headings are specific so then we need to select that heading which comes last in the numerical order for example so we are importing a motor vehicle for carrying people so we have one heading and we are importing motor vehicle for carrying goods we have another heading 8302 is motor vehicles for transportation of people 8304 like that another heading is there that is motor vehicle for transportation of goods now we are importing a motor vehicle which is used for both the purposes like it can be used for transporting people as well as goods for example if you see in India and all Tata Ace you take so they carry goods also they carry people also in that so like that lorry and all so they carry you know buffaloes they carry animals and they carry human beings also for marriage function and all in one goods carriage they will carry human beings also in that lorries so therefore it can be used for both goods as well as passengers then how will you classify so which comes last in the numerical order what is last in the numerical order 8304 sorry 8704 like that which comes last in the numerical order there it should be classified the latter the better so if both the headings are specific then the latter the better which comes last in the numerical order under that heading it should be classified 
then next akin goods akin goods refers to similar goods similar goods means we are importing this uh, car sun glare films so sun protector film will be there na for the car windows we will be importing that and for that we don't have any heading so this will be classified under curtains and blinds so because curtains and blinds we use in the house for the purpose of that sunlight uh, protection only so therefore under that uh, curtains and blinds this car sun protector film will be classified so that is akin goods ultimately you need to pay customs duty so if that product is not there under similar goods it will be classified that is rule 4 rule 5 packing materials and uh, packing containers will be classified along with the main articles which are sold for example we are importing a violin violin is having 15% rate of basic customs duty we are importing a violin box to keep the violin we are importing a violin box so that violin box is not anywhere in the heading so then in that case whatever is the rate applicable to violin violin box is used for what only to keep violin so therefore we need to take the rate applicable to the violin like that jewelry box jewelry box is only to keep the jewelry so we cannot carry tomatoes and potatoes in jewelry box so only for carrying jewelry only so therefore whatever is the rate applicable to jewelry that will be applicable for the jewelry box also that is this packing containers and packing materials can be classified along with the main articles which are sold rule 6 says goods can be compared for classification at the same level only which means we have one heading and one subheading so we cannot compare so we can compare heading and heading subheading and subheading tariff heading and tariff heading so at the same level equal level only we can do the comparison that is rule 6 so these are the rules that we need to just understand it once so far they have not asked this maybe in mcq they can ask this but rule numbers are not important but what is the provision inside that rules that you need to remember then next we are moving on to the practical area that is segment 23 types of customs duties so we need to understand first the customs duty computation so this computation of customs duty will be made in three steps so we are now discussing computation of customs duty so how to compute customs duty payable computation of customs duty payable computation of customs duty payable we are trying to understand the format with respect to this first we need to see step 1 which contains three things so that is basic customs duty basic customs duty at given rate so that rate will be given in the question itself so we don't have to bother anything about it so basic customs duty is the first one and basic customs duty at the given rate in the question but which rate should be taken we need to apply date of presentation of bill of entry or grant of entry inverts whichever is later or date of presentation of bill of entry or arrival whichever is later like that we need to take so this is computation of customs duty payable in case of import in case of import not in case of export so in case of import so first basic customs duty at the rate given on what on assessable value we need to arrive at the value so on that value we need to compute this basic customs duty so that is the first thing then to this basic customs duty we need to add social welfare surcharge this social welfare surcharge will be always at the rate of 10% on basic customs duty so whether it is given in the question or not we need to take social welfare surcharge in the answer so question may be silent sometimes they will give social welfare surcharge as applicable sometimes they will give social welfare surcharge 10% sometimes there won't be any reference to social welfare surcharge even then for the basic customs duty we need to add social welfare surcharge at always 10% on basic customs duty so that is the second thing then we have something called as cvd so cvd is countervailing duty so this countervailing duty at the rate again it will be given in the question itself so we need to take that on assable value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge assable value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge on that we need to compute cvd and cvd is counterbalance of excise duty at present we are having excise duty only on three articles 
excise duty is applicable only on three articles at present. What are those three articles on which excise duty is present at present? So that is alcoholic liquor, alcoholic liquor for human consumption, alcoholic liquor for human consumption and then we have so petroleum products, petroleum products. So for example, on import of alcohol, we need to pay CVD. Then on import of petroleum products, that is ATF, aviation turbine fuel or any crude oil, etc., we need to pay CVD. Then right now we have excise duty on tobacco and tobacco products. So on tobacco and tobacco products also, when we are importing, we need to pay CVD. So CVD is not applicable on all goods, applicable only on these three goods. So therefore, if the question has these three goods and the rate is given in the question, we need to take that rate and we need to multiply only on a civil value, basic customs duty and social welfare surcharge. So then we get step one. So this step one total is known as customs duties excluding additional customs duties. Customs duties excluding additional additional customs duties. This is step number one. Then step number two. In step number two, what will happen is that, so we need to take in step number two, so first we have safeguard duty. So safeguard duty is levied under section 8B of Customs Tariff Act and this will be at the rate. So at the rate given. So that rate will be given in the question itself. So we don't have to do anything with respect to this. Just take the rate given in the question and it should be multiplied on. Sometimes it will be taken on a civil value or sometimes it is on the landed value. Sometimes it is on a civil value, sometimes it is on landed value. So what is this landed value? Landed value means, landed value means that is a civil value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge is known as landed value. How we know we need to take a civil value or landed value? That will be given in the question itself. So we don't have to worry. So rate also will be given and that rate should be multiplied on assable value or landed value also will be given in the question. So just we need to take that and we need to multiply. So we get the safeguard duty. So then we need to take so anti-subsidy duty. There is the next thing that is called as ASD, anti-subsidy duty. This anti-subsidy duty under section 9. So all these sections are of Customs Tariff Act. So 1975, it is not of Customs Act. It is Customs Tariff Act 1975. At Again, here also it is given in the question itself. So it will be given in the question itself. We need to take the given rate and it should be computed on same, a civil value or landed value. So that fact that we need to take it on a civil value or landed value will also be given in the question. So just take the rate given in the question and you need to. So whether on safeguard duty and anti-subsidy duty, we need to add social welfare surcharge. No, because social welfare surcharge will come in step one, but the safeguard duty and anti-subsidy duty will come in step two. So therefore, on this safeguard duty, anti-subsidy duty, should we calculate any social welfare surcharge not required because social welfare surcharge already we have computed above. So then third one, we call it as anti-dumping duty. So this anti-dumping duty, so will be under section 9A, anti-dumping duty under section 9A. So this will be computed not at the given rate. So we have a different computation for anti-dumping duty. Anti-dumping duty will be A, <coughs> dumping margin, A, dumping margin or B, injury margin, A, dumping margin or B, injury margin, injury margin whichever is lower, whichever is lower will be taken as anti-dumping duty and we need to compute that. So then we will be getting step number two total. So what is dumping margin? So anti-dumping duty is applicable when goods are being exported by the exporter to India at a cheaper rate. So they are dumping the goods into India, then there will be anti-dumping duty. So dumping margin, so who is dumping? exporter is dumping. So then we need to see the dumping margin from the exporter point of view. Then injury margin, who is getting injured? The domestic manufacturer is getting injured. So we need to see the injury margin from the importer point of view. 
So now dumping margin means say for example, they are selling in their country, exporter is selling in their country for $100 and they are exporting to India at $75 which means they are selling at a price less than their selling price to India. So therefore, what is the dumping margin? $25. Then this article which is imported into India, so is at $80 but is being sold in India for $120. Then what is the injury margin? Here in India, the normal selling price is $120, but we are importing in India for $80. Then the difference is what injury margin. To that extent, the domestic manufacturer is injured. I am selling at $120, you are importing for $80. Then who will buy from me? Definitely people will buy from you only. So then I am getting injured. So to what extent it is injury margin? $40. So therefore, $25 or $40, whichever is lower, will be taken as the... <coughs> anti-dumping duty. So, dumping margin or injury margin whichever is lower. So, this three when we add we get customs duty excluding IGST and GST compensations. So, the second step total is known as customs duties excluding IGST. Customs duties excluding IGST. Then last step. In step number three we need to take again three duties that is IGST. IGST will be computed at, it will be given in the question itself. Rate will be given in the question itself because it is the GST rate. So, at the given rate, but IGST is computed on what? While computing IGST as per section 15 to A, all taxes, duties and says by whatever name called should be included. So, therefore, we need to take step 1 plus step 2 means assable value Assable value plus step 1 plus step 2. Assable value plus step 1 plus step 2 should be taken for the purpose of computing IGST. Means we need to take everything so far. Assable value plus all these three basic custom duty, social per surcharge, and CVD. Then safeguard duty, anti dumping duty, and anti subsidy duty. And on that we need to compute IGST. And then we have compensation says. GST compensation says, but GST compensation says is not applicable on all goods. So, therefore, definitely that should also be given in the question itself. So, given on what? This will be computed on same assable value plus step 1 plus step 2. So, on that we need to take. So, this is GST compensation says. Then finally, we need to take SAD, special additional duty. This special additional duty is at the rate of, so again this will also be given in the question itself, special additional duty. So this will be computed on what? Just like IGST, GST compensation says, it should be also computed on assable value plus step 1 plus step 2. So on that we need to compute SAD, but SAD is to counterbalance sales tax. At present, SAD is applicable only on one product that is on import of petroleum products, on import of petroleum products, on import of petroleum products, we need to pay SAD. On alcohol, no, on alcohol we don't have to pay SAD. So, only on import of petroleum products we need to pay SAD, which means IGST, GST compensation says and SAD are mutually exclusive because SAD is applicable on petroleum products. At present on petroleum products we don't have GST. So, which means wherever SAD comes, IGST, GST compensation says will not come. Wherever IGST, GST compensation says comes, SAD will not come. So, now if you total this step 1, step 2, step 3, so then the total will be called as total customs duties payable. So, total customs duties payable is this. So, this is the template that we need to remember for the purpose of arriving at the customs duty payable. Okay. Now, so that is what I have given here. First, we will have basic customs duty. So, basic customs duty will be at the applicable rate given in the question compute on assable value. And we have two types of basic customs duty, standard rate and preferential rate. Standard rate means what? Standard rate means, so that will be like import from any country, the standard rate will be applicable. Whereas, preferential rate, preferential rate means if you are importing from a country with which India is having a trade agreement, 
then the preferential rate will be applicable. So at the applicable rate on assemble value we need to take. Then social welfare surcharge at the rate of 10% of basic customs duty. Right now education says and secondary and higher education says is not there. It is only social welfare surcharge. Then integrated tax and GST compensation says at the rate given in the question compute on assemble value plus all customs duties above. Then note 1 in the past imports countervailing duty under 3.1 was levied to counterbalance excise duty and special additional duty under 3.5 was levied to counterbalance sales tax. However, now on account of GST, its applicability is limited only to few goods. What are those few goods already we have seen? So in case of CVD, it is three goods, alcoholic liquor for human consumption. Then next we have petroleum products and then tobacco and tobacco products. Whereas in case of SAD, only petroleum products. Then note two, in case of exports, in case of exports, we have to pay only basic customs duty. <coughs> Even social welfare surcharge is not required to be paid. Only the basic customs duty we need to pay, social welfare surcharge is not payable. Then note 3, in case of warehouse goods sold by way of transfer of warehouse receipt, then IGST under customs shall be computed on a subble value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge or sale value of such warehouse receipt whichever is higher. That is, say for example, I am importing the goods. I am importing the goods and I am keeping the goods in the warehouse. So now what I am doing, I am not clearing the goods from the warehouse, but I transferred the document of title to you. Now you will be called as importer and you will go and clear the goods from the customs. When you go and clear the goods from the customs, so the customs duty will be payable on the original import price, but IGST will be computed on ARB whichever is higher. This already we discussed, maybe you forgot. So we discussed that ARB whichever is higher. A will be assemble value plus basic customs duty plus social welfare surcharge because generally IGST we need to compute on that or we need to take so transaction value say for example I am selling to you for $11,000 I am importing for $10,000 I am selling to you for $11,000 so in that case customs duty will be payable on $10,000 only by you but IGST will be computed on customs duty assemble value plus social welfare surcharge or the price at which you purchase from me that is $11,000 whichever is higher should be taken for the purpose of computation of IGST. So this is only in case of warehoused goods which are imported and which are cleared before import that is before warehouse means a person who is importing the goods is not clearing the goods but they are selling the document of title to the other person okay. So this we discussed in the first segment that is uh, introduction taxable event under GST. So their sale on high seas basis or sale of warehouse goods so there we have discussed this. Then additional customs duties on import we have protective duty, safeguard duty, anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty. These are the four additional duties we have but protective duty is literally not an additional duty because protective duty is just enhancement of the basic customs duty which means in this list where protective duty will come will not come anywhere but instead of regular basic customs duty if protective duty is there there will be higher basic customs duty. For example on import of wheat flour that is ATA so there is a basic customs duty of 40%. Generally, the basic customs duty on all articles will be 10%, but on ATA they are taking it as 40%. Why? Because to protect the domestic industry like that, the basic customs duty rate itself will be increased that is known as protective duty. Whereas the safeguard duty, anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty, these are additional customs duties, so which will be in the step 2. So safeguard duty is levied on account of fair exports but we are importing it in large quantities. So exporter is exporting it fairly, but we are dependent too much on that particular product. So then there will be safeguard duty. For example, toys market if you take. So China, we are importing on toys market from China. So therefore, they, this to discourage that import of toys from China. So what they will do, they will be levying something called a safeguard duty. Then anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty is unfair export. Anti-subsidy duty is the exporting country is giving a subsidy to the exporter outside India if they are selling the goods to India. 
So which means because of the goods are being sold in India, the exporting country is giving the subsidy to exporter which is means it is like a trade war which the other country is doing on India. So therefore the article naturally will be coming to India at a cheaper rate. So that is known as so subsidy given by the exporting country to the exporter to avoid that we are levying anti-subsidy duty and increasing the price of the imported goods. Then anti-dumping duty, anti-dumping duty is whenever the exporter is making the goods in large scale and they dump those goods into India so at a cheaper rate then in that case we have anti-dumping duty. So these two cases it is unfair export means exporter wantedly trying to you know, spoil the domestic market. So, but in case of anti subsidiarity it is not the mistake of the exporter, it is a mistake of the exporting country. But in case of anti-dumping duty, it is a mistake of the exporter. But in case of safeguard duty, there is no mistake of exporter. So, normally they are sending the goods to India, but we are dependent on them in excess. So, we are importing in large quantities. So, that is this. Then, protective duty is under section 6, safeguard duty is under section 8b. Anti-dumping duty is under section 9 and anti-subsidy duty section 9 and anti-dumping duty section 9a. All these sections are of Customs Tariff Act. Now, who will levy protective duty? Protective duty is levied by the central government on the recommendations of Tariff Commission, which means importer will not make any complaint to the central government for the purpose of levy of this duty. So, this will be based on recommendations of Tariff Commission from time to time government will revise the customs duty rates that is known as protective duty whereas safeguard duty anti subsidy duty and anti dumping duty is levied by central government upon receipt of complaint or information from the domestic industry so domestic industry will make a complaint so upon that they will carry out the investigation who central government and then they will be levying this safeguard duty anti subsidy duty or anti dumping duty then relief against what? So mainly, so all these duties are to give relief to the domestic industry. So protective duty is to protect the interest of domestic industry against imports. But this safeguard duty is to protect the domestic industry on account of serious injury because of imports in large quantities. Reason will differ. All these are to protect the domestic industry. Generally, protective duty. But suppose if the goods are imported in large quantities, because of that if the domestic industry is getting injured, then safeguard duty. If goods are imported into India and at a cheaper rate, so because the subsidy is given by the exporting country, so then if the domestic industry is injured, to protect the domestic industry they will levy anti-subsidy duty. If goods are imported at a cheaper rate, so then if the domestic industry is injured, so, to protect the domestic industry, they will be levying anti-dumping duty. So, therefore, all these four are to protect the domestic industry only, but the reason will differ. If it is as per the recommendations of Tariff Commission, protective duty. If it is because of import in large quantities, safeguard duty. If it is import of goods at a cheaper rate because exporting country has given a subsidy to the exporter, anti-subsidy duty. Because we are importing at a cheaper rate, as exporter is dumping it into India, anti-dumping duty. Then what is the extent of relief? So in case of protective duty, as I already told you, it is not a new duty, but an enhancement to the basic customs duty. So regular basic customs duty 10% means protective duty will go to 40% or 50% like that. Then in case of safeguard duty and anti-subsidy duty, this will be at a notified percentage. So therefore, we need to take the notified percentage given so, that notified percentage will be taken, rate will be specified in the question. Then, next in case of, so anti-dumping duty, it will be dumping margin or injury margin, whichever is lower. What is dumping margin? Dumping margin means sale price in the exporting country. That is the price at which they are normally selling in their country minus. The price at which they are exporting to India is known as dumping margin. In our example, we discussed, so they are selling in their country for 100 rupees but they are exporting to India for $75. So then the difference $25 is the dumping margin. Then injury margin means, so normal selling price in India. Say in India that product is being sold at $120 and the landed value of the imported goods, landed value means assable value, basic customs duty, social welfare surcharge. 
say that is some 80 dollars so 120 minus 80 40 dollars is the injury margin so whichever is lower will be 25 dollars that will be taken so that is in case of anti dumping duty investigation in case of protective duty investigation not required why because based on the recommendations of the tariff commission it is being levied so there is no need of any investigation whereas in case of other three safeguard duty anti subsidy and anti dumping duty so investigation is required because so it will be acted upon by the central government based on complaint from the domestic industry so therefore they need to carry out the investigation and then only they will be levying these three additional customs duties so that's the reason why till they complete the investigation so there will be a provisional safeguard duty provisional anti subsidy duty and provisional anti dumping duty for how many days this provisional duty will be levied till the time of completion of investigation what is the time limit by which the investigation should be completed so in case of anti dumping duty 6 months anti subsidy duty 4 months and in case of the safeguard duty it will be 200 days this is the time limit by which they need to complete the investigation until that point of time provisional duty will be levied suppose upon finalization say if the provisional duty is levied and upon finalization it is more than the provisional duty then the differential amount we need to pay suppose if it is less than the provisional amount then they will give the refund so refund allowed or differential duty payable on account of finalization now once this safeguard duty or anti subsidy or anti dumping duty is levied for how many years it will be levied so safeguard duty you can see four years it will be levied and it can be extended but the extended period cannot be beyond six years which means what is the total number of years for which safeguard duty can be levied 10 years four years and they can extend it for a further period not exceeding six years which means total 10 years but in case of anti dumping duty and anti subsidy duty these two if you see it will be levied for a period of five years and it can be extended for a further period of five years at a time which means there is no unlimited there is no limited time unlimited time there is no end date so means they can levy it for 200 300 years also but only thing for every five years they need to check so five years so whether they need to continue this anti subsidy and anti dumping yes then further five years again for every five years the review needs to be done so that is this so five years plus five years at a time after review maximum is unlimited time then what will happen if they are not reviewing it within five years then there is automatic extension for one year so see the note below automatic extension of one year if not decided whether to extend or not within the expiry of five years say five years over so they have not decided then automatically there will be extension for one year means in that one year they need to decide to extend or not suppose in that one year they have not decided to extend it then it will not be extended if they have decided to extend it it will be extended so by default one year extra time limit will be there if the five years is over so therefore automatic extension for one year will be there then in that one year they need to decide what if they have not decided to extend then the notification will terminate which means there won't be any so anti subsidy duty or anti dumping duty thereafter after that one year that is the meaning of that then exemption from levy in case of safeguard duty anti subsidy duty and anti dumping duty common we have one exemption that is a product imported attracts safeguard duty or a product imported attracts anti dumping duty or a product imported attracts anti subsidy duty if this product is imported by a 100% eou or a scz then they don't have to pay this anti dumping duty safeguard duty or anti subsidy duty generally say one product i am importing here so this product attracts safeguard duty but i am importing into eou or scz no need to pay safeguard duty normal basic custom duty if i pay okay but if I do this as to escape safeguard duty, like I am importing into a EOU, thereafter it is cleared to DTA, means to avoid the safeguard duty, I am trying to do this way, then I have to pay safeguard duty. See this, imports by 100% EOU or unit in SCZ, no safeguard duty, no anti-subsidy duty, no anti-dumping duty. However, if imported and cleared to DTA, domestic tariff area, then it will be applicable then retrospective levy so today can they give a notification to levy this retrospectively 
Safeguard duty cannot be levied retrospectively. Only two additional duties can be levied retrospectively that is anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty can be levied retrospectively. That to how many days prior? So, up to 90 days prior which means today they can give a notification to levy it retrospectively within 90 days prior. Say, so 60 days prior or 80 days prior they can give effective date of this notification but the notification is given today. So, retrospective levy can be done but not before 90 days from the date of notification. Then see the notes in case of imports in large quantities government can resort to tariff rate quota. Tariff rate quota means so like they will be fixing a particular quota. So, like uh, this much quantity if you are importing no need to pay any duty. So, beyond this quantity if you are importing you need to pay additional duty like that instead of levying safeguard duty flat on all quantity imported. So, they can fix a tariff rate quota like a slab rate model. If you are importing 10,000 units no need to pay additional duty. If you are importing beyond 10,000 units you need to pay additional 20 percent duty like that a tariff rate quota can also be fixed as a safeguard measure instead of safeguard duty. Then anti-subsidy duty under section 9 and anti-dumping duty under section 9a are mutually exclusive. So, which means if anti-subsidy duty is there anti-dumping duty will not come because the moment they levy anti-subsidy duty they are taking care of that cheaper price. So, because both are for cheaper price only and anti-subsidy duty is cheaper price because exporting country has given subsidy. Anti-dumping duty is because exporter is dumping to India. So, if the goods are imported at cheaper price either anti-subsidy duty will come or anti-dumping duty will come but not both. So, that is why these two are mutually exclusive. Then special points on above non-applicability of safeguard duty. So, safeguard duty already we discussed one non-applicability. What is that? If imports by 100 percent EOU or SCZ and clear to DTA, so not clear to DTA then safeguard duty not applicable. If they are clearing it to DTA then only safeguard duty will be applicable that is one point already we know. Apart from that there are two more cases where safeguard duty is not applicable. For example, first we are importing a product that product attracts safeguard duty. Now, we are importing that product from a developing country, a developing country means only one developing country we are importing that product and that import from a developing country does not exceed 3 percent of the total imports of that article into India. Say we are importing product X, product X is being imported from so developing country, one developing country say Korea we are importing developing country. So, we are importing one product X and developed country we are importing say from Japan we are importing and from Korea we are importing for 300 lakhs rupees 300 lakhs and then what is the import from Japan? From Japan we are importing for 6000 lakhs, we are importing for 6000 lakhs Okay, 9000 lakhs from Japan, 9000 lakhs from Japan. Now, what is the total? The total is 9300 lakhs, 9300 lakhs. Now, we are importing only from one developing country. What is the percentage of imports of developing country to total imports? So, 300 divided by 9300 that will be 3.22 percent. So, which exceeds 3 percent therefore on Korea imports from Korea there will be safeguard duty we cannot do anything with respect to that. What about imports from Japan always there will be safeguard duty because this product takes attract safeguard duty whether you are importing it from Korea or Japan or any country there will be safeguard duty but they gave a relaxation that relaxation is <coughs> if you import from one developing country and imports from one developing country does not exceed 3 percent of the total. So, then there is no safeguard duty that is relaxation, but import from developed country always there will be safeguard duty. Now, slight change in this what if it is instead of 9000 it is 11000 lakhs, 11000 lakhs imports from Japan. So, total will be 11300. 
then when it is 11,300, the percentage will be 300 divided by 11,300, that is 2.65 percent. 2.65 percent does not exceed 3 percent. So, therefore, on import from Korea, there is no safeguard duty, but on import from Japan, there will be safeguard duty. That is this relaxation, first relaxation. Second relaxation, if you see, suppose if you are importing from more than one developing country, so long as the aggregate import from developing country with less than 3 percent, less than 3 percent, take less than 3 percent as a cumulative, taken together does not exceed 9 percent of the total imports of that article into India. Say for example, we are importing product Y and that product Y attracts safeguard duty. Product Y attracts safeguard duty and this product Y we are importing from so developing countries we are importing from developing countries so four developing countries a b c d and then developed countries also we are importing and then total we need to take so say developing country a so 300 b 200 c 100 and d 150 and developed countries is 11000 and total if you see 11,000 lakhs plus 150 plus 100 plus 200 plus 300 that will be 11,750. Now 11,750, so percentage, so 300 divided by 11,750, so will be 2.55 percent, 2.55 percent. Then again 200 divided by 11,750, that is 1.7 percent then 100 divided by 11,750 that is 0.85%. Then same way 150 divided by 11,750 that is 1.27%. So therefore, we are importing from developing country and each developing country with less than 3%, with less than 3%. Taken together, you take it together. You take it together, how much it comes to 1.27 plus 0.85 plus 1.7 plus 2.55. So, that will be 6.37 which does not exceed 9 percent. So, therefore, on import from developing country A, B, C, D, there is not, no safeguard duty, but on developed countries only there will be safeguard duty. So, these are the two points that we have. Then next one. So, therefore, whenever you get a question that when safeguard duty is not applicable, you need to write number one, if in the notification they have not given a particular country, then import from that country safeguard duty not applicable. Number two, suppose if it is imported by 100% EOU or a unit in SEZ but not clear to DTA, then also safeguard duty not applicable. Number three, we are importing an article from a single developing country and import from that developing country does not exceed 3 percent of the total import of that article into India. And number four, we are importing an article from more than one developing country and import from each developing country with less than 3 percent taken together does not exceed 9 percent. So, then also there is no safeguard duty. Then circumvention of anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duty. Circumvention will arise whenever you try to change the description of the product, say on import of one product attracts safeguard duty. So, now you are changing the description of the product, say you are importing toys, you need to pay safeguard duty. Now, you change the description as toys to plastic articles. So, then in that case, so there may, there may not be safe like anti-subsidy duty or anti-dumping duty like that. So, what you will do? So, you will try to alter the description or name of the article to avoid this ASD and ADD or for example, if you are importing an article, so say car you are importing, so car attracts anti-subsidy duty. So, then in that case, you will import it in unassembled or disassembled form so that you will assemble it here, okay. Then by changing the country of origin, if import from Korea attracts anti-subsidy duty, now, you are changing the origin as Korea to Australia like that. You change the country of origin of the ex, ex, like, uh, export or in any other manner, you try to escape from payment of anti-subsidy duty or anti-dumping duty. Then in that case, 
whatever notification already given by the government can be extended for these goods also for which you change the description, these goods also for which you change the country of origin, these goods also which are imported in unassembled or disassembled form. So actually notification is not for these goods, but they can extend that notification for these goods. Where the government on such enquiry as it considers necessary is of the opinion that circum <coughs> circumvention has taken place either by following ways it may extend, it may extend the anti-subsidy duty and anti-dumping duties to such other article also from such date not earlier than the date of initiation of enquiry as the central government may by notification official gazette specify. The next uh, absorption of anti-dumping duty and anti-subsidy duty. So whenever they are trying to absorb the anti-dumping duty or anti-subsidy duty, then Indian government can increase the anti-dumping duty or anti-subsidy duty to the extent it is absorbed by the exporter. <coughs> <coughs> Say for example, so exporting country, exporting country, so there is something called as dumping margin and importers country or importing country there is something called as injury margin. So dumping margin is based on, one second here. Dumping margin is based on selling price in the exporters country. Say selling price in exporters country is $150 and export price, export price is say $100 and then in importing country, so when export is for $100, definitely the landed value will be somewhere like $125 more than the export price and here the normal selling price here the normal selling price in India is say $160. So now if you see what is the dumping margin, 100 minus that is 150 minus 100, 50 dollars and here it is 160 minus 125. So that will be so 35 dollars. So therefore what will be the anti-dumping duty? Therefore anti-dumping duty anti-dumping duty will be 35 dollars. So therefore, what will be the cost of import? So the cost of import, if you see, the cost of import is, so 125 plus 35, 125 plus 35. So 125 plus 35, which will come to 160 dollars. So therefore, it is equal to the selling price in India. So that is not a problem. So cost of import is 160. This is why anti-dumping duty will be levied for the purpose of increasing the cost of import. Okay. Now what has happened is that, so here exporter is trying to reduce his price. Now anti-dumping duty notification has been issued and in that anti-dumping duty notification they are telling 160 dollars, so that is 35 dollars is the anti-dumping duty. <coughs> anti-dumping duty is 35 dollars which is fixed as the notification but what has happened so this exporter is trying to reduce the price he is trying to reduce the price by 35 dollars because they wanted the person in India to enjoy the benefit so therefore export price has been reduced from 100 dollars to say 65 dollars then the landed value will not be 125 dollars, the landed value also will come down to 90 dollars. Then what is the revised cost of import? The revised cost of import will be 90 dollars plus government has given a notification for anti-dumping duty for how much? 35 dollars, so which will be 125 dollars and in India the selling price is 160, so definitely people will import. So this is known as absorption of absorption of anti-dumping duty. So whenever exporter tries to absorb this anti-dumping duty by reducing his export price, 
Now what Indian government will do, so they will revise this notification and they will enhance the anti-dumping duty by $35. Now the revised anti-dumping duty will be $70. So therefore you are importing for $90, you import, no issue. So you pay now $70, then the price will be taken as $160, okay. This is known as absorption of anti-dumping duty and anti-subsidy duty, where central government on such inquiry as it may consider necessary is of the opinion that absorption of anti-subsidy duty or anti-dumping duty has taken place whereby the anti-dumping duty so imposed is rendered ineffective. It may modify such duty, it may modify that is already notification is given but they can modify the duty to counter the effect of such absorption from a date not earlier than the date of initiation of inquiry. So, when absorption is said to taken place, absorption of anti-dumping duty is said to have taken place, if there is a decrease in the export price of an article without commensurate change in the cost of production. So, just like that, so exporter has reduced the price from 100 to 65, so without any change in the quality, etc. So, then definitely, so there will be an absorption that has taken place, that is this. Then, Next, so one second here, battery it went off, I am just changing it. Yes, so there is one uh, query here, just I am just checking this query. Sir, is this 3 percent seen for each importer or whole of India product wise? It is whole of India product wise. So therefore, this 3 percent we should not see for the importer. This 3 percent what I am telling is total imports of that article into India, not importer wise we see, we see it product wise. So, that product imported into India in total, in total we will be taking it. So, this computation is not done by the importer. This computation is done by India, Indian government, customs department and they will be specifying that safeguard duty is not applicable if imported from this country like that, okay. So, this should be total import of that article into India, product wise we need to see. So, then. Next, so this is old customs duties relevant in the current scenario. So already I told you, right now CVD is applicable for which goods? CVD, CVD, alcoholic liquor for human consumption, then petroleum products and then tobacco and <coughs> tobacco products. These three case only CVD is applicable at present. Then SAD is applicable at present on what? Only on petroleum products. Then computation of customs duty in case of import already we have seen. Now we are moving on to the next area that is section 19 of Customs Act 1962 that is import of goods as set of articles which means I am bringing some group of articles in a single package but it is not composite articles. These are not like uh, you know the geometry box example case not like that. So, these are like some articles as a group I am bringing it into India. Now, in that case, say for example, I am ordering for one DSLR camera, one DSLR camera, one tripod and one lens and one SD card like that I am importing group of articles frequently brought together like that they say na. So, it will be combo like a combo I am importing. Now, here we need to apply the concept of that composite supply and mixed supply and we need to arrive at the value. So, see this, what should be taken as the rate of customs duty? Suppose, <laughs> if articles are liable to ad valorem duty, ad valorem duty means, so when customs duty is payable as a percentage of some value, it is known as ad valorem duty. We have two methods of payment of customs duty, that is specific duty method and ad valorem method. Specific duty method means, when we pay customs duty irrespective of its value, 
but based on some units of measurement then it will be called as specific duty method for example in case of cigarettes imported we will not pay customs duty based on the value of the cigarette but based on the length of the cigarette we pay customs duty like that when we are importing led tvs we will not pay based on the value of the tv customs duty but on the screen size 40 inch 55 inch 50 inch like that based on inches we pay customs duty that is known as specific duty method whereas ad valorem method means we need to arrive at the value on that value when we need to multiply a percentage that is known as ad valorem method so now here we are importing goods which are chargeable to duty at ad valorem and we are liable to duty at the same rate means these four articles which we are importing all four articles are chargeable to duty at the same rate then the question of the section 19 will not come because all goods are at the same rate then we will take it and multiply it on the value so confusion will not be there where the confusion will be if they are liable to duty at different rates for example camera one rate then lens one rate tripod one rate sd card one rate like that when we have different rates and we are importing it in one package so then which rate should be taken is the confusion so for that reason only we have section 19 suppose separate value can be ascertained means we know how much is the value of camera how much is the value of sd card how much is the value of lens and how much is the value of you know the tripod like that separately ascertainable now respective rate you will take on the respective value and multiply and you will pay the customs duty no issue at all so chargeable to customs duty accordingly based on separate value suppose if it is compulsorily supplied along with the main article and separate price not available if it is a compulsory accessory like a composite supply so which means naturally bundled in the ordinary course of business you buy the camera you get tripod always free then in that case what we need to do so we need to take the rate of principal supply what is the rate of principal supply camera and that should be applied on the entire value so entire consignment chargeable to duty at the rate applicable to the main article like a composite supply understood or not so but here we need to see what single price a separate price means neither composite supply nor mixed supply separate price means always it will be treated like separate values and chargeable to gst accordingly but only when there is a single price and it is compulsorily supplied means what naturally bundled so then we need to take the rate of main article it is treated like composite supply what if it is not a compulsory article so price also single all these four imported for a single price and these are not compulsorily supplied along with the main article you have to pay for it but the entire price is like a combo price single price is there then in that case you need to treat it like a mixed supply and highest rate should be taken so entire consignment chargeable to duty at the highest of such rate so what you need to remember four points suppose if the rate is same no worry so we will take the same rate and apply it on the entire value suppose if the rates differ and we need to check whether the prices are separately ascertainable or not if price is separately ascertainable respective value for respective rate if the price is not ascertainable separately then is it compulsorily supplied along with the main article or not compulsorily supplied along with the main article if compulsorily supplied along with the main article then treat it like a composite supply and take the rate of main article if compulsorily not supplied along with the main article then treat it like a mixed supply and take the highest rate now in this process what will happen even those articles which are not chargeable to duty will also ch get charged to duty at the highest rate or at the rate of main article say for example camera 12 percent sd card is nil rate so now when we take single price for both camera and sd card so therefore the camera rate will be applied on sd card also even non-dutiable articles also will get dutiable in this process so that's why what we should do whenever we are importing articles at different rates of duty we should ensure that the separate values are ascertained when the separate values are ascertained so sd card in our example may not be chargeable to duty because it is non-dutiable article but when you go for this main article or highest rate even non-dutiable articles also will be chargeable to duty that is this so with this we completed types of customs duties then we have valuation under customs so this valuation under customs <coughs> in case of import what should be taken as the value of supply so transaction value the transaction value is cif price in case of import and fob price in case of export what is the link between these prices we need to have a clarity here 
So, this clarity is very much required so that we will not get confused. So, first we need to know the price prevailing at the exporters factory. The price prevailing at the exporters factory gate. So, is known as this is exporters factory. Exporters factory. From exporters factory, the goods will come to the exporters port. The goods will come to exporters port. This is port or airport of exporter. Then thereafter, the goods will be transported from port or airport of the exporter to the port of airport of the importer. Import port or airport. Thereafter, the goods will be taken to the importer's place. So, then the goods will be taken to importer's place. So, the importer's factory or importer's place of business. So, importer's place. Importer's place. Now, so the price prevailing at the exporter's factory means if the goods are sold at the exporter's factory gate, then it is known as X factory price. X factory price. So, what is this X factory price? The price prevailing at exporter's factory. If it is X factory price, then importer only should take care of all the transportation from the factory gate of the exporter to the importer's place. So, now from exporter's factory, the goods will be transported to exporter's port. For transport of these goods to the exporter's port, so there will be some cost that is freight from where to where exporter's factory to the exporter's port. So, this freight, this freight and for loading the goods in the port. So, these goods needs to be loaded now. So, loading cost, loading in the ship or aircraft. So, loading charges, loading charges. So, therefore, what and all if you add, you will get FOB price. So, FOB price is the price prevailing at the exporter's port. So, therefore, FOB price when we will get X factory price plus freight from exporter's factory to the exporter's port or airport plus loading charges in the exporter's port or airport will be called as FOB price. Then, once we get the FOB price, thereafter for transporting the goods from the exporter's port to importer's port, so there will be some freight and insurance. So, this freight and insurance for transporting the goods from exporter's port or airport to importer's port or airport, if you add this freight and insurance, then it will be called as CIF price. So, this will be taken as CIF price. Okay. So, then thereafter from import, port or import, port of import, thereafter to importer's place, there will be some freight and insurance or from freight cost, unloading charges, etc. So, therefore, the goods will be transported to importer's place. For this, first there will be some unloading charges, unloading charges, unloading charges and thereafter, so some freight will be there. Okay. Now, this freight and unloading charges will not come in CIF price. Because CF price is the price prevailing at the importer's port. So, thereafter unloading charges and freight paid by the importer to take it to his place will not come in CAF price. Okay. So, then what should be taken as the assessable value in case of import? In case of import, the assessable value in case of import is CIF price. So, therefore, what and all should be taken in CIF price? FOB price is given. Then FOB price plus freight plus insurance, you will get CIF price. Suppose in the question, if X factory price is given, then how to arrive at CIF price? X factory price plus freight from exporter's factory to exporter's port, loading charges in exporter's port or airport, then exporter's port to importer's port freight and insurance. If we add everything to X factory price, we will get CIF price. That will be taken as the assable value in case of import. Then what should be taken as the assable value in case of export? Assable value in case of export, assable value in case of export is FOB price that should be taken. So, this clarity of these three prices if you have that is sufficient. So, accordingly in question any type of price is given you will be able to arrive at the answer. Now, 
what should be taken as the assable value in case of import? The assable value in case of import is CIF price. So, CIF price will be taken as the assable value in case of import. So, take the CIF price and how do you get the CIF price? FOB price plus insurance plus freight. We will get the CIF price and FOB price will be given. FOB price will be given but for this FOB price given, we need to make some adjustments. Just like in value of supply, we will make some adjustments, the inclusions to the assable value, transaction value like uh, taxes, duties and says by whatever name called other than GST, any expenditure which the supplier is liable to pay but which is paid by the recipient, like that some inclusions we make, like that for FOB price also we need to make some inclusions, then we get the revised FOB price, then we need to add to this insurance and freight, insurance and freight when you are adding, we will get CIF price, so insurance, we ascertainable, not ascertainable, what is the meaning of ascertainable, if goods are being imported in so, one consignment itself, so then the importer will pay the freight and insurance for that consignment for that container. So, then importer will know how much is the charges for that container. So, therefore, ascertainable. Whenever the container contains the goods belonging to multiple importers. So, like in a container, 30% belongs to importer A, 40% belongs to importer B, remaining 30% belongs to importer C which means none of these three importers know how much is the freight because the freight charges will be apportioned between them by the logistics operators. So, therefore, the importer do not know what is the freight cost, what is the insurance cost, that is the meaning of ascertainable, not ascertainable. Suppose, if insurance is ascertainable, we take it as actuals. If insurance is not ascertainable, we need to take 1.125 percent of FOB, got it? So, then freight. If freight is ascertainable, then again divide into two, air freight or other freight. If it is air freight, compare it with 20 percent of FOB because air freight will be usually high. The maximum air freight should be taken as 20 percent of FOB. So, actuals are 20 percent of FOB, whichever is lower. Suppose if it is other freight, we will take actuals and if it is not ascertainable, definitely we will take 20 percent of FOB. So, insurance ascertainable actuals, not ascertainable 1.125 percent of FOB, same way freight. Ascertainable, not ascertainable, not ascertainable 20 percent of FOB, ascertainable again we need to see air freight or other freight, other freight we will take actuals, air freight we will compare it with 20 percent of FOB, actuals or 20 percent of FOB whichever is lower, but when you take FOB, which FOB should be taken, we need to take the revised FOB, that is FOB price after making the adjustments, so that revised FOB should be taken for computation and then this freight shall include handling charges, this freight whatever is there, this freight shall include handling charges, but not at the place of import. So, which means which charges will be included in the freight, loading charges, but not unloading charges, unloading charges will not come in this freight. Ship demurrage charges, whenever we anchor the ship at the outer space, so then for anchoring the ship at, at the outer space and with not bringing it to the port, we need to pay, that is the captain of the ship is needs to pay something called as ship demurrage charges. But whatever ship demerit charges that is paid by the captain of the ship will in turn be recovered from the importer. So, therefore, that should also be part of freight. Then light rage and barge charges. When the ship is anchored at the outer space, because the ship is so big that it cannot come into the port, then from the ship to the shore, they will be transporting the goods through boats. So, therefore, for transporting the goods through boats, some extra charges is payable to the boat operators that is known as light rage and bar charges that is also part of freight that is charges incurred for transportation of goods from the ship to the shore. So, these are all should be taken as part of freight. So, in the freight what should be taken? In this freight what should be taken? So, not only the freight actual freight but also loading charges etc. and then ship demerit charges, light rage and bar charges for bringing the goods from ship to the shore of importer. So, that should be taken that is about the CIF price. Then what are the adjustments to be done for this FOB price to arrive at the revised FOB? So, there are some adjustments. Number one, commission. Commission we need to adjust, that is we need to add. Which commission we need to add? Buying commission or selling commission, selling commission. So, buying commission and selling commission difference we need to know. So, buying commission is a commission paid to buy. Selling commission is a commission paid to sell. So, who is selling? Exporter is selling. So, therefore, exporter's agent commission paid is known as selling commission. Who is buying? Importer. 
So therefore, commission paid to importer's agent is known as buying commission. Again, I am repeating, the one who is selling, his agent commission is known as selling commission. The one who is buying, his agent commission is known as buying commission. Now, who is selling? Export is selling. So, commission paid to exporter's agent is known as selling commission. Who is buying is importer. So, commission paid to importer's agent is known as buying commission. So, buying commission is paid by importer to his agent. So, his expenditure, it will not be included in the value. But, if exporter is paying exporting commission, that is selling commission to his agent, then also it will not be included. But exporter has to pay commission to his agent, which is paid by the importer, which is an indirect consideration to the exporter. So, that should be included in the value. So, which commission should be included in the value? Selling commission, which is paid to the exporter's agent, paid by the importer, that should be included in the value. The other name for the selling commission is local agent's commission, because exporter's agent will be in India representing the exporter. Whereas importer's agent will be outside India representing the importer. So therefore, who is local agent? Exporter's agent. So the other name of selling commission is local agent's commission. Then second inclusion is importer is sending some material to the exporter. Using that material, exporter is making the product and sending it to the importer. Now whatever free of cost material sent by the importer to the exporter is included in the value of the imported goods because exporter will not charge for this material because this material is free of cost sent by the importer. So therefore, it is like any amount that the supplier is liable to pay but which is paid by the recipient is an indirect consideration to the supplier. So therefore, any material or any molds and dyes or any capital goods which are sent by the importer to the exporter used in the manufacture of imported goods, we need to include that value of the material, either actual cost or apportioned cost. Then, other expenses incurred by the exporter and recovered from the importer. Is it before import or after import? We need to check. If it is before import, definitely it should be included in the value. For example, design and development charges, drawing charges, etc. and all or any other expenditure incurred by the exporter before import of the goods should definitely be included. Suppose, if expenses are incurred by the exporter after import, but as a condition of sale of imported goods, so then it should be included. For example, installation charges. Installation charges, so exporter will be collecting it from the importer after the product is <coughs> imported when it is installed. So then this installation charges is payable as a condition of sale of imported goods even though it is charged by the exporter after import that will be included in the value because it is specified in the contract itself. Whereas if there is any customization charges or any extra charges which is paid by the importer after import not as per contract of sale but separately then that will not be included in the value. So importer is paying that as per the importer's request that is to be excluded from the value. These are the three adjustments we need to make to the FOB price to arrive at the revised FOB price. On that revised FOB price, only this 1.125% of FOB or 20% of FOB should be computed. So, that is about valuation in case of import and export. In case of export, we will be taking normal FOB price. Should we make any adjustments? No, no adjustments. Whatever is the FOB price, that only should be taken as the value in case of export. Now. We have some rules related to this. We will take a break and thereafter we will continue with these rules. So, we will take a break for 10 minutes and then we will continue. Okay? So, come back soon. Are you finding it useful here?
Okay, we'll start. So, look into customs valuation rules 2007. Whenever we take assable value as CIF price or FOB price, in case of import it is CIF price. But rule 3 of customs valuation rule says, we will take assable value as transaction value. What is the transaction value in case of import? CIF price. And we will make some adjustments as per rule 10. That is what we have seen so far, that freight, insurance, and thereafter we make some adjustments, etc. Suppose if customs officer has doubt about the truth and accuracy of the declared value, or if these four conditions, any of these four conditions are not satisfied, then the transaction value is not applicable. Suppose if the customs officer should not have any doubt about the truth and accuracy of declared value, and it should be unrestricted sale, unconditional sale, unrelated parties, and price must be the sole consideration. Total five conditions. Condition number one, price must be the sole consideration. Condition number two, supplier and recipient are not related. Condition number three, it should be unconditional sale. It should be unrestricted sale. Condition number four and condition number five, the customs officer is not having any doubts about the truth and accuracy of the value. If any of these conditions not satisfied, then we will not take transaction value and we will determine the value as per rules. That is T I S D C R T for transaction value. If transaction value fails, then we will take identical goods. If identical goods also fails, then we will take similar value. If similar value also fails, then we will take deductive value. If deductive value also fails, computed value. If computed value also fails, then it will be residual value. So, T I S D C R. T for transaction value. I for identical goods. S for similar value. So, then D for deductive value. C for computed value and R for residual value. So, what does identical value says? It says that you are importing some article and for that imported article, you see the identical imported goods. Identical imported goods, what is the meaning of identical goods? Identical goods means that goods also should be imported. Say you are importing some washing machines with uh, front end, like front load washing machines, you are importing. Now, the other washing machine should also be imported and having the same physical characteristics, quality and reputation. So, you are importing washing machines with front load and top load washing machine cannot be a comparable. So, again that also should be having the same physical features, quality and reputation and produced in the same country. Say you are importing from Korea, that washing machine should also be imported from Korea, produced by the same person preferably not compulsory. So, you are importing Whirlpool washing machine and the other one is LG, can we compare it? Yes, because produced by the same person is not a mandatory condition, it can be preferable. Then that comparable washing machines will be taken as the identical goods. So, identical goods means four conditions should be satisfied. Identical goods should also be imported goods, having same physical features and quality and reputation, produced in the same country and produced by the same manufacturer preferably. So, then in that case, we will take that as identical goods. But we will make three adjustments to this identical goods. Why? For example, we are importing 2000 units, but the other person is importing 1000 units. If that person imports 2000 units, what will be the price? Like that adjustment we will be making because we need to have a equal footing. So, we are importing 2000 units, the other person is importing 1000. What if he imports 2000, he may get a discount of 10 percent. So, then deduct the 10 percent so that you will get the price if he is importing 2000. So, if there is any difference in the quantity, you need to make adjustment with respect to the difference. <coughs> then, if there is any difference in the transportation cost, for example, you are importing in, you are importing it to say Chennai port and the comparable is being imported into Surat port. Now, if that person is importing into Chennai port, what will be the extra freight cost? You add that, so you will get the comparable. That is, you are importing to Chennai port. Identical means it should also be to Chennai port, but the identical goods we have to Surat port. Now, add the freight cost from Surat port to Chennai port, you will get the comparison perfectly. So, adjustment with respect to the transportation cost we need to make and difference in the commercial level of importation. Say you are importing from manufacturer, that person is importing from wholesaler. If that person imports from manufacturer, means whatever is the wholesaler's margin, you are reduced. 
So therefore, you will know if that person is importing from manufacturer, what will be the price? So first identical goods means total four conditions that should also be imported. Same physical features, quality, same country, same producer preferably. And thereafter, we need to make three adjustments. Adjustment number one, difference in the quantity. Adjustment number two, difference in the transportation cost. Adjustment number three, difference in the commercial level of importation. Now you get the identical goods, but you may have more than one identical goods. Then in that case, we need to take whichever is lowest. If multiple comparable transactions are found, then the lowest of such value shall be considered. Then suppose if you don't have identical goods, means same goods you did not find, then you go for similar goods value. Assable value will be taken as the value of similar goods. So what will be taken as similar goods value? That is that similar goods also will be imported goods, commercially interchangeable. For example, you are importing a front load washing machine, a top load washing machine will be comparable, commercially interchangeable. So therefore imported goods, commercially interchangeable. The difference between identical goods and similar goods is that identical goods should be same physical characteristics, quality and reputation, but similar goods will be commercially interchangeable, produced in the same country and produced by the same person preferably. So produced in the same country and produced by the same person preferably. So then these points are same. Now you will get similar goods. For the similar goods, again you need to make adjustments. Three adjustments common, difference in the quantity, difference in the transportation cost, difference in the commercial level, but extra one more also is there difference in the material and engineering cost. For example, you are importing a front load washing machine, top load washing machine is comparable. Now for top load washing machine and front load washing machine, usually there is a difference in the engineering work. What is the usual price difference? Say some 15,000 rupees difference will be there. Top load washing machine could be 20,000 front load washing machine could be 35,000. So therefore that 15,000 if you add to the top load washing machine, you will get the value of the front load washing machine. So therefore we need to take the difference in material and engineering work. This is the extra point. Now you will get the value of similar goods. When you get the value of similar goods, if you get more than one value, so we need to take whichever is lower. If multiple comparable transactions are found, then the lowest of such value should be considered that is this similar goods. So identical goods and similar goods are more or less like the same. Then suppose if you are unable to determine the value as per identical goods or similar goods, then we have rule 7 deductive value and then rule 8 computed value, then best judged value. So deductive value is like, so that is we need to decide between either deductive value or computed value, it is interchangeable. Not necessary that we need to first go for deductive value and then computed value, not necessary. Either we can go for computed value first and then go for deductive value. What is the link between this deductive value and computed value? Deductive value is like bottom up approach and computed value is like top down approach. That is whenever we take the value that is first we have material cost. So there will be material cost and to this material cost we will be having conversion cost. Conversion of material into raw material into finished goods then conversion cost. Thereafter some profit margin will be added. Now you will get X factory price, the price prevailing at the exporters factory and thereafter you need to add freight and insurance. So freight and insurance if you are adding, you will get price prevailing at the importers port. Okay. So then after price prevailing at the importers port, so thereafter we pay the customs duty and after payment of customs duty, then there will be transportation cost to importers port or importers place transport to importers place, transport to importers place, then we will have importers margin, importers margin and after importers margin there will be selling price of importer, selling price of importer, okay. This is how we will be arriving at the selling price of the importer. So first cost, then profit margin, freight, insurance. So now if you see the cutoff point is this, the cutoff point is this. So therefore, if you take the material cost and you add the conversion cost and profit margin of exporter, then freight and insurance, this is known as computed value, top down approach, computed value. So therefore, we need to take material cost, add all the cost up to the place of importation that is called as computed value method. Okay, then. 
suppose if you do not have this data, then go to the deductive value method. So, take the selling price of the importer in India minus all post import expenses. Post import expense means what? Customs duty, transport to importer's place, importer's margin, etc. and all. If you reduce from the selling price of the importer, then you will be getting deductive value. That is the logic between computed value and deductive value. So, you take cost and you add everything. So, till the time of importation, you get computed value. You take the selling price in India, you deduct everything up to the importation that is post importation expenses, you will get deductive value. So, see this computed value cost of production plus profit and general expenses and freight and insurance. So, cost of production, profit and general expenses, then freight and insurance, you will get computed value. Deductive value, selling price of the imported goods. So, selling price of the imported goods, first level after importation minus post importation expenses including customs duty. So, all these things if you deduct, you will be getting deductive value. Then residual value, when you are unable to determine, when all these values is not determined by the importer, all these values are determined by the customs officer. So, therefore, when customs officer is unable to determine identical goods, similar goods, deductive value, computed value, then residual value, customs officer following the principles of valuation will be determining the value on which we need to pay customs duty. So, this will be taken as the assable value in case of importation when you are unable to determine the value which is CIF price. Then valuation in case of export. In case of export always we will take assable value as the FOB price and we do not have to make any adjustments. Adjustments not required. Suppose if proper officer is not satisfied that the value declared is genuine means FOB value declared is genuine then in that case the value will be rejected and we need to go for rule 4 again identical goods that is like kind and quality if rule 4 fails then computed value otherwise best judge value here we have only three that is like kind and quality computed value residual value what is this like kind and quality just like identical goods there we are comparing with other imported goods here we are comparing with other exported goods other exported goods having the same physical features and quality produced in the same country that is in India produced by the same person preferably and for this we need to make three adjustments. What are the three adjustments? Difference in quantity, difference in transportation cost, difference in commercial level of exportation. After making this if we get more than one value we need to take whichever is lowest. This is just like identical goods. Then suppose if this we are not able to get then we need to go for computed value method. Computed value method means we need to take cost of production plus profit and general expenses. So, why we should not take freight and insurance? Because we need to take FOB price. What is FOB price? Price prevailing at the exporter's port. So, cost of production plus profit and general expenses, we get the price prevailing at exporter's port that is computed value. Then best judge value is like residual value. Customs officer will determine the value by using the principles of valuation. So, this is in case of export. Export we have less information only. Then valuation in case of import of second hand goods. Suppose if you are importing second hand goods, what is the value to be taken? First, we need to get a certificate from a overseas chartered engineer. So, overseas chartered engineer should give a certificate as to what could be the value of the second hand goods. If that overseas chartered engineer certificate is submitted in form A, that itself will be taken as the value. Suppose if we fail to produce a certificate of overseas chartered engineer, then in that case, we need to produce the certificate of a chartered engineer in India. Then in that case, whatever is the chartered engineer certificate that is submitted in form B in India versus the declared value by the importer versus the depreciated value of those goods will be compared by the customs officer. So, comparison between the value declared by the importer and value as per the report of chartered engineer and depreciated value of the goods. If there is no much differences, if there is no much differences between the value, then whatever value declared by the importer will be taken. If there are huge differences between this value, customs officer will seek explanation from the importer. Then if importer gives explanation and officer is satisfied, then also the declared value by the importer will be taken. Otherwise, the officer proceed to determine the value as per rule 4 to rule 9, that is identical goods, similar goods, deductive value, computed value, residual value. This is in case of import of second hand goods, 
so it can be asked as a theory question so what is the procedure to be followed in case of import of second hand goods and how to determine the value you need to just convert this chart into theory and you need to write then next one we are moving on to customs procedures we have import and export procedures so first we will start with import procedures so you can see the chart there So import procedures, first we are discussing from the point of view of imports by vessel. So total 11 points to be followed. So what will happen? The import procedure will be revolving around exporter, then importer, master of the vessel and the customs officer. First what will happen? You have to just look into the steps involved. Exporter will hand over the cargo to the shipping company. Then the shipping company will give a document of title to the exporter called as bill of lading. That bill of lading will be sent by the exporter to the importer. Now, importer is having bill of lading which means that he is the owner of the goods. So, now the goods are loaded into the vessel and the vessel is coming into India. When the vessel is coming into India, the master of the vessel, step number 4, needs to submit one document called as import manifest. When master of the vessel submits import manifest, the customs officer will grant the entry inwards. So, when the customs officer grant entry inwards, the master of the vessel can unload the goods. So, this unloading of goods will be under the control of a person called as custodian, poor trust authorities. There will be delivery of cargo. Now, the master of the vessel job is done. Now, step number 7 you see. So, importer <coughs> will be filing one bill of entry with the customs officer. Now, customs officer will be verifying the bill of entry and upon payment of customs duty, the customs officer will pass one order called as out of customs charge order. So, whenever out of customs charge order is passed by the customs officer to the importer, which means that importer paid the customs duty and he can take those goods. Then, parallelly importer, step number 9 you see, needs to submit that bill of lading to the master of the vessel and the master of the vessel will give the delivery order. So, now importer is having two orders, delivery order, which means he is the owner of the goods, then out of customs charge order, which means that he paid the customs duty. So, this delivery order and out of customs charge order, he will submit to the port trust authorities, then the port trust authority that is custodian will release the goods. So, these are the 12 steps that we have with respect to import procedure. Now, in this case, so for aircraft, what will change? So, this is point number 2, point number 3 and point number 9. So, this will be called as airway bill in case of aircraft because so the document name is called as airway bill instead of bill of lading so wherever bill of lading comes that will be called as airway bill in case of aircraft and in case of vehicle that will be called as lorry receipt or railway receipt so then you can see that in the next page so all the import and export procedures under customs are through customs common portal that is icgate.gov.in means where importer will file bill of entry in this portal, where person in charge will file import manifest same in this portal. Then in case of import by aircraft, step number 2, step number 3 and step number 9 will be changed to airway bill. Same way in case of import by vehicle, the 239 will be re replaced with lorry receipt or railway receipt. Then in case of aircraft and vehicle, grant of entry inwards is not required for arrival but required for unloading of goods. And what is the name of the document to be filed by person in charge with the customs officer in case of aircraft and vehicle already we discussed. In case of aircraft, the name of the document will be arrival manifest, import manifest, arrival manifest, import report. In case of vessel, it is import manifest. In case of aircraft, it is arrival manifest. In case of vehicle, it will be import report. Then compliance to be followed by person in charge. Who is a person in charge? Master of the vessel in case of vessel, pilot in case of aircraft and driver in case of vehicle. So, this person in charge should bring the aircraft or vessel or vehicle to the customs port or airport or land customs station because not all ports are customs port. Only some ports in India are notified as customs port for import and export. Same way, not all airports will be notified as customs airport for import and export. So, therefore, only those ports and airports which are notified for import and export are called as customs port and customs airport. Like how port is for import by vessel, airport is for import by aircraft like that. If the goods are imported by vehicle, the check post will be called as land customs station. 
So in those places only, the person in charge should bring the conveyance and the person in charge should be filing import manifest, arrival manifest and import report. In case of vessel, the document name is import manifest and in case of aircraft, it is arrival manifest. In case of vehicle, it will be import report. And when the arrival manifest and import manifest should be filed before the date of arrival, this import manifest and arrival manifest should be filed. Whereas import report should be filed within 12 hours after its arrival. Okay. And what is the mode of presentation? The mode of presentation is electronic in case of import manifest, arrival manifest. But import report, we don't have electronic. So it should be manual. And when import report should be submitted? Within 12 hours after arrival. But the other two should be submitted before arrival. What if there is a late, that is belated filing of this document? For belated filing, penalty will be payable up to 50,000 rupees. Then this in person in charge is required to file one passenger name record information. That is whichever passenger is coming along with the goods so that passengers and crew information should also be submitted. Then in case of imports by vessel, goods will be unloaded only after obtaining grant of entry inwards and these goods will be unloaded under the custody of a person called as custodian. So this custodian should provide the safe custody of the goods. Suppose if the goods are lost, that is pilfered. Pilfered means the goods are lost, stolen. Petty theft is known as pilferage. Then the custodian is responsible for payment of customs duty on that goods. But importer is not required to pay customs duty. Then what about the value of the goods? Importer will get that value of the goods from the insurance company. But customs duty importer will not pay. The custodian will pay the customs duty. Then only those goods specified in import manifest, arrival manifest or import report should be unloaded. Other goods should not be unloaded. And goods should be unloaded at the approved place only. And goods should be unloaded under the supervision of a proper officer. Suppose if that unloading requires small boats, that is from the ship to the shore, the goods will be coming by boats. Then these goods should accompany a document called as boat note. And that boat note should be obtained from customs officer. If unloading happens after office hours or during holidays, some extra charges is payable to the customs officer. That extra charges is known as merchant overtime charges. So that is this, if unloading is on holidays or after office hours, so then importer shall pay merchant overtime charges to the customs officer. So that is the person in charge usually pays and in turn it will be recovered from the importer. So these are the various compliance to be followed by the person in charge. Now these points will be tested as true or false statements. In MCQs mainly they will test which of the following statements are not correct in terms of import procedure. So they will give few points A, B, C like 1, 2, 3, 4, A, 1 and 2, 3 like B, 2 and 3 like that they will be giving. So therefore for that purpose this will be useful. Then next what is the compliance to be followed by importer? Imported goods unloaded shall remain in the control of the custodian who shall be responsible of the imported goods till clearance. If such goods are pilfered, such custodian shall pay duty. But to clear that goods, importer has to file a bill of entry. So what is that bill of entry? Three bill of entries we have. Bill of entry for home consumption, for taking the imported goods directly to importer's place. Then bill of entry for warehousing or into bond bill of entry, for depositing the goods in a warehouse without payment of customs duty. Then ex bond bill of entry for home consumption, for taking the goods from the warehouse upon payment of customs duty. So then, what is the time limit for filing the bill of entry? Bill of entry should be filed before the date of arrival. So suppose if today the arrival happens before that date, that is by yesterday it should be filed. And can we file it even before that? Yes, even before that we can file, but not 30 days prior to the expected date of arrival. So minimum before the date of arrival, maximum 30 days prior to the date of arrival. So this bill of entry should be filed. If this vehicle does not arrive within 30 days. For example, we filed a prior bill of entry. So that then the aircraft did not come within 30 days. Then the prior bill of entry is expired. Again, we need to file a fresh bill of entry because the validity of a prior bill of entry is only 30 days. So after the 30 days, so we need to file a fresh bill of entry if there is no arrival of the aircraft or vessel. What is the late fee for delay in filing bill of entry? If it is exempted goods, or dutiable goods, whatever it may be. So for delay up to 3 days, 5,000 rupees per day. For delay beyond 3 days, 10,000 rupees per day. 
if it is exempted goods the maximum late fee will be 50000 if it is dutyable goods the maximum late fee will be 100% of duty payable for example i need to file bill of entry by yesterday i file bill of entry 3 days late so which means so today arrived so today also should be counted for late fee because the due date is before the date of arrival so arrival date and after 3 days from arrival i file means total is 4 days so therefore for first 3 days what is the late fee 5000 rupees into 3 days 15000 for the fourth day what is the late fee it will be 10000 so that is 25000 will be taken as the late fee in this case if the delay is 7 days first 3 days it will be 15000 next 4 days it will be 10000 so 40 plus 15 55000 will be taken as the late fee but for exempted goods the maximum will be only 50000 but for dutyable goods 100% of duty payable then this person Pay, should pay customs duty that is the importer should pay the customs duty along with bill of entry for home consumption and once the importer pays a customs duty customs officer will pass one order what is the name of the order out of customs charge order what is the time limit within which we need to file the bill of entry after arrival say we missed before arrival we missed we could not file the bill of entry before arrival so after arrival also can we file bill of entry yes but if you are not filing the bill of entry after arrival within 30 days then customs officer will either dispose of those goods by way of auction or he can keep the goods in a warehouse so pending clearance okay so therefore first 30 days the goods will be under whose control custodian control after the 30 days from the date of unloading if you are not filing any bill of entry as an importer then the customs officer has two options option number one either he will dispose it of or he will keep the goods in warehouse for a further period of 30 days like that again for every 30 days they need to do a review whether to dispose it of or to keep the goods in the warehouse so if goods are not cleared for home consumption or warehousing within 30 days after unloading such goods may be disposed of by the custodian or officer may deposit such goods in warehouse for how many days they will deposit the goods in warehouse for a 30 day period and beyond 30 days for a further period of 30 days by the commissioner should approve then until that point of time so we can file the bill of entry and we can clear the goods but if you delay filing bill of entry we are continuing the late fee plus as the goods are deposited by the customs office in the warehouse they will be collecting warehousing charges also from us and next uh, <coughs> this warehousing is not just uh, always the case but this is just an option means what is the other option they can even dispose of the goods by way of auction then export procedures these export procedures to be followed by exporter, person in charge and customs officer. So exporter will be filing one document with the customs officer for the purpose of export. What is the name of the document? The document name is known as shipping bill or bill of export. So whenever the shipping bill or bill of export is submitted to the customs officer, customs officer will verify the shipping bill and collect the customs duty if any and will be passing a let export order which means the goods can be exported. Now exporter should hand over the shipping bill or bill of export with the person in charge and the person in charge will be obtaining grant of entry outwards to leave the country. Now person in charge will be loading the goods into the ship and in case of baggage it can be loaded without any permission. Then the person in charge will be submitting the export manifest that contains the details of the goods which are loaded into the ship and then so in case of aircraft the document name is known as export manifest will be replaced with departure manifest and export report already we saw the documents so in case of aircraft it is departure manifest in case of vehicle it is export report then what are the compliances to be followed by person in charge <coughs> there unloading of goods only at approved place here loading of goods only at the approved place and there unloading under the supervision of proper officer here loading under the supervision of proper officer there unloading with the help of small boats boat not required here loading with the help of small, small boats boat note not required shipping bill itself is sufficient then loading on holidays and after office hours there unloading office after office hours merchant overtime charges here loading on holidays or after office hours merchant overtime charges payable then person in charge should obtain entry outputs from the customs officer before loading of the goods and they will be filing export manifest departure manifest or export report before departure and they will be filing a passenger name record information before departure and shall obtain permission to leave india from the customs officer 
these are the compliances to be followed by person in charge whereas complaints to be followed by exporter what are the compliances they need to file shipping bill in case of SLR aircraft and bill of export in case of vehicle and shall assess the value and pay customs duty and thereafter should obtain let export order for the purpose of export so these are the points to be followed by exporter then we have something called as transit and transshipment transit means the same vehicle or conveyance which is bringing the goods to India will be taking the remaining goods from one port or airport in India to another port or airport in India then the goods are said to be as goods in transit say for example a ship is bringing some goods to a port in India say the ship is bringing some goods to Gujarat port Gujarat port and in this port in Gujarat say the ship is bringing 10,000 containers in this 10,000 containers they are unloading say 6,000 containers 6,000 containers in Gujarat port and the same ship say it is ship A the same ship is taking the goods to another port say Chennai port Chennai port it is taking the same ship is taken to Chennai port and in that ship so the remaining 4,000 containers are unloaded so then these 4,000 containers are said to be goods in transit the same conveyance it can be aircraft or ship the same conveyance is bringing the remaining goods from one port or airport to another port or airport then the goods are said to be in transit important point here is that this transit freight will be there now some transit freight will be there so for taking the goods from Gujarat port to Chennai port some transit freight will be there this transit freight will be included in the value of 4000 containers because this transit freight is for bringing the goods from Gujarat port to Chennai port so therefore this transit freight will be included in 4000 containers whereas transshipment means what will happen say one ship is coming to India ship A and this ship A so in Gujarat port they are unloading 6000 containers 6000 containers and then this remaining 4000 is unloaded in another ship ship b so in ship b they are unloading 4000 containers 4000 containers and total 10000 containers are brought in ship a and now from gujarat port to chennai port which ship is going so ship b is taken to chennai port and there they are unloading 4000 containers so now this is known as goods in transshipment because they are transporting the goods from one ship to another ship or one aircraft to another aircraft means this is known as transshipment and remember transshipment freight transshipment freight transshipment freight transshipment freight will not be included in this 4000 containers so which freight should be included transit freight should be included and transit freight will not be included in the value you can see the last line so transit freight shall be part of CAF value but transshipment freight shall not be part of freight in CAF then transit means the same conveyance is taking the goods to another port or airport transshipment means any other conveyance is taking bill or declaration in case of transit bill or declaration not required but in case of transshipment a bill of transshipment or declaration of transshipment is required because we are changing the ve vehicle so continuity in records and control in case of transit there is continuity of records and control but in case of transshipment as the vessel changes there is no continuity of records in the first port or airport that is say in both the cases so in ship a 10000 containers are brought now in gujarat port they will submit import manifest in that import manifest should they give the details of entire 10000 containers or not yes so here also in gujarat port let it be transit or transshipment entire 10000 containers details should be made available in the gujarat port in the first port imram contains the details of normal cargo as well as transit cargo here here also same imram contains the details of normal cargo as well as transshipment cargo again when they take so this ship to chennai port again they need to file import manifest so yes or no yes every time they need to file import manifest but here in this import manifest they need to file import manifest only for 
4000 containers and here also they need to file import manifest for 4000 containers in the subsequent port or airport imr am to be filed and it contains <coughs> details of transit cargo and transshipment cargo so this is about transit and transshipment which can be asked as a theory question or in a practical question they will just give the freight information but be careful transit freight to be included in the value transshipment freight not to be included in the value then in case of import or export by post so in case of import or export by post what is considered as the relevant date for determination of rate of duty so this is only in case of post so generally in case of normal case so normal cargo in case of import so it is like vessel means date of presentation of bill of entry or grant of entry inwards whichever is later in case of uh, aircraft or vehicle date of presentation of bill of entry or arrival whichever is later like that we learnt but it is in case of import by post it is imports by vessel so here we need to take date on which so postal authority hand over the list parcel list to the proper officer or date of arrival of the vessel whichever is later whereas if it is imports by aircraft or vehicle date on which postal authority hand over the parcel list to the proper officer that's it we don't have whichever is later then in case of exports by post whenever we hand over the parcel to the postal authority the date on which we hand over the parcel to the postal authority that date will be taken as relevant date for determination of rate of duty in case of exports by post now whatever we are learning here for import or export by post the same thing will be applicable for courier also except that wherever postal authority comes that should be replaced with courier agency <coughs> goods imported or exported through courier are treated on par with goods imported or exported by post then we have faceless assessment under customs faceless assessment means whenever we are filing a bill of entry in the portal so that bill of entry may not be verified by our jurisdictional customs officer say you are located in kochi and in kochi one port is there no so kochi one port is there so now you are filing a bill of entry in kochi but this bill of entry need not be scrutinized by a kochi port officer so it may be scrutinized by a port customs officer in mumbai also or it may be done by a chennai port customs officer also because now there is nothing like jurisdictional officer only will do so any officer can do the verification of bill of entry bill of entry that is identified for scrutiny is assigned to an assessing officer who is physically located in a customs station which is not the port of import in the customs automated system so it may not be the port of import any place they can assign it separates the assessment process from the physical location of the port of import using technology platform from importer perspective there is no change in the process of filing bill of entry but only thing so which officer will scrutinize will be different so therefore here you cannot meet the officer you cannot pay any bribe etc so therefore it is like all the documentations everything will be communicated in the portal itself so a importer will file a bill of entry and in which portal ic gate portal then there is something called as risk management system that risk management system will assign it to any customs officer so thereafter so this customs officer will upload the customs verification customs compliance verification yes the bill of entry is proper so then it will be sent to the importer and therefore electronic clearance will be given to the importer which is like out of customs search order will be given electronically suppose if the proper officer has some identified some issues with respect to assessment etc so then the bill of entry will be rejected so thereafter again importer has to recheck the missing information and again he need to file the bill of entry so this is known as faceless assessment under customs so it can be asked as a short note question then powers of customs officer as per section 37 customs officer at any time board any conveyance carrying imported or exported goods and may remain in such conveyance for such period as he considers necessary so but the, the person in charge cannot question the customs officer then customs officer may require person in charge of any conveyance to produce any document and answer any questions for which the person in charge has to cooperate so these are the two powers of customs officer 
Then next section 51A and 51B, like how in GST we have electronic cash ledger and electronic credit ledger, like that in customs also they brought electronic cash ledger and electronic credit ledger. So in electronic cash ledger, what is the purpose of this is that generally whenever we are importing the goods, we need to file a bill of entry. Once the bill of entry is acknowledged, then we need to pay the customs duty the same day. For example, today you filed a bill of entry. Now, bill of entry is acknowledged. Today itself, you need to pay the customs duty. If you pay the customs duty tomorrow, then you have to pay interest for one day delay. So, to avoid this interest only, they brought in the system of electronic cash ledger. That is, you deposit the money into the electronic cash ledger and you file the bill of entry. The moment the bill of entry is approved, automatically debit will happen from the electronic cash ledger and money will be paid. So, that is the advantage of this cash ledger. So, electronic cash ledger, any amount deposited for duty payment is credited to this ledger and balance in this ledger can be used for payment of customs duty interest penalty just like GST. So, balance in electronic cash ledger can be used for payment of so tax, interest, penalty fee and others like that. So, we can use the balance in electronic cash ledger under customs for payment of duty, interest, penalty, etc. Suppose if we have deposited some excess amount, there is some excess amount in the cash ledger. That excess amount in the cash ledger, we can get it as a refund. So, these points are common between GST and customs. Then electronic duty credit ledger. Electronic duty credit ledger, so is not the same way because in case of GST, we have input tax credit concept. But in case of customs, we don't have input tax credit. So, but we will have some incentives under customs. For example, whenever you are exporting goods using the imported goods, on imported goods, whatever customs duty you paid, you will get as a refund called as duty drawback. So, whenever you are exporting the goods, the customs duty paid on import, we will get as a refund. What is the name of the refund? Duty drawback. Same way, under foreign trade policy, we have some incentives like RODTEP. Previously, we had MEIS and SEIS. Now, MEIS and SEIS is omitted. In that place, we have RODTEP, rebate of duties and taxes on exported goods. So, a percentage of our export value, we will get as an incentive. So, this particular incentives previously was given into the bank account of the person. So, but now it will be credited to the electronic credit ledger. So, now the balance that is there in the electronic credit ledger can be used for payment of customs duty. What is the advantage of this? There is no cash outflow for the government. So, this for previously they were giving that refund into bank account. Now, they will put it into electronic duty credit ledger. Now, the importer will use that electronic duty credit ledger balance for payment of customs duty. That too, basic customs duty only he can use. Okay. So, refund payable upon export or incentives under FTP are credited to this ledger. Balance in this ledger can be used for payment of customs duty only. Unutilized balance cannot be claimed as refund. Then what we can do? We can transfer that to another person. Okay. So, that we will see. We have regulations in that regard. Electronic cash ledger regulations and electronic duty credit ledger regulations. So, up to November attempt, they have not asked any question on this because it was an amendment for November exam, but they have not asked this for November exam. So, therefore, definitely for May 23 exam, you can expect questions on electronic cash ledger and electronic duty credit ledger regulations. First, electronic cash ledger regulations. There are total five forms. ECL 1, that is electronic cash ledger. ECL 2, Chalan for deposit under section 51A of Customs Act. ECL 3, Chalan for payment of any sum under Customs Act. So, ECL 1 is the cash ledger format. ECL 2 is the Chalan for deposit of money into the cash ledger. ECL 3 is for payment, payment of sum under Customs Act. Then, whatever liability that you have, that will be reflected in ECL 4, electronic duty payment ledger. Then, if there is some excess balance in the cash ledger, we can get it as a refund. To get the refund, we need to make application in ECL 5 application for refund of deposit under electronic cash ledger. So, deposit that we are making in electronic cash ledger, whether we get any interest like uh, savings deposit or fixed deposit, no, the balance will be there in cash ledger. And what are the modes of deposit in cash ledger? So, in case of GST, we have net banking, NEFT, RTGS, even credit card, debit card we have in GST, then UPI, IMPS also is there. So, but in case of customs, we have net banking, 
NEFTRTGS over the counter. Over the counter only up to 10,000 rupees in a day. Then once the chalan is generated in ECL2, it will be valid for a period of 15 days. This point is same even under GST. So this OTC limit, how much they can deposit in the form of cash in a day, 10,000 rupees. But that 10,000 rupees in a day, so relaxation is there for government department or any person authorized by the customs officer. So they can deposit more than 10,000 rupees also in cash. Then suppose if we make any NEFT RTGS transfer, for that some charges will be payable, NEFT RTGS charges. Who will bear that charges? Portal will bear or the importer should bear? Importer should bear. Commission or charges payable for deposit shall be borne by the person making deposit. Upon successful payment, one chalan identification number will be generated. And amount in the ledger can be used for payment of duty, interest, penalty, fee and other amount <coughs> under Customs Act or under Customs Tariff Act. And still there is some balance that can be claimed as refund. Once we claim refund, that will go into that person's bank account, importer, exporter's bank account. Now, this is a very important area that is this electronic cash ledger regulations is not applicable to whom? That is the provisions of section 51A. This electronic cash ledger concept is not applicable to whom? In those ports or airports where customs automated system is not in place. So, there are some ports or airports in India wherein customs automated system that is ICE gate is not active there. So, there electronic cash ledger regulations not applicable. Then baggage, baggage that is a passenger is bringing a bag. So, we need to pay some duty with respect to dutiable articles. For payment of customs duty on those dutiable articles, again cash ledger regulations not applicable. Normally, he can pay the customs duty. Then making payment other than duties under customs, IGST, compensation says interest or any amount payable under customs or customs tariff act. What are the other amounts? What are the other amounts? Example, we have something called as demurrage charges. So, this demurrage charges is not payable under Customs Act or Customs Tariff Act, but payable under, so Port Trust Authority or Airport Authority of India. So, that charges, we cannot use cash ledger. Then, custodian charges. So, to custodian, we need to pay some charges. That custodian charges will also not be coming under Customs Act or Customs Tariff Act. So, these are some charges which will be payable, not payable under Customs Act or Customs Tariff Act for payment of these charges, including warehousing charges, we cannot use the cash ledger. So, only for payment of amounts under Customs Act or Customs Tariff Act, we can use cash ledger balance. Then, these are the three points that you need to remember. That is when cash ledger regulations not applicable. Number one, if the customs automated system is not in place or accompanied baggage or payment of amount other than those specified in Customs Act and Customs Tariff Act. Then we have electronic duty credit ledger regulations. Electronic duty credit ledger regulation says that whenever you file a shipping bill or bill of export and you are eligible for some incentive, that incentive will be credited in the duty credit ledger as a e-script, electronic script. Now use that script for the purpose of e-script means one number, license number will be given, one code will be given. At the time when you are importing, you will be required to pay basic customs duty now. At that time, rather than paying the basic customs duty, the script number if you enter, no need to pay the basic customs duty. So, a shipping bill or bill of export presented and having a claim of duty credit under this scheme shall be processed in the customs automated system and the claim shall be allowed by the customs as per the conditions and restrictions. Once the claim is allowed, a scroll for duty credit will be generated by the proper officer in the system and this will be generated for each scheme. Now, the duty credit available in the e-script in the ledger, so you can use it for what purpose? You can use it for payment of basic customs duty only not for social welfare surcharge, not for payment of additional customs duties. And once this e-script is generated, means given in the duty credit ledger, that will be valid for a period of two years. This is an amendment. Previously, it was valid for a period of one year. Now, it will be valid for a period of two years from the date of its creation. Further, duty credit in the e-script that has been lapsed shall not be regenerated. Say for example, duty credit script is generated for 2,50,000 and you used some 1 lakh, still 1,50,000 is there, 2 years over. So now the script will be lapsed. 
which means that 150000 cannot be regenerated and it is gone so which means we have to use it within 2 years and suppose if i am not able to use it why i am not able to use it maybe i don't have import so then i cannot use it for payment of anything else now only for payment of customs duty on import the two basic customs duty i can use this but what they are telling we can transfer it to any other person so transfer of duty credit in e-script shall be allowed within customs automated system from the ledger of another person who is holding, holding IEC. That is import export code will be given to an importer. So therefore from one importer or exporter to another importer or exporter, they can transfer the duty credit script. Understood? Then suppose if the duty credit script has been transferred and say the transferor has got this duty credit wrongly and it has been transferred to the transferee from whom it shall be recovered it shall be recovered only from the transferor okay and then one more point the duty credit available in a script shall be transferred at any time underlined for the entire amount in the set script for example there are total four scripts script one two three four first script we have twenty thousand rupees balance can we transfer no the script is generated for 2 lakh 50 we used 2 lakh 30 still 20000 is there can the part of the script be transferred no so we can transfer entirely to the other person and transfer of duty credit in part shall not be permitted so these are the points that we have for electronic duty credit ledger regulations so these two areas are untapped definitely they can create some case study based questions on this then next we have import of goods at <coughs> concessional rate of duty rules 2022. So these rules, so again these are 2022 rules which are applicable only from May 23 exam onwards. So therefore definitely there is a possibility of asking questions on this. So previously also we had these rules but these got amended completely. So first to whom these rules are applicable import of goods at concessional rate of duty concentrate i am an importer i am eligible for import of goods without payment of customs duty or at concessional rate of duty why am i eligible because i am eligible to import it at without payment of customs duty or concessional rate under a notification wherein i am a manufacturer of some notified goods or i am supplier of some notified services or I am importing these goods for supply to a so notified end use recipient. For example, I am engaged in manufacture of COVID vaccine. So this is manufacture of notified goods. For making this COVID vaccine, I can import the goods without payment of custom duty or at concessional rate of duty. For me, these rules will be applicable. Then I am providing some EdTech software services edtech software services i am providing i am developing a edtech software so therefore that is a notified service for developing that edtech software so i can import some goods or services import some goods without payment of customs duty or at concessional rate of duty then you are one person so you wanted to import some petrochemicals so when you want to import some petrochemicals you cannot directly import so i have to import say i am ioc or ongc I only can import. So therefore, I am importing these goods for supply to specified end use recipient and I can import it without payment of customs duty or at concessional rate of duty. Now I need to follow these rules. See that a manufacturer or a service provider is eligible for a exemption notification. Understood? And that particular manufacturer or service provider as per the no notification can import goods without payment of customs duty or at concessional rate clear now such imported goods can be used for what manufacture of any notified goods or provision of notified service or supply to specified end use recipient got it so that goods are for what purpose imported goods are what purpose either manufacture of notified goods or provision of notified services or supply to a end use specified end use recipient now if suppose they are manufacturing notified goods that goods can be manufactured by them by the importer or they can get it manufactured on a job work basis 
However, job work in relation to gold, jewelry, precious stones and metals have been excluded from job work basis that cannot be done. So, only the one who is importing the goods should do the manufacture. In case of which goods? <coughs> gold, jewelry, precious stones and metals. Now, this is the background of these rules to whom these rules are applicable. Now, we understood the applicability of these rules. Now, we need to proceed to the procedure. Say, I am an importer. I am located in Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu and I am eligible for import of goods without payment of customs duty or at concessional rate of duty. Now, what is the first step I need to do? I need to submit the information in the customs common portal in ICGR1 that I am eligible, <coughs> I am eligible for import of goods at concessional rate or without payment of customs duty under so and so notification, I am importing this much quantity of goods and this much custom duty I need to pay but I am not paying and what goods I will be manufacturing, every detail I need to submit the information plus I need to execute a bond also, continuity bond with surety or security. Once I you know submit this information to the portal along with bond, the portal will verify the information and if it is correct and I am eligible for the notification, they will be generating one IIN that is import of goods at concessional rate identification number. So, they will give one number. So, import of goods at concessional rate identification number. Now, this number I need to quote at the time of import. So, when I am importing the goods, say I am importing goods in Chennai port. When I am importing goods in Chennai port, there I will file one bill of entry na. So, that Chennai port customs officer do not know I am eligible for this benefit or not. That is the reason why whatever IIN I got, I have to quote in the bill of entry at the time of import in Chennai port. So, the customs officer in Chennai port will not be collecting any customs duty from me. So, import and clearance without payment of customs duty or at concessional rate by furnishing bill of entry with IIN and bond number. So, bond gets debited to the extent of such concession. Then next uh, the importer step number 4, the importer has to submit an intimation in ICGR2 regarding any non-receipt or short receipt of the goods because in ICGR1 they will say that they are importing 10,000 kgs but actual import is only 9,000 kgs. So why? Because the exporter has sent only 9,000 kgs. Then in that case portal will be of the opinion that we imported 10,000 kgs. That is the reason why any short receipt than in ICGR1 we need to submit in ICGR2. Then step number 5 whatever imported goods under this notification that is import of goods at concessional rate or without payment of customs duty if we have any unutilized or defective goods that should be either exported or it should be sold in India upon payment of customs duty along with interest. Why? First of all you did not pay customs duty, you got the benefit. So, now those goods you are not using for the purpose for which you are importing, you are selling it in India. So, pay the customs duty how much benefit you enjoyed along with interest. Why interest payable? Had you imported at the time, at the time you have to pay customs duty, now you are paying customs duty so there is a delay you pay the interest at 15 percent per annum. In customs, the rate of interest is 15 percent per annum, not like GST. GST, it is 18 percent per annum. In customs, always the interest rate will be 15 percent per annum. So, here we need to pay from the date of import till the date of payment of customs duty. Understood? Suppose, if you do not want to pay customs duty on these unutilized or defective goods, send it back to the exporter and you ensure that you are receiving the money for that means whatever money you paid for those goods, that money you are receiving for those goods. So, value of such goods should be greater than the value of said goods at the time of import. That is the meaning. Then ICGR1 is prior information to be provided by the importer to get this notification benefit. And ICGR2 is intimation regarding non-receipt or short receipt. ICGR3 is a monthly statement. So, in that monthly statement they need to submit what goods imported, what goods they manufactured or what services they provided using these imported goods like that monthly statement they need to submit. So, depending upon that monthly statement, if they have achieved the purpose means they are manufacturing the notified goods, they are providing the notified services, then whatever value that the bond got debited will be recredited means you have achieved the purpose. 
when you achieve the purpose, the bond will be cancelled. That is the meaning of that. But if you want that to be done immediately, so then you have to give ICGR3A details of goods consumed for immediate recredit of the bond. These are the four forms we have. Now, some FAQs. What is the information to be submitted? This is one uh, not important one. So, simply we can understand. So, what are the information to be submitted? So, which place? Name and address of the importer and his job worker. What are the goods that we are producing or process undertaken? Or what is the service that we provide? And what is the description of the goods that we need? Then, what is the exemption notification under which we can import? And which port we wanted to import? And which place we will manufacture or transfer the goods? Or who is the detail? who is the specified end use recipient for whose purpose we are importing like this all those details we need to so you remember the background now nah? so based on this background you create the points that is what are the goods notified for manufacture what are the services notified for providing service and who is the specified end use recipient and which exemption notification you are eligible for and thereafter what quantity of goods you want to import which port you want to import, which place you want to manufacture and your job worker details like that. So, any five points if you write that is sufficient. What is the procedure for sending goods for job work? So, when we are importing the goods and sending it for job work because we have a point there, either the importer who is importing the goods at concessional rate or they can send it to the job worker for processing, correct? If I am importing the goods, I can manufacture or I can get it done on a job work basis. So, if I am sending the goods for job work, then I need to mention these details in that monthly statement ICGR3 plus whatever goods I am sending on job work that should be under the cover of a delivery chalan plus e-way bill and the time limit within which that goods should be received back to my place after job work is within 6 months and job worker also shall maintain necessary records. Then, can the imported goods be transferred from one unit to another unit? Yes. So, one unit to another unit we can transfer, but that will become transaction between distinct persons. So, therefore, that goods should be transferred under the cover of an invoice plus e bill and all these goods which are transferred from one unit to another unit should be mentioned in ICGR3. Then, what is the procedure for supplying imported goods to the specified end use recipient? So, all those imported goods which are supplied to specified end use recipient should be mentioned in ICGR3. And this good should be sold under the cover of an invoice plus e bill. And even the person, end use recipient, should maintain the necessary records for the same. Then, can the capital goods be imported under these rules? Yes. Not only raw material, even capital goods also can be imported under these rules. What are capital goods? Capital goods means those goods which are imported by the importer and capitalized in the books of the importer is known as capital goods. And so, these capital goods, once we achieve the objective, that is once we manufactured the notified goods or once we provided the notified service, so then these capital goods can be sold in India upon payment of customs duty along with interest. Why customs duty we need to pay? Because originally when we imported capital goods, we did not pay customs duty now. So, that we need to pay now along with applicable interest on the depreciated value. Then, what is the type of bond to be executed? We need to execute a continuity bond with surety or security with the ACDC of customs. What is the interest rate? Already I told you, we need to pay interest at the rate of 15 percent per annum. From when to when we need to pay? From the date of import of goods till the date of payment. What will be considered as the date of import of goods? That is whenever out of customs charge order is passed by the customs officer from that date till the date you pay because at that time you did not pay concessional rate or you did not pay. Now you are paying, so pay that along with interest. What are the accounts and records to be maintained by the importer? So like what are the quantity and value of the goods imported, how much it is consumed, how much it is sent on job work, so how much it is remaining, that details. And how to compute the depreciated value of capital goods? This is important because we are importing the capital goods. When we import the capital goods, we either imported without payment of customs duty or at concessional rate of customs duty. Now, these capital goods are so sold in, sold in India after import, after utilizing it for the purpose. And say for example, capital goods we use for 2 years, then how much should be taken as the depreciated value of the capital goods? Please check the depreciation schedule. 
Suppose if we are using for every quarter or part thereof in the first year and second year, we need to give a depreciation of 4 percent. If we are using it for every quarter or part thereof in the third year and fourth year, sorry, first year it will be 4 percent, second and third year it will be 3 percent, then fourth and fifth year it will be 2.5 percent and thereafter it will be 2 percent. <coughs> so, you have to remember 4 percent, 3 percent, 2.5 percent and 2 percent, 4, 3, 2.5, 2. So, 4 will be for every quarter or part thereof in the first year, 3 percent is for every quarter or part thereof in the second and third year and 2.5 percent for every quarter or part thereof in fourth and fifth year and thereafter it will be 2 percent. Now, customs duty on above shall be equal to difference between the duty levyable on such goods but for the exemption availed and that already paid. So, if any at the time of importation, as depreciated value is allowed on straight line basis, the quarter should be based on period specified above and not based on calendar quarter. But actually, ICI has taken it as calendar quarter only. So, therefore, not based on calendar quarter, you please remove. So, ICI is doing the computation based on calendar quarter. This is for ICI view. Generally, as per rules, if you see, we need to take it as 3 months as 1 quarter, but ICI is taking it as calendar quarter only. So, therefore, we need to take calendar quarter for the purpose of computation and this particular question has been given in the recent exam. So, that is in the last attempt, November 22. So, this question has been asked. So, you can see that question here. So, this is November 22 exam question. So, see this, Mr. X, a chemical manufacturer imports a machine from Germany on 12 January 2019 for rupees 20 lakhs. Mr. X is eligible for concessional rate of customs duty on capital goods imported by, by him subject to the condition that he follows customs import of goods at concessional rate of duty rules 2017 because at that time it was 2017 rules. Machinery was put to use on 1st February 2019. On 5th April 2022, Mr. X wants to clear the machine for home consumption after having used the machine for this specified purpose for which it was imported. So, therefore, machinery was put to use from 1st February. So, 1st February 2019 to 5th April 2022, we need to do the depreciation. So, we need to take it like calendar quarter only. So, 1st February 2019 means, so in the first year, so February 2019. So, therefore, it will be Jan, Feb, March. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, that full year we will take. So, first year, four quarters. So, first year, four quarters. Then again, so the first year got over, 2019 got over, 2020, again second year, full four quarters, 2021, again full four quarters, 2022, so April, which means two quarters. So, January, February, March and April few days is there. So, two quarters will be taken. So, therefore, see how the depreciation is computed here. So, they took for 2019 full four quarters, understood? Then 2020 four quarters, 2021 four quarters and 2022 two quarters. For every quarter or part thereof in the first year it will be 4 percent. So, 4 into 4, 16. For every quarter or part thereof in the second year and third year it will be 3 percent. So, therefore, 4 into 3, 4 into 3, 12 and 12. For every quarter or part thereof in the, so fourth year will be 2.5 percent. That will be 2 quarters into 2.5, 5 percent. So, total depreciation will be 45 percent. And what is the value of the imported goods? The value of the imported goods here is, so 20 lakhs. So, on 12 January 2019 for 20 lakhs. So, 20 lakhs, then what will be taken as the depreciated value of the goods? So, 20 lakhs minus 45 percent. So, which means the depreciated value of the goods is 11 lakhs. 
you understood 20 lakhs minus 45 percent will be 11 lakhs on that 11 lakhs we need to see how much is the customs duty now if we are importing the goods and we need to pay normal customs duty so we need to pay 20 percent so see this carefully mr x requires you to compute so import of goods at concessional rate is 5 percent normal rate of basic customs duty is 20 percent so now you completed the usage now you are selling what is the depreciated value 11 lakhs 11 lakhs into 20 percent 11 lakhs into 20 percent that will be 2 lakh 20 thousand but at the time of import how much you paid 20 lakhs you imported for 20 lakhs and you paid 5 percent so 20 lakhs into 5 percent 1 lakh so 2 lakh 20 thousand minus 1 lakh 1 lakh 20 thousand is what you need to pay 1 lakh 20 thousand is what you need to pay that's it now they may ask a question on interest computation if possible so therefore now interest computation we need to do from when to when from the date you have imported till the date you are making the payment when you are importing so imported on 12th january 2019 from that date till the date you are paying the customs duty so say you are paying the customs duty on 5th april 2022 so then from that date to 5th april 2022 we need to compute the interest interest will be computed at the rate of 15 percent per annum that is not asked ignore interest calculation so they asked only the customs duty payable on depreciated value for 5 marks but they can ask even interest computation accordingly we need to do so therefore actually speaking they should have taken three months as one quarter but they have taken calendar quarter so that's why we are following calendar quarter only should be followed for exam purpose then when the unutilized or defective goods should be exported or sold in india within six months from the date of import but that is not applicable in case of capital goods what are the other compliances to be followed they need to file a monthly statement that monthly statement is to be filed in icgr3 and it is to be filed by 10th of the month following every month so this is about import of goods at concessional rate of duty rules then the next area that we have is exemptions under customs so we completed segment 25 that is procedures under customs so look into segment 26 exemptions under customs in this exemptions under customs we have totally six exemptions but first four exemptions you can see section 13 section 22 section 23 subsection 1 and section 23 subsection 2 what are these four exemptions section 13 says that you don't have to pay duty on pilfered goods what is pilfered goods those goods which are petty thefts is known as pilfered goods you imported some goods and say you imported 500 iphones in that 500 iphone one or two iphones are missing that is known as petty theft in that case section 13 will be applicable section 23 section 23 is relinquishment of title to the goods when is it applicable so relinquishment means what you are leaving the title to the goods that is known as relinquishment of title so means you are not the owner of the goods when you are not the owner of the goods you don't have to pay customs duty but when relinquishment will be applicable if goods are not conforming to the specifications you imported the goods and you ordered for some goods but they sent some quality of goods so your, the goods are not as per specifications then relinquishment of title to the goods then <coughs> goods lost destroyed or abandoned when the goods are lost or destroyed or abandoned then it will be remission of duty so remission of duty means first you will pay duty and you prove that the goods are destroyed then they will give refund of the duty that is known as remission of duty then damage or deterioration damage or deterioration what is the difference between destruction and damage destruction means completely the goods are destroyed damage means the goods will function but not as desired the goods got damaged but it will work so now in that case you don't have to pay full duty or you have to pay duty you have to pay duty but lesser duty that is abatement so in case of 23 subsection 1 fully you don't have to pay whatever you paid that you will get as a refund but in case of 22 there will be reduction in the customs duty that is payable so section 13 when applicable pilferage petty theft section 22 when applicable damage or deterioration and section 23 subsection 1 when applicable goods are destroyed 
lost, destroyed or abandoned. And when 23 subsection 2 relinquishment of title will be applicable if the imported goods are not according to the specifications. Then what is the benefit that we get in case of section 13? In case of section 13, as the goods are lost, we are not required to pay the customs duty. And customs duty will be payable by the custodian. And in case of section 23 subsection 2 also, as you relinquish the title, you are not required to pay the customs duty. In 23 subsection 1, remission of duty, first you pay customs duty and prove to the officer that the goods are destroyed and then get the refund of customs duty paid. Then in case of abatement, in case of abatement, you pay the customs duty proportionately based on the value of damaged goods. Say for example, if the value of goods before damage, so if the value of goods before damage is 180 lakhs, for this we have paid say we are required to pay so 39.5 lakhs as customs duty for this 180 lakhs you need to pay 39.5 lakhs as customs duty this 180 lakhs is when before damage now the goods got damaged now the value of those damaged goods is 110 lakhs now for 110 lakhs you need to pay the proportionate customs duty so 110 lakhs into 39.5 divided by 180. So, 110 into 39.5 divided by 180 will be 24.138 lakhs you need to pay as customs duty. So, which means instead of 39.5 you need to pay 24.138. So, this reduction is known as abatement. Okay. So, therefore, proportionate customs duty payable at discount in proportion to the value of damaged goods. So, that is customs duty payable is value after damage. What is the value after damage? 110 into cust original customs duty divided by value of goods before damage. That is how we need to pay customs duty in case of abatement. Then see the remarks in case of pilferage. If goods are restored, customs duty is payable by the importer. First, the goods are imported and kept under the control of a custodian and the goods got pilfered. So, therefore, importer not required to pay customs duty, custodian will pay customs duty. Now, the goods are identified. So, those missing mobiles got identified. Now, in that case, the importer has to pay customs duty on those two mobiles. Then, relinquishment is not possible in case of prohibited goods. First of all, you are importing cocaine, weed, etc. and all and they are prohibited goods. So, then you are importing it and uh, when you are importing it, customs officer identified. Now you cannot say, I will relinquish the title, I will not pay customs duty. Here it is not about payment of customs duty, it is about the offence that we have committed. So therefore, in case of prohibited goods, relinquishment of title is not possible. Then, whether these sections are applicable in case of warehoused goods, in case of pilferage, not applicable, which means where the pilferage should have happened before clearance into warehouse, means before order for clearance means where the pilferage should have happened at the port or airport. So, then we will be getting benefit under section 13. Whereas, whether relinquishment of title is applicable in case of warehouse goods, no. So, again relinquishment of title should be before order for clearance, which means at the port or airport we should relinquish the title. Suppose, if you want to relinquish the title with respect to warehouse goods, it is not possible under 23 subsection 2, but it is possible under a different section that is proviso to section 68. Under that place, it is possible. Total in customs, in three places, we can relinquish the title. <coughs> relinquishment of title. Relinquishment, relinquishment of title in customs. Relinquishment of title, when you do, are you required to pay customs duty? You are not required to pay customs duty. You are leaving the title to the goods. So, this relinquishment of title is possible in three places. That is, unloading of goods. Unloading of goods. After unloading goods, after unloading goods and before order for clearance. Before order for clearance. Before order for clearance. At this stage, if you want to relinquish the title, it is possible under section 23 subsection 2. It is possible under 23 subsection 2. That is after unloading of goods and before order for clearance. Whether we need to pay customs duty or customs duty not payable. Customs duty not payable. 
customs duty not payable. Suppose if it is order for clearance and we deposit the goods in warehouse and thereafter, so warehoused goods, so we are clearing from warehouse, clearance from warehouse, before clearance from warehouse, before clearance from warehouse. So suppose in warehouse, if you need to relinquish the title, yes, it is possible under section 68. Section 68 with respect to warehoused goods also we can relinquish the title and whether customs duty payable or customs duty not payable, customs duty not payable. Now we cleared it that is order for clearance, so are cleared from the warehouse, okay. So clearance is done. So after clearance, after clearance that is either clearance for home consumption or after clearance from the warehouse for home consumption. So clearance for home consumption, clearance for home consumption, when you clear it for home consumption and thereafter can you relinquish the title, yes, thereafter also we can relinquish the title, thereafter that is after clearance, at the time of clearance for home consumption, customs duty paid, customs duty paid, even at this stage also relinquishment is possible. At this stage also relinquishment is possible, but when you relinquish the title at this stage, relinquishment of title at this stage, that is as per section 26A, that is as per section 26A, the relinquishment of title is possible and here you already paid the customs duty, so you will get refund of customs duty paid, you will get refund of customs duty paid. So therefore relinquishment of title is possible in three places. Section 23 subsection 1, when it should be after unloading and before order for clearance. At that time if you do relinquishment of title, no need to pay customs duty. Suppose if you are depositing the goods in warehouse, can you relinquish the title? Yes, but not under this 23 subsection 2, it will be under a different section that is proviso to section 68. At that time, whether you need to pay customs duty, no, no need to pay customs duty. Now you actually cleared for home consumption. Means when you cleared for home consumption, means you would have already paid the customs duty. Even after clearance from home consumption, you can relinquish the title. But if you relinquish the title, you will get the refund of customs duty paid because customs duty is already paid. So these are, that is under section 26A. These are the three places where we get relinquishment of title. Then in case of remission of duty, whether with respect to warehoused goods, whether we get remission of duty, yes. Imported goods is kept in the warehouse without payment of customs duty and now the goods got destroyed. Now are you required to pay customs duty? No. So remission will be available. Then in case of abatement, damage, so damaged goods in warehouse, whether we get the abatement, yes. But deterioration in the warehouse, we will not get any abatement. So only in case of damage in the warehouse, we get abatement. Then section 21, section 21 refers to derelict jet sam and float sam. <coughs> Derelict refers to imported goods in a ship, that ship got derailed, so in the sea, so then it is called as derelict. Jetsam means sometimes the goods will be thrown into the sea in order to save the ship from the sinking, so that is known as jettisoned goods, jetsam. Floatsam, those goods which are thrown into the sea will continue to float, that is known as floatsam. Now if these goods which are derailed in the sea or thrown into the sea, are floating in the sea, if you are bringing into India, you have to pay customs duty as if you have imported the goods unless those goods are exempted from payment of customs duty. All goods derelict, jetsam, floatsam and wreck brought or coming into India shall be dealt with as if they were imported into India unless proved to the satisfaction of the officer that they are entitled to be admitted duty free. Then section 20 talks about reimportation of goods. That is, first you have imported the goods. So as per notification 45 2017, so when you have imported the goods, you will pay normal customs duty and you are exporting those goods. When you are exporting those goods, so again on re-import, you don't have to pay full customs duty, you need to pay the concessional customs duty. Again, I am repeating, originally imported, you paid normal customs duty. Those goods got exported. After export, you are re-importing those goods. When you are re-importing those goods, you don't have to pay full customs duty. You need to pay customs duty at concessional rate. What is that concessional rate? 
at the time of export whether you claimed any incentive like refund or duty drawback etc yes then upon re-import just that incentive you claimed you pay that is sufficient if incentive is claimed at the time of export upon re-import customs duty payable is incentive that you have claimed you don't have to pay full customs duty so therefore at the time of export you got a duty drawback of 30,000 at the time of import just pay back the 30,000 enough suppose you are exporting it for repairs abroad so you are importing the car and you are exporting the car for repairs and after repairs when the car is re-imported so you don't have to pay again customs duty on the car but you need to pay customs duty on fair value of repairs plus freight and insurance both ways you don't have to pay customs duty on full value of the car so whatever is the fair value of repairs means materials and labor cost plus freight and insurance both ways on that we need to pay customs duty provided from the export to re-import the time limit is within three years plus two years so then we have to pay beyond this three years plus two years means we need to pay normal customs duty as if these goods are originally imported into India only if you are bringing within three years plus two years from the rate of export then this concessional rate will be applicable then note even IGST is payable on fair cost of repairs including material labor freight and insurance both ways means the total customs duty will be payable on this only if export is subject to export duty means at the time of export we paid export duty then upon re-import so you will get refund of the customs duty paid on export so at the time of export you did not claim any incentive or you are not exporting it for repairs normally you exported upon re-import you will get refund of the customs duty paid on export if goods are exported under duty exemption scheme that is advance authorization duty free import authorization epcg under ftp then the time limit will not be three years plus two years the time limit will be one year plus one year and if goods exported are not subject to any incentive or exemption and not exported for repairs then upon re-import customs duty is not at all payable but the time limit should be what that three years plus two years and one year plus one year should be maintained exported and imported goods should be same and the ownership should not have changed and this is not applicable to 100 percent eou or unit in ftz or public or private warehouse or tobacco and petroleum products because in that case so anyhow customs duty is not at all payable so therefore this concessional customs duty is not applicable in case goods taken outside india for exhibition suppose if the goods are taken outside india for exhibition you are importing the goods and you are taking it outside india for exhibition what is the time limit within which the goods should be brought back to india within six months so in that case it should be six months so then if you are bringing back within six months customs duty is not payable then this is another notification that is notification 60 2018 what you are doing in this notification is that first you are exporting the goods you are manufacturing some goods in india and you are exporting those goods but these exported goods has got some defects so you will recall the goods you will recall the goods to india and you will do refining reprocessing or remaking what is the time limit within which you need to recall the goods to india within one year see there for reprocessing refining remaking from the date of export you need to bring back the goods within one year suppose if you want to repair those goods you can bring it back to india within seven years in case of notified goods and other goods three years and if it is from nepal and bhutan within 10 years if you are bringing back those goods for reprocessing refining or remaking within one year or for repairs etc within that time limit at the time of import no need to pay customs duty understood at the time of import we don't have to pay customs duty generally on import we need to pay customs duty na but no need to pay customs duty why no need to pay customs duty whatever goods you are exporting the same goods are coming back to india no need to pay customs duty but you need to ensure one thing that is these imported goods for what purpose you are importing refining remaking reprocessing or repair complete that repair or reprocessing and export it within six months and it can be extended for a further period of six months then no need to pay customs duty at the time of import understood then suppose if there is any process loss it's okay that is from export to import if there is any process loss import to re-export any process loss 
So, no need to pay any customs duty on that process loss. Then section 21 already we discussed, section 24. Section 24 is denaturing and mutilation of goods. That is, you are importing some chemicals. So, these chemicals are actually having twin purpose. For example, you are importing H2SO4, sulfuric acid. This sulfuric acid can be used for laboratories as well as for manufacturing. If you are using it in laboratories, then you need to pay nil rate. If you are using it for manufacturing, you need to pay 10% rate of duty. Now, you do not want to use it in manufacture, you want to use it in laboratory. Then dilute the H2SO4 and so that at the time of import, it will not be used for manufacture, it can be used only in laboratory. So then, you are making it unfit for the other purpose and accordingly you pay the customs duty. That is, owner of the goods will make request for denaturing, that is diluting the chemicals and mutilation. For example, if you are importing a second hand car, for second hand car, the basic customs duty is 100 percent. So, 100 percent of the value of the car you need to pay as customs duty if it is a second hand car. But you do not need second hand car, you need the parts of that car. Say you have a vintage car, you are importing a second hand vintage car because you need the parts of that vintage car. Then in that case, you import the second hand car and you demolish the car, you take only the parts remaining parts, like remaining body of the car and all you demolish, so that you will pay customs duty only on the parts of the car. That is known as mutilation, breaking the machinery. Now, central government may make rules regarding the same. Duty is payable as if goods are imported in denatured or mutilated form. Then, section 25A and 25B are not applicable at present. So, this is inward processing of goods, not insured inward processing of goods and outward processing of goods, but these two sections are not applicable which is given in study material, but it is not applicable because notification for 25A and 25B are yet to be released by CBIC. So, with this we completed exemptions under customs, okay. Then we have assessment and audit under customs. So, thereafter baggage, duty drawback and other chapters we have, okay. So, can we take a break? Yes, fine. So, we will take a break and thereafter we will continue with the remaining topics, fine. And uh,
okay say this assessment and audit under custom so we completed up to procedures under customs and exemptions and now look into segment 27 assessment and audit in this assessment and audit we have section 17 self assessment section 18 provisional assessment and then we have section 99a which is audit under customs so we have only two assessment unlike gst in gst we have self assessment provisional assessment scrutiny assessment then summary assessment and best judgment assessment but in customs only two assessment self assessment and provisional assessment what is this self assessment whenever importer or exporter can compute how much customs duty they can pay so that is known as self assessment so they will be filing one bill of entry or shipping bill so duty to be self assessed by the importer or exporter importer will be filing bill of entry in that bill of entry they will compute how much customs duty they need to pay and exporter will be filing shipping bill in that they will specify how much customs duty they need to pay and whatever this bill of entry or shipping bill or bill of export which is filed by the importer or exporter will be taken up for verification by the proper officer so proper officer will verify but not all bill of entries few bill of entries will be selected on a risk parameter basis like scrutiny assessment and suppose if they identify that the value is not properly declared then in that case the customs officer following the rules of valuation that is identical goods similar goods etc so they will determine how much is the customs duty payable so that is known as reassessment of duty by the proper officer so proper officer will do reassessment if the self assessment is not done correctly and thereafter importer may agree to that and may pay the same by amending bill of entry or shipping bill suppose if importer is not agreeing to that say importer is of the opinion whatever the value that importer or exporter has declared is correct so then they may not agree to the value declared by the proper officer na then so they will not pay the customs duty as determined by the proper officer then one speaking order will be passed so once that speaking order is passed within 15 days from the date of reassessment on that speaking order they can go for appeal so within 15 days from reassessment customs officer will pass that is you can either pay customs duty as per the reassessment and pay that customs duty get your goods or don't pay customs duty so within 15 days from the date of reassessment they will be passing a speaking order and on that speaking order as an importer or exporter you can go for appeals and we don't have in customs the provisions related to appeals and all then that is it is there but not there for our exam for our syllabus okay then provisional assessment provisional assessment as per section 18 of customs act 1962 what are the various situations that leads to provisional assessment when importer or exporter is unable to compute how much is the customs duty they need to pay because they don't know the value or they don't know the customs duty rate then they can make an application to the proper officer for provisional assessment so importer unable to do self assessment or proper officer wanted to carry out certain chemical examination or test to determine the value of the goods so we declared some value but officer is of the opinion no this is not the correct value they need to do some chemical examination or test and then they will determine the value then also they will pass a provisional assessment order or proper officer needs some necessary documents or information and as importer or exporter we need to submit that information we have not submitted so then also they will pass a provisional assessment order or proper officer needed certain documents we submitted the documents but still proper officer so need further information whatever documents we submitted is not sufficient so he needed further information so then also he will be passing provisional assessment order these are the four cases where proper officer will pass provisional assessment order that is importer or exporter unable to do the self assessment or proper officer wanted to carry out the chemical examination or test or he needed documents which is not submitted by importer or exporter he need the documents which are submitted by importer or exporter but wants further inquiry so then in that case they will pass a provisional assessment order so once they pass a provisional assessment order what is the time limit within which we need to submit the documents that is why they will pass a provisional assessment order for want of documents also they will pass a provisional assessment order so then first uh, they will give a intimation to us within 15 days to furnish the documents so today they will give a intimation within 15 days we need to furnish the documents if we are unable to furnish the documents within 15 days then they can give a extension of you know one month 
plus three months by customs officer and so three months by ACDC plus unlimited time by the commissioner. Okay. So within that time, if you are not submitting the documents, then they will pass a provisional assessment order. First, they will give an intimation to us to submit the documents and that documents to be submitted within the time prescribed. If not submitted, they will pass a provisional assessment order. Now, so after provisional assessment order, they will finalize the assessment. What is the time limit within which they will finalize the assessment? We need to see whether documents are submitted by the person or not submitted by the person. If documents are submitted by the person, from the date when the person submitted the documents, from that date within two months, they will pass the final assessment order. Suppose if the documents are not submitted within one month from provisional assessment order, immediately they will pass a final assessment order. So we need to divide it into two. First provisional assessment order is passed. Document submitted within one month. Yes. Then from the date when documents are submitted within two months from that date, final assessment order will be passed. Documents not submitted within one month, then immediately they will pass a final assessment order. Then suppose if they are unable to finalize the assessment within time, so then it can be extended for a further period of three months by commissioner. Now upon final assessment, three things could happen. Final assessment amount is greater than provisional assessment amount or final assessment amount equal to provisional assessment amount or final assessment amount is less than provisional assessment amount. If final assessment amount is greater than provisional assessment amount, we need to pay the difference, correct? So that difference we need to pay within like uh, any time we can pay the difference, but interest will be computed on that. What is the general rate of interest under customs? 15% per annum. From when it will be computed? From the first day of the month in which provisional assessment is resorted, not the date after import. So for example, we imported on 28th March. Now the interest will be computed from 1st March. So in that month beginning onwards, we need to pay the interest. So differential duty along with interest at 15% per annum from the first day of the month in which the provisional assessment is ordered till the date of payment of differential duty. Then suppose if final assessment equals to provisional assessment, so already we paid that amount correctly. So we don't have to pay further amount. Suppose if final assessment amount is less than provisional assessment amount, then in that case, we whatever differential duty we excess paid, final assessment is less than provisional assessment means we paid more so that we will get as a refund what is the time limit within which we should get it as a refund three months from the date of finalization of assessment if not they will give us a interest at the rate of six percent per annum when we need to pay 18 percent sorry 15 percent when they give six percent and when we pay we need to compute from the first day of the month in which provisional assessment is resorted till the date of payment but when they give refund Three months after finalization of assessment, interest will be computed after three months after final assessment and till the date of payment. Okay. So, if not refunded, interest at 6% per annum is payable for the delay period after three months. An importer shall execute a bond and for the purpose of provisional assessment, and in case of warehousing, also they need to execute a bond. That's the reason why. Bill of entry is called as into bond bill of entry. So because they need to execute a bond for depositing the goods in the warehouse and that bond will be for three times the amount of duty payable in which case in case of warehousing and furnish security in the form of bank guarantee. Now refund of differential duty upon final assessment is subject to unjust enrichment. Unjust enrichment means what? Say for example, so we already collected the tax or duty from the recipient then in that case, we will not get the refund. Example, provisional assessment is 12%. So we paid 12%. We recovered 12% from our customer. Now the final assessment is 10%. We will not get the 2% refund. Why we will not get 2% refund? Because already we collected it from the customer. So that is known as unjust enrichment. So if the burden is already transferred, then the amount to be refunded is transferred to consumer welfare fund. Then provisional assessment is applicable for both imports and exports. And for contravention of these provisions, penalty up to 50,000. So everywhere in customs, the penalty will be up to 50,000. 
already we have seen this in case of delay in filing import manifest, arrival manifest or import report for belated filing penalty is up to 50,000. Again in this place, provisional assessment also penalty 50,000. So if at all you get any MCQ, so what is the amount of penalty payable for this offence? A, B, C, D. Whichever option you have 50,000, select that as the correct answer. Okay. So in all cases under customs, the penalty will be up to 50,000 rupees. Then next uh, audit under customs section 99A. So this audit will be post clearance audit means at the time of clearance we that audit will not be conducted. So we will first pay the customs duty and clear the goods. So thereafter, so customs officer will ask us to either bring the documents to his place or the customs officer will visit the place of the auditee and the audit will be happening. So post clearance audit is structured examination of business relevant commercial system, sale contracts, financial and non-financial records and the proper officer may carry, carry out the audit of the assessment of imported goods either in his office or in the premises of the auditing. So in that case, so what are the records that we need to maintain for? So that is we need to maintain all import and export related documents for a period of 5 years. So therefore records to be preserved for a period of 5 years and may be manual or electronic and made available to the proper officer as and when demanded. Then regulation 4 says that the RDT will be selected on a risk parameter basis means like customs department randomly will choose the importer and exporter whose records needs to be audited. Then audit can be conducted at the RDT premises also for that a 15 days prior notice to be given or it can be done at proper officer's office. Then a CRCMA can be appointed for assisting the audit but audit will not be conducted by CACMA. CACMA will only assist the department in conducting the audit but audit will be conducted, customs audit will be conducted always by the customs department and con again contravention of any provisions of these regulations leads to a penalty of up to 50,000 rupees. So this is about assessment and audit under customs. Then interest on account of delay in payment of customs duty. Here in case of self-assessment, first we see self-assessment. In case of self-assessment, what is the time limit by which we need to pay the customs duty? So we have two options here. That is immediate payment option or deferred payment option. Immediate payment option means, I told you already, if we file <laughs> bill of entry today. So today itself we need to make the payment of customs duty that is known as immediate payment option. Whereas in case of deferred payment option, we do not have to pay today itself. So we have a time limit. What is that time limit? Suppose if the bill of entry is presented from 1st April, 1st April to 15th April, okay. From 1st April to 15th April, if the bill of entry is presented, so we need to pay the customs duty by 16th working day of that month. So what is the number of holidays between 1st April to 15th April only Sundays. So we do not have any public holiday between 1st April to 15th April. So therefore two Sundays are there. So therefore what is the 16th working day again this day is not a working day. So therefore you add these two days to 17 and 18. So 19th will be taken as the due date. That is, if the bill is presented between 1st to 15th of the month, we need to take 16th working day of the month. So therefore, between 1st to 15th of April, there are two Sundays. So add the two Sundays afterwards. So therefore, 16th Sunday, do not add there. Then 17 and 18. So exactly 15 days over, 15 working days over. So what is the 16th working day? 19th will be taken as the 16th working day for making payment of customs duty. Suppose if the bill is returned for payment between 16th to end of that month, between 16th to end of that month, we need not see this month but see the next month, next month first working day. So May 1st, May is a May day, holiday. So therefore May 2nd will be taken as the due date. So if the bill is returned between 16th to end of that month, then next month first working day will be taken as the due date. But for the month of March, it is 31st March will be taken as the due date. So see this deferred payment option. Bill of entry returned from 1st to 15th day of any month 
due date is 16th day of that month excluding holidays. If bill of entry is returned for payment from 16th day of any month to the last day of that month other than March, due date is first day of the following month excluding holidays. If bill of entry is returned for payment from 16th March to 31st of March, due date is 31st of March. What will happen if you are not making the payment by this due date? So then interest will be payable at 15% per annum for every day delay beyond the due date. This is in which case deferred payment option. In case of immediate payment option, on the date of presentation of bill of entry itself, we need to pay the duty. Otherwise, for every de delay, we have to pay interest at 15% per annum. This is on account of self-assessment. Then, when it comes to provisional assessment and reassessment, so whenever they are specifying provisional assessment or reassessment, you have to pay that within one working day. So, within one working day from the date on which bill of entry is returned for payment, otherwise interest will be payable at 15 percent per annum. So, whenever the provisional assessment is finalized, when we need to pay interest, so we need to pay interest at the rate of 15 percent already we discussed from the first day of the month in which provisional assessment is resorted till the date of payment. So, these are the various interests that we have under customs. Then the next segment is duty drawback and refund. So, duty drawback we have in three situations when imported goods are exported and these imported goods are exported as such without use then we will get duty drawback under 74 subsection 1. For example, we are importing a robot from Japan and that robot is displayed in an exhibition in India and once the exhibition is over we are exporting that robot back to Japan. So, that will be called as imported goods exported as such without use. Then we will get duty drawback under 74 subsection 1. Then imported goods are exported as such after use. For example, we are importing racing cars from foreign country and we conducted a racing in India and once the race is over, we exported that racing car. So, imported goods <coughs> export <coughs> imported goods exported as such after use. Then we will get duty drawback under 74 subsection 2. Then imported goods exported after manufacture of finished goods. For example, we are importing some raw material like uh, motherboard or integrated circuits etc. and we make some mobile phones or laptops and we export it. So, imported raw material used in manufacture of finished goods which are then exported then we will get duty drawback under 75. So, 74 subsection 1 duty drawback is imported goods exported as such without use. 74 subsection 2 duty drawback is imported goods exported as such after use. 75 duty drawback is imported goods used in manufacture of finished goods which are then exported. Now, so in case of 74 input tax credit versus duty drawback. So, in case of 74 we will get a duty drawback which is customs duty paid on import. So, full customs duty paid on import we will get as duty drawback no. So, we will get a duty drawback. So, 98 percent of the customs duty paid on import whether even IGST paid on import also we will get 98 percent as refund yes. The total customs duty paid we will get 98 percent as refund. So, which means even IGST paid on import also you are getting as a refund. So, you should not claim input tax credit because if you claim input tax credit you will not get duty drawback. In case of section 74, duty drawback covers IGST and GST compensations as paid on import. Therefore, ITZ cannot be availed with respect to the same. However, in case of 75, 75 duty drawback, we will not get the duty drawback with respect to IGST and GST compensation says. So, ITZ can be availed with respect to the same and we can get refund of ITZ upon export. So, this is something which is very, very important we need to remember. If you are claiming duty drawback under 74, that duty drawback covers the entire customs duty paid on import into a prescribed percentage, which means even IGST component also we are getting as a refund. So, you should not take that IGST component as input tax credit under GST. In case of 75 duty drawback, we will get duty drawback. So, not for IGST, but for normal customs duty payable, which means that that IGST can be taken as ITC, yes, that IGST can be taken as ITC and in GST, whenever you are exporting goods or services, 
whatever ITC that you have, we will get it as a refund. That is zero rated supplies. In case of zero rated supplies, two options we have, export upon payment of IGST or export without payment of IGST and get refund of ITC. Under that, we can get the refund of ITC. Now, look into 74. 74 is applicable in which cases? Two cases we will get 74. Imported goods are exported as such without use. Imported goods are exported after use. But it is as such. Then in that case, so what is the time limit within which the imported goods should be exported? We need to export the goods within two years from the date of payment of customs duty. So today we paid customs duty. So from today, within two years, the goods should have been exported. Then we will get duty drawback. How much duty drawback we will get? In case of 74 subsection 1, 98% of the customs duty paid on import, we will get as duty drawback. But in case of 74 subsection 2, duty drawback will be at reduced rates. What is that reduced rates? You can see below the notified rates. Suppose if it is in page number 185, you can see, if it is motor vehicles imported by any person or other goods imported by individual for personal purpose, then in that case, for every quarter or part thereof, we have a reduction and remaining amount we will get as a duty drawback. These percentages are same as the percentage that we have seen in case of import of goods at concessional rate of duty for counting the depreciation on the capital goods, 4, 3, 2.5, 2. But there it is, first year, second and third year, fourth and fifth year like that we had. But here it is for every year. So therefore, for example, you are importing motor vehicles and when this will be applicable? This will be applicable in case of motor vehicles imported by any person or goods imported by an individual for personal purpose. Then in that case, imported goods exported as such, without use or after use? After use, then only 74 subsection 2 will be applicable. If it is exported without use, so we will get flat <coughs> 98% of the customs duty paid on import, we will get as duty drawback. But this is imported goods exported as such after use. Then in that case, so depending upon the, <coughs> sorry, <here. coughs> so Kerala and me, oh, it's not working out here. So when I am coming, I will come normally. But after coming here, something will happen for me. So I don't know. Maybe climate here, I did not know. My body did not accustom or what. <coughs> Say this. For every quarter or part thereof in the first year, it is 4%. And for every quarter or part thereof in the second year, it is 3%. Say for example, we are importing motor car. And that motor car we have used for 3 years and thereafter we have exported. Now how much customs duty paid on that motor car, we will get duty drawback. Total customs duty paid minus for every quarter or part thereof in the first year, 4%. Means how many quarters in first year, 4 quarters, 4 into 4, 16%. Then second year, for every quarter or part thereof in second year, it is 3%. So therefore, 4 into 3, 12. For every quarter or part thereof in the third year, 2.5%. So therefore, 4 into 2.5, 10. So therefore, we will get a duty drawback of customs duty paid minus 38%. Not that 38% we will get duty drawback. We should reduce 38%. We should reduce 38%. So remaining 62% we will get as refund. So that is this. Then what if you are exporting exactly after 4 years? After 4 years, you will not get 1 rupee also as duty drawback because you should export it within 4 years. Already you are under an extension for two years because what is the time limit within which you should have exported the goods within two years from the date of payment of customs duty plus further period approved by CBIC. So here already you are in an extension. So therefore, time frame beyond two years, CBIC should approve. Beyond four years, if you are exporting, you will not get any duty drawback. In case of other goods, that is, this is applicable in case of motor vehicles imported by any person or other goods imported by individual for personal purpose. In case of other cases, we need to see, depending upon the period of usage, we will get duty drawback. For example, we are using the goods for 0 to 3 months, 0 to 3 months and you increase it by every 3 months. So 0 to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 
and 12 to 15 and 15 to 18 and beyond 18, then first you will get 95% as duty drawback and you reduce it by 10% for 75%. So therefore, 85, then 75. Thereafter, you reduce by 5%. So 70%, 65%, 60%. Thereafter, you will not get any amount as duty drawback. So depending upon the period of usage, you will get duty drawback. So we have to increase it by 333 months up to 18 months. Beyond 18 months, you will not get duty drawback. It starts at how much? 95. It gets reduced by 10% for first three months. So 95, 85, 75. Thereafter, it gets reduced by 5% for next three months. And beyond 18 months, you will not get any duty drawback. This is applicable in which case? Other cases. And this is the duty drawback rates. That rates we need to remember. Then next one, mandatory prohibition. Still we are in 74. First we will see 74 and then we will see 75 for comparison purpose. Then 74 mandatory prohibition. As per 76 subsection 1, if the duty drawback is less than 50 rupees, you will not get duty drawback. Also, if the market price of the export goods is less than duty drawback, you will not get duty drawback. For example, you are importing goods for 1 lakh and on this 1 lakh, you paid a customs duty of 30,000. You exported these goods without use after 18 months. So then how much will be the duty drawback you will get? 98%. Imported goods exported as such without use. So we will get a duty drawback of 98%. So 30,000 into 98%, 29,400. But if you see, the market value of such goods came down to 20,000. Whether duty drawback available? No. Because as the market value of the goods is less than the amount of duty drawback. Why market value come down? Because of a flux of time. You imported for 1 lakh. But usually there will be rapid change in the technology. When there is a rapid change in the technology, definitely the market value of the goods will come down because new technology products and all will be coming. So therefore, even though you have not used, the market value of the goods have come down to 20,000 rupees. Now, you will not get duty drawback because market price of the exported goods is less than duty drawback. Then, duty drawback under 74 subsection 2 is not applicable in case of wearing apparel. That is, you imported some garments and that garments, you have used it for a function and thereafter, you are packing it and you are exporting it. So, imported goods, exported. Like lot of people who place order from this Mintra, etc. and all, so they will get the garments, they will wear it for the function, photo shoot and all will be over and Instagram photos content okay, then again pack it and send it back okay. So no, no need to pay anything, we will get the refund okay. Like that and all if you are planning for import of wearing apparel, you will not get duty drawback okay. So wearing apparel imported and exported after use. But this restriction is only in case of 74 subsection 2. Suppose imported wearing apparel and you did not remove the tag and all and you exported it as such without use. Then in that case you will get duty drawback, yes. So the restriction is only in case of 74 subsection 2. Then T chest. T chest is for the purpose of packing the tea. So we are importing tea crates, tea wooden crate. So for the purpose of packing the tea. This is like a tea box, so a wooden box. We will import that wooden box, in that tea leaves and all we will pack and we will export it. So then imported tea chest and exported after use, we will not get duty drawback. Exposed cinematograph films, practically that is irrelevant now because we are importing film reels and that film reels we are recording and thereafter we are exporting that reel back for washing. So that is not happening now the, because now we are going on to cube and other technology for relaying the movies. Then unexposed photographic plates. So photographic plates and all we will import and we will be ex exporting it after use. So even then in that case, so these four cases, so we will not get duty drawback if imported goods are exported as such after use. What are those four goods? Wearing apparel, tea chest, exposed cinematograph films, unexposed photographic films. Then next uh, we have discretionary prohibition. Discretionary prohibition means, so if imported goods which are exported to neighboring countries and likely to be smuggled back to India, we are exporting from Germany. We paid a customs duty of 100 lakhs. Now we are sending these goods to Pakistan and imported goods exported as such. 
So out of that 100 lakhs, we will get 98% refund. That is 98 lakhs. Again from Pakistan, through land route, you will bring it back to India. So if imported goods are exported to neighboring countries, which are likely to be smuggled back to India, they will not give duty drawback. Central government may notify that no duty drawback shall be admissible if any goods which post export are likely to be smuggled back into India. Then identity satisfaction. So exporter shall establish before proper officer that exported goods and imported goods are one and the same. So because imported goods should be exported as such either after use or without use. So the goods should be same. And application, we need to make an application for duty drawback claim. This is with respect to 74 duty drawback. Now, 75 duty drawback, there is no time limit. No time limit means imported goods can be converted into finished goods, manufacture of finished goods, which can be exported. But that can be even 2 years, 3 years, 4 years, 5 years also. And rates of duty drawback, we have 3 rates. All industry rate, all industry rate means they will be giving a duty drawback schedule. So as per the duty drawback schedule, depending upon our FOB value of export, a percentage of that FOB value we will give as a, they will give as a duty drawback. For example, 3% of FOB value of export is duty drawback. If FOB value of export is 200 lakhs, 200 lakhs into 3%, that is 6 lakhs we will get as duty drawback like that, okay. That is known as <coughs> all industry rate. Then we have brand rate. Brand rate is when there is no all industry rate fixed for the product. You are exporting some product, say you are exporting so prawns, fish, etc. For this, there is no duty drawback rate. Then in that case, you need to make application to the proper officer under customs to fix the all industry rate. So that is known as brand rate. And then special brand rate. If you are getting a duty drawback as per all industry rate, which is less than 80% of your actual duties or tax incidents, even then you can make an application for special brand rate. For example, you are importing some goods and on import of goods, on import of goods, so you have paid customs duty. So basic customs duty, you paid 15,000 and social welfare surcharge, you paid 1,500. So IGST is not covered here, IGST not covered and you are exporting the goods, export of goods and when you are exporting the goods, the FOB value of export, FOB value of export, this is section 74 or 75, 75, imported goods used in manufacture of finished goods which are then exported, so section 75 duty drawback, FOB value of exported goods is 8 lakhs and on that 8 lakhs, you will get a duty drawback that duty drawback is 0.8% of FOB. 0.8% of FOB means 8 lakhs into 0.8% will be 6,400. You will get 6,400 as duty drawback. Now, what is your duty incidence? What is the tax or duty incidence? Basic customs duty, social for such a, don't take IGST. So, all customs duty is excluding IGST. So, 15,000 plus 1,500, 16,500. So, if you see the percentage, so percentage of duty drawback on actual duty incidents, on actual duty incidents. So, what is the percentage of duty drawback on actual duty incidents? 6400 divided by 16500 into 100, that will be 6400 divided by 16500, 38.78%. So, therefore, you are getting a duty drawback which is less than 80% of the actual duty incidence. So therefore, you can make an application for special brand rate, okay. That is the meaning of that. Next, uh, mandatory prohibition. If the duty drawback is less than 50 rupees, you will not get same point. If the market value of the exported goods is less than duty drawback, then also you will not get duty drawback. For example, the value of the exported goods in Indian market is 30,000 and FOB value declared is 4 lakhs and duty drawback is 10% of FOB. So, 4 lakhs into 10% is what? 40,000. So, now in that case, as the duty export value, that is market price of the exported goods is less than the amount of duty drawback, you will not get duty drawback. Then, next one, the maximum duty drawback will be 
one third of the market price of exported goods. So, what is the difference between the previous condition and this condition? In the previous condition, the market value of the exported goods is less than duty drawback, you will not get duty drawback. Suppose if the market value of the exported goods is more than duty drawback amount, you will get duty drawback, but the maximum duty drawback will be one third of the market price. For example, you are exporting goods for 1 lakh, but the Indian market value of these goods is only 50,000 and you will get a duty drawback of 30,000. Now, whether the market value is less than duty drawback, no, market value is more than duty drawback. So, the previous condition is satisfied and the maximum duty drawback will be how much? One third of the market price. What is one third of the market price? 50,000 into one third, 16,667. So, that 16,667 only you will get as duty drawback. Then, no duty drawback allowed if value of exported goods is less than the value of imported materials used therein. For example, you are importing the goods for 1 lakh and you are exporting the goods for 98,000. So, there is a negative value addition. So, whatever you are importing is more than export. So, therefore, you will not get duty drawback. Means your export goods value should be more than the import goods value. So, then only you will get duty drawback. Suppose, if they fix a notified percentage of value addition. For example, if they are telling you are importing goods and your exported goods should have a value addition of 10 percent. You are importing goods for 1 lakh. How much should be your export goods value? More than 1 lakh 10,000 because you need to achieve that value addition. If value addition is not prescribed, then export value greater than import value enough. But if value addition is prescribed, your export value should be more than that value addition. So, then only you will get duty drawback then discretionary prohibition is same. That is, if the imported goods are likely to be exported and smuggled back to India, then they will not give duty drawback. Identity satisfaction not required. Why not required? First of all, 75 is applicable when imported goods are exported after process. So, which means definitely the imported goods and exported goods are not the same. So, that is why we do not have to prove identity that imported goods and exported goods are same. Then we need to make an application so, no separate application is required in case of 75, the shipping bill itself will be treated as application. So, this is about duty drawback 74 and 75 and once we make application for duty drawback, in case of 74 there is a separate application, in case of 75 the shipping bill itself will be treated as application. Once we make application for duty drawback, the duty drawback should be granted within one month from the claim date. So, otherwise interest will be payable by the government at what rate? So, today you make a claim. So, duty drawback claim. What is the time limit within which they need to give you the refund duty drawback? Within one month from the date of duty drawback claim. If not, so they will be giving us a interest at the rate of 6 percent per annum after expiry of one month till the date of actual payment. <coughs> this is payable by government to exporter. Suppose, if the exporter has got the erroneous duty drawback, erroneous duty drawback means they are not supposed to get the duty drawback, but they got the duty drawback. Then in that case, they need to pay the interest, they need to return the duty drawback amount along with interest at what rate? 15 percent, because in customs everywhere it will be 15 percent from the date of payment of duty drawback till the date of recovery of duty drawback. So, today I got the duty drawback and I am paying it after 6 months. So, for the 6 months, I need to pay interest at the rate of 18 percent, 15 percent per annum and this interest will be payable by exporter to government. Then we have refund under customs. Refund under customs is in these sections, section 26, section 26A, section 27 and section 27A. First uh, section 26 we will see. 26 refund is first you are exporting some goods. When you are exporting some goods, you pay the customs duty. Now, those goods are imported back. You have exported already, we discussed in exemptions. <coughs> At the time of export, you pay the customs duty. Now, those goods will be coming back to India. When it is coming back to India, at the time of export, whatever you paid as customs duty, that you need to, that you will get refund at the time of import. So, what is the time limit within which the goods should be imported from the date of export? If exported goods are imported within one year from the date of export, we will get the refund of customs duty paid on export. For that, we need to make application for refund within 6 months from the date of import. 
then section 26a section 26a is first we imported the goods we paid the customs duty now the goods are defective are not conforming to specifications imported goods are defective or not conforming to the specification now importer has three alternatives either he can export that back or he can relinquish the title we discussed the relinquishment of title under 26a so relinquishment of title under 26a so that is this so either he can export it back or he can relinquish the title or he can destroy those goods now whatever customs duty paid 100% of the customs duty paid he will get as refund so in case of 74 subsection 1 how much refund he will get 98% only but in case of 26a they will get 100% of customs duty paid as refund importer shall notify customs officer after clearance for home consumption and such officer shall grant refund if such goods are exported destroyed or abandoned so what is the time limit within which that export destruction or abandonment within 30 days plus 3 months from the date of import and very important point is that they should not claim duty drawback to get refund under 26a which means duty drawback under 74 subsection 1 and refund under 26a are mutually exclusive if you already claim duty drawback because there also what you are doing imported goods are exported as such without use so if you are already claiming duty drawback there then you will not get the refund here so therefore if you are not claiming duty drawback under 74 subsection 1 then under 26a you will get the refund and application for refund should be made within six months from the date of export or destruction or abandonment then section 27 section 27 is refund of excess customs duty paid so upon import or export without knowing we paid some excess customs duty that excess customs duty we will get as a refund but what is the time limit within which we need to make application for refund within one year from the date of payment and this one year is not applicable in case of duty paid under protest duty paid under protest means that is whenever we file a bill of entry or shipping bill under self assessment we studied that customs officer will do the reassessment that reassessment amount we have two options either pay and get your goods or go for appeal but if you go for appeal there will be delay i want the goods so i will pay some duty whatever customs officer is telling i will get my goods and thereafter i will go for appeal stating that as i need the goods i am paying the customs duty this is known as payment of duty under protest protest means what you are not agreeing to it but you are paying the duty now you you won the appeal when you won the appeal already you paid the customs duty so you will get the refund so for that refund the time limit of one year is not applicable then so what is the interest that you need to get what is the time limit within which they need to give refund within three months from the date of application they need to give you refund so we need to make application for refund and within three months from the date of application they need to give you refund otherwise they need to pay interest at the rate of six percent per annum after expiry of three months so these are the provisions that we have in case of refunds then segment 29 baggage baggage refers to passengers luggage in case of baggage remember baggage is something which you know usually like uh, generally also we need to learn these provisions so not necessary for exam purpose but even generally also baggage will be useful because many people will be asking us the doubt as to the, i'm bringing this should i pay duty etc and all so baggage we have certain concessions first of all on baggage you need to pay customs duty no doubt if it is a dutiable articles but we have certain relaxations what are those relaxations we need to remember please listen first relaxation is used personal effect anything you can bring you don't have to pay baggage duty so again i'm repeating you are bringing some goods in your luggage you have to pay customs duty and that customs duty not payable that is we have concessions with respect to certain goods what are those concessions first concession used personal effect used personal effects means so for necessities we will be bringing certain goods like clothes or uh, some you know cosmetics or commodities etc for our day to day requirement on that whatever may be the value we don't have to pay customs duty for example perfume bottles watches mobiles clothes 
and then uh, you know any other articles so we don't have to pay customs duty what is the used personal effects means used personal effects means so you can see the meaning of personal effects things required for satisfying daily necessities things required for satisfying daily necessities but does not include jewelry jewelry will not come under used personal effects so then next first concession is what used personal effects second concession whether travel souvenirs are also allowed yes we don't have to pay customs duty on travel souvenirs what is travel souvenirs used personal effects and travel souvenirs irrespective of value is freely allowed what is travel souvenirs as a memory of visit of that particular country we will be bringing some goods that will be known as travel souvenirs for example when people visit paris so they will be bringing one uh, mold of that eiffel tower so why that they will be keeping it in their hall and they wanted to show off that they went to paris so and they watch the eiffel tower so this uh, this something like that whenever we visit a particular country as a memory of visit to that country we will buy something and come so for that reason we will not buy 10 or 20 pieces so one or two we will buy then only it is travel souvenir if you are buying 10 or 20 pieces and you are coming then you are importing the goods that will not be called as travel souvenir that is not called as a memory here so 10 or 20 when you are bringing that is not called as a memory so one or two is allowed so that is freely allowed we don't have to pay so first one is used personal effects second one is <coughs> travel souvenirs third is laptop considered as personal effect no unfortunately laptop is not considered as personal effect because that is not falling under satisfying daily necessities but nowadays laptop has become a necessity <coughs> due to that reason a separate exemption is given for laptop passengers of 18 years and above so can bring one laptop computer or notebook computer from anywhere they are coming so but the passenger of more than 18 years 18 years and above only will have this relaxation first relaxation is used personal effect second relaxation is travel souvenir third relaxation is one laptop computer by a person greater than 18 years then next fourth concession is general free allowance general free allowance if the passenger is coming from other than nepal bhutan and myanmar and if they are tourist of foreign origin then the general free allowance will be 15000 which means 15000 worth of articles brand new articles they can bring without payment of baggage duty suppose if they are other than tourist of foreign origin then they can bring articles worth rupees 50000 without payment of customs duty suppose if they are coming from nepal bhutan myanmar and if they are you know uh, coming by land route then it is nil if they are coming by other than land route then it will be 15000 so general free allowance is divided into two passengers coming from other than nepal bhutan myanmar nepal bhutan myanmar nepal bhutan myanmar divided into two land route nil other than land route it will be 15000 rupees worth of articles they can bring if they are coming from <coughs> other than nepal bhutan myanmar again it is divided into two that is tourist of foreign origin 15000 others 50000 rupees worth of articles they can bring then next for infants is there any general free allowance no for infants who are infants not more than two years of age for them no general free allowance and all only used personal effects there is no general free allowance so for them what is required uh, the diapers uh, or feeding bottle that much only so that is allowed but you cannot bring you know mobiles uh, jewelry etc and all and say this is not my baggage that infant baggage like that we cannot say okay so that is this then fifth allowance so first allowance personal effects second allowance travel souvenir third allowance laptop fourth allowance general free allowance fifth allowance is jewelry allowance jewelry allowance so suppose if a person is taking the jewelry from india to outside india when they are leaving abroad so they need to declare what jewelry they are taking so mainly in kerala needless to say because kerala is the largest gold smuggling 
in India. Okay. So, if any coal smuggling is happening across the country, it is in Kerala. And that is where in the entire country, jewelry shops are controlled by Kerala people only. Jasalukas, Jayalukas, Malabar Gold, you know, Kalyan jewelers, everyone is from Kerala only. So, because half of Kerala is settled in Middle East and from Middle East, gold is cheap. From there, it will be coming here without payment of customs duty. So, therefore, when any person is wearing jewelry and leaving abroad, they need to declare that jewelry at the time when they are leaving and this jewelry and all will be scanned and photograph will be taken. At the time when you are returning back, if you bring the same jewelry, you do not have to pay any customs duty. Otherwise, if you miss, say for example, so girls in India and all will be exported abroad in the name of marriage. So then after, yes, so after that, when the girls are exported abroad, so they will be married to one software donkey or monkey outside India. So now this uh, person will not be looking after that girl. That girl will get fed up in her life. So she will be returning back. When he, she is returning back, she will definitely bring the jewelry which she has taken. So because mother's uh, jewelry, na, mother house jewelry. So therefore the jewelry and all she will brought. And when she is bringing that, she has to pay customs duty because at the time when she is going outside, she did not declare. So she has to pay customs duty. How much is the customs duty payable? Is there any allowance available? Yes, jewelry allowance we have. How much jewelry can be brought? In case of male passenger, 20 grams with a value cap of 50,000. And in case of female passenger, 40 grams with a value cap of 1 lakh. So what does it mean? It means... 40 grams worth of jewelry or 1 lakh, whichever is lower. In case of male passenger, 20 grams worth of jewelry or 50,000, whichever is lower. That much only allowed. Beyond that, if you are bringing, you need to pay baggage duty. Understood or not? Then, sir, is this jewelry allowance applicable just like that if we go and come? No. You should stay for more than one year. You should stay for more than one year. Otherwise, morning flight, I will go to Dubai, buy some jewelry, come. Next day, again, I will go buy some jewelry and come. No, not allowed. So, it is, you have to stay there for more than one year. Then, you can bring the jewelry and this much is allowed. Okay. Can you remember this year? How to calculate this? 40 grams ka value. <coughs> for example, if uh, we have imported 50 grams jewelry, Female passenger, 50 grams jewelry, 50 grams jewelry of 1 lakh 10,000. 50 grams worth 1 lakh 10,000. Why? Who will fix the value of this jewelry? It will be fixed by the government. So, for 18 carat, 22 carat, 24 carat, so they will be fixing a tariff value. So, therefore, 1 lakh 10,000 like that a value has been fixed. So, now how much is allowed? A, 40 grams value. What is 40 grams value? 1 lakh 10,000 divided by 50 grams into 40 grams. So, 1 lakh 10,000 divided by 50 into 40, that will be 88,000. 88,000 or B, B will be 1 lakh, B will be 1 lakh, whichever is lower, whichever is lower. So, how much will be allowed as allowance? 88,000 is allowed. So, what is the dutiable value? Dutiable value is 1 lakh 10,000 minus 88,000. So, remaining will be dutiable value. So, that is 22,000. On this 22,000, can we claim general free allowance? Yes, because jewelry allowance is in addition to general free allowance, which means we have a general free allowance of 50,000 now. So, that general free allowance can be claimed for this 22,000. Then, so next allowance, this general free allowance of one passenger shall not be pooled with the general free allowance of other passenger. Say for example, so husband and wife visited abroad and they are carrying one laptop each. Husband is carrying one laptop, wife is carrying one laptop. And for their son, they purchased one gaming laptop for 90,000 and they are coming. When they are coming, husband is eligible for 50,000 general free allowance. Wife is eligible for 50,000 general free allowance which means 1 lakh worth of allowance. So, laptop is only 90,000. Then should they pay any customs duty? Yes. 
because this pooling of allowances is not allowed which means one product will be dutiable under 1% baggage only which means we need to take either husband or wife 50,000, 90,000 laptop minus 50,000 on remaining 40,000 duty will be payable. So this pooling of baggage is not allowed and general free allowance is not applicable in case of annexure 1 items. What are those annexure 1 items? Total 6 items are there in annexure 1. For that we cannot claim general free allowance which means we have to pay the baggage duty that is number 1. Firearms, firearms that is pistol, gun etc. Firearms not covered under general free allowance. Number 2, cartridges of firearms beyond 50. So means up to 50 can we claim general free allowance? Yes, beyond 50 not allowed. Then cigarettes exceeding 100. Then up to 100 can we claim general free allowance? Yes, beyond 100 not available. Then cigars exceeding 25. So up to 25 cigars can we claim general free allowance? Yes. Then tobacco exceeding 125 grams. So up to 125 grams whether general free allowance is available? Yes. So who will bring all these things? People will bring air. So tobacco and all because if you see, so some North Indian people, not all, some North Indian people without tobacco, they cannot survive. They will be always chewing. If you go to Mumbai and all, everywhere they will spit, okay. So on the street and all. So therefore without tobacco, they cannot survive, okay. So that case, tobacco, how much rich they may be, so they will be having some tobacco, chewing tobacco they need. You understood or not? That much popular it is. Like how you guys cannot survive without uh, alcohol, so they, they cannot survive without tobacco. And therefore tobacco they will be bringing. So then in that case, up to 125 grams will be allowed and beyond 125 grams, general relevance not available. So what are the first three goods that we need to remember? Firearms, cartridges of firearms beyond 50, cigarettes exceeding 100, cigars exceeding 25, tobacco exceeding 125 grams. Then next, alcoholic liquor or wine in excess of 2 liters, means up to 2 liters can we claim general relevance? Yes. And beyond 2 liters, general relevance not possible. Sir, can I bring alcohol under used personal effect also? Yes, you can bring, but for that reason, not 10, 20 bottles and all. So, that is you can open bottle, drink something and you can bring it under general flea elements, under personal effects. So, that, that is sir, I cannot survive without drinking alcohol sir, it is my daily necessity. So, then you can bring it under personal effect. For the 10 bottles if you open and drink something and bring, that is not considered as personal effect, okay. So, then how many liters are allowed? New bottle, unopened bottle, how many liters? General flea elements, 2 liters. So, beyond 2 liters, you will not get general free allowance. Then, gold or silver in any form other than ornaments, any form other than ornaments, that is gold bars, silver bars or gold biscuits, etc. So, that is not allowed under general free allowance. Then, LED, LCD, plasma TV also not allowed under general free allowance. So, which means <coughs> on this, we need to pay the baggage duty. Now, total 6 goods general relevance is not available, that is, number 1, so firearms, number 2, cartridges of firearms exceeding 50, cigarettes exceeding 100, cigars exceeding 25, tobacco exceeding 125 grams, alcoholic liquor in excess of 2 liters, gold or silver any form other than ornaments and LED, LCD, plasma, TV. Now, what is the rate of baggage duty? The rate of baggage duty is 38.5 percent, but for annexure one items, which annexure one items? These three annexure one items, which three? First three, firearms, cartridges of firearms exceeding 50, cigarettes exceeding 100 or cigars exceeding 25 and tobacco exceeding 125 grams, the baggage duty will be 110 percent. So, for the first three, the baggage duty will be 1 percent, for the next three and normally the baggage duty will be 38.5 percent. Then. Next allowance is allowance to a passenger who is returning from abroad. That is, they went there for official visit or any visit and they literally so stayed there for some time. And now they are coming here. When they are coming, they will also bring some household articles. Like lot of uh, people who go abroad will be purchasing kettle, rice cooker, then sandwich maker, iron box, this and all they will buy there. 
and because they will be staying there for some six months like that and when they are returning they will not only bring their used personal effects but some household articles also they will be bringing when they are bringing those household articles for that household articles we have allowance if they stay for zero to three months abroad they will not get any allowance for household articles but if they are staying there for three to six months they can bring articles worth 60,000 rupees. Six months to one year, see the last number, six, 60,000. Six months to one year, one, one lakh. And minimum one year preceding two years, so two lakhs. Beyond that, they can bring articles up to five lakhs. Which articles? Household articles. But in that household articles, annexure one is not allowed, annexure two also not allowed. Other than this, means color TV, video home theater system, dishwasher, refrigerator of capacity 300 more than 300 liters up to 300 liters refrigerator can we bring yes so deep freezer video camera cinematograph film of 35 mm and above so these are annexure to articles which are not allowed means remaining articles like rice cooker yes iron box yes sandwich maker yes kettle water kettle yes milk uh, boiler etc yes all those we can bring plate cup etc everything we can bring under this allowance then other points so whatever allowances that we discuss for the baggage is equally applicable for unaccompanied baggage also what is unaccompanied baggage the baggage which comes within one month after passenger arrival or two months before passenger arrival is known as unaccompanied baggage remember a for after b for before a is one b is two correct alphabet a is first number alphabet b is two second number so, therefore, what is called as unaccompanied baggage within one month after arrival, A for after and B for before, within two months before arrival, understood? What is called as unaccompanied baggage? Baggage which comes within one month after passenger's arrival and two months before passenger's arrival is known as unaccompanied baggage. For that also, these allowances will be applicable. Then what about the member of the crew? So, the person who is working in the flights, so member of crew, they can every time when they go and come abroad, they will not get these allowances and all. So then in that be the case, so entirely whatever goods that are there in India, this crew only will bring. Every time 50,000 worth of articles means, so everything they only will bring. But no, how much of articles they can bring? Up to 1,500 rupees. Means what? Chocolates or some small, small petty items they can bring. But not more than that. Only 1,500 rupees worth of articles. Then passenger carrying non-dutiable goods and non-prohibited goods shall walk through green channel. So in the international airport, so there will be two channels, green channel and red channel. If, you are, if I am bringing any non-dutiable articles, I need to walk through green channel. If I am bringing any dutiable articles, I need to walk through the red channel. And passenger has to make true and full declaration regarding the contents of the baggage and temporary detention of baggage this is section 80 so whenever i am importing some goods and on that goods i have to pay baggage duty but i know that if i pay baggage duty that price of the article is more or less the same which is available in india for example i am visiting abroad and i am bringing one led tv and the led tv i purchased for 35000 rupees 35000 rupees plus 38.5% is 48,475 but in India itself for 45,000 the TV is available. Then what I can do? I can keep the TV there and at the time when I am leaving, I can take the TV and go, no need to pay baggage duty. So that is known as temporary detention of baggage. <coughs> Where the baggage of the passenger contains any article which is dutiable or the import of which is prohibited and in respect of which a true declaration has been made, the proper officer may at the request of the passenger detain such goods for the purpose of being returned to him on his leaving India. For any reason the passenger is not able to collect the article, then the article may be returned to him through any other passenger or as a cargo consigned in his name. But remember, this is possible only with respect to, so baggage with respect to which true declaration has been made. For example, I am coming into India with a suitcase full of gold biscuits, okay. And uh, I walked through the green channel. 
non dutiable goods i am walking through the green channel in the green channel they will keep a x ray machine in that x ray machine so they identified that i am bringing some gold so now the customs officer stops me and i will say okay you keep this bag when i am returning i will go temporary detention of baggage not possible because you did not make a true declaration and in that case temporary detention of baggage is not possible so that is with respect to this baggage and these are the rates for firearms whether we will get general relevance no and what is the rate 110 percent for cartridges of firearms up to 50 whether general relevance available yes and what is the rate 38.5 beyond 50 general relevance not available and 110 percent like that i have given the rates and general free allowance for all the goods then next one is segment 30 warehousing under customs this is the last chapter in customs concentrate imported goods can be deposited in warehouse without payment of customs duty correct and whether these warehouses are owned by the customs department or licensed by the customs department these are licensed by the customs department and warehouses are mainly three types of warehouses public warehouse private warehouse and special warehouse public warehouse means goods belonging to any person can be deposited but in private warehouse goods belonging to that warehouse keeper only can be deposited for example i have a private warehouse then goods belonging to me only can be deposited in that warehouse whereas if it is a public warehouse goods belonging to me or goods belonging to any person can be deposited into that warehouse but in case of special warehouse only notified goods can be deposited in special warehouse and then if warehouse license is cancelled they can cancel the license of the warehouse on account of breach of condition from the license holder then the goods deposited in the warehouse should be transferred to another warehouse or cleared for home consumption within seven days from the date of cancellation order so suppose if we deposited goods in one warehouse and the warehouse license is cancelled within seven days either you clear it for home consumption or you transfer it to another warehouse and whenever we deposit the goods in warehouse we need to execute a warehousing bond that warehousing bond is of two types consignment bond and general bond if it is a consignment bond three times the duty payable we need to execute the bond if it is a general bond as specified by the officer we need to execute that bond upon execution of bond and upon filing bill of entry for warehousing or into bond bill of entry the customs officer will pass a warehousing order and what is the period for which we can deposit the goods in warehouse without payment of customs duty for a period of one year from the warehousing order remember that for a period of one year from the date of warehousing order we can deposit the goods and this one year can be reduced by the proper officer by considering the nature of the goods and this one year time limit is not applicable in case of eou ehtp stp and warehouse where manufacturing operations are permitted so for a period of one year we can deposit the goods in warehouse but there is a interest free period what is the period for which we need to pay interest because of depositing the goods in warehouse you are deferring the customs duty payable so therefore you have to pay interest what is the interest free period 90 days so interest will be payable from 91st day after the date of warehousing order overall one year you can keep the goods in warehouse but in that one year 90 days will be interest free period and beyond that you need to pay interest what is the rate of interest 15 percent per annum then we can do manufacturing and other operations in the warehouse that is we import the goods raw material and we can process the finished goods where in warehouse and we can export that finished goods we don't have to pay customs duty on the raw material again i am repeating we are importing raw material we are keeping that raw material in the warehouse and we are processing that raw material into finished goods thereafter the finished goods are exported now imported goods not cleared for home consumption kept in warehouse from there it is exported we don't have to pay customs duty on the raw material now during this manufacturing process some waste and scrap will be generated on that waste and scrap either you destroy the waste and scrap or you sell it in india that is clear it from warehouse if you are clearing that waste and scrap from warehouse you need to pay customs duty only on that waste and scrap 
read that manufacturing and other operations are permitted in the warehouse and duty not payable on that warehouse goods if processed goods are exported. <coughs> However, customs duty payable on the waste and scrap at the rate applicable to waste and scrap arising out of manufacture if that waste and scrap is not destroyed within the warehouse. Got the clarity? Then, in case of volatile goods, customs duty not payable on the quantity lost on account of evaporation or other natural causes. For example, we imported uh, whiskey, okay, we imported whiskey in one barrel and that whiskey usually we will not import it in uh, bottles and all. Any, any whiskey for that matter, let it be Old Monk or Antiquity or Jack Daniels, these brands and all are international brands. How you know sir, general knowledge only are, okay. So, I do not have any experience in that and all. So, but uh, I know the brands, I mean, brands I am telling. So, we are importing that not in bottles. So, we will import it in barrels. So, that barrels when we are importing, so we keep it in the warehouse and thereafter we will convert it into the bottles and then it will be sold in India. But when it is imported and kept in the barrels, what will happen? <coughs> On account of excess heat, so whiskey is also having the evaporation property. So therefore, it will get evaporated. When it gets evaporated, we imported 10,000 liters. But at the time of clearance from the warehouse, only 9,500 liters are there. So what happened to 50 liters? Natural causes evaporated. Now we need to pay customs duty on 10,000 liters or 9,500 liters, only on 9,500 liters. In case of volatile goods, customs duty not payable on the quantity lost on account of evaporation or other natural causes. Then see this. So whenever we are importing the goods, that imported goods may be deposited in a public warehouse or may be deposited in a private warehouse or may be deposited in a special warehouse. So, this public warehouse, what goods can be deposited? Goods belonging to any person. Private warehouse, goods belonging to license holder. Special warehouse, notified goods belonging to any person. This public warehouse, private warehouse and special warehouse, all three warehouses are licensed by the principal commissioner or commissioner. And this public warehouse and private warehouse will be under records based control whereas this special warehouse will be under physical control. So any imported goods in port or airport first for a period of 30 days it will be under the control of a custodian and within that 30 days we need to file bill of entry for warehousing or into bond bill of entry and we need to clear the goods to the warehouse without payment of customs duty but we need to execute a bond. Now, after the date when we deposited the goods in the warehouse, so can we do manufacturing and other operations in the warehouse? Yes. And for what period we can deposit the goods in warehouse? In case of EOU, EHTP, STP or private warehouse, no time limit. But in case of others, one year from the date of warehousing order. Interest free period, so in case of this, no interest, EOU, EHTP, STP. But for others, what is the interest free period? 90 days from the date of warehousing order. Now, from the warehouse, where we can clear, either we can clear it to another warehouse or we can clear it to importer's place or we can export it from the warehouse. Suppose, from one warehouse to another warehouse, if we are clearing, so whether customs duty payable or not payable, not payable because we are not clearing it for home consumption. Still, the goods are in the warehouse only. So, no bill of entry but a transfer request to be made and customs duty not payable whatever bond that we have executed that will be retained. Suppose, if the goods are cleared for home consumption by the importer, they need to file one bill of entry. <coughs> what is that bill of entry? Ex bond bill of entry for home consumption and upon payment of customs duty, the bond will be released. And there is one case law here, Kesoram Rayan case and SBEC Sugars case. So, this Kesoram Rayan case and SBEC Sugars case of Supreme Court says that, goods deemed to be improperly cleared upon expiry of warehousing period. We imported the goods, we deposited the goods in warehouse. What is the period for which we can deposit the goods in warehouse? One year. So now, one year or any time prescribed by the officer. Now, the time limit is over. When the time limit is over, still you are keeping the goods, 
the goods are deemed to be improperly cleared from the warehouse upon expiry of the warehousing period. That is, these two cases, Kesoram Rayan case and SBEC Sugars case. Goods deemed to be improperly cleared on expiry of warehousing period. Then, suppose if the imported goods which are kept in warehouse is exported, whether we need to file any bill of entry, no. But shipping bill needs to be filed for export. Whether we need to pay customs duty, no. Customs duty not payable. Why? Because first of all, goods did not cross the customs barrier. So, therefore, bond will be released. Then, when the goods are in the warehouse, what are the rights of the importer? So, they can inspect the goods. They can check the goods. They can sort the goods. And they can show them for sale. But, they need to exercise caution to prevent loss or deterioration and damage. Why? Because if the goods which are deposited in the warehouse, if the value of the goods come down, damage happens, then we will not pay full customs duty. We will pay abatement. So, we will pay abated customs duty. That is the reason why we need to exercise the care and caution with respect to that warehoused goods. So, this is about warehousing provisions that we have. Then next one, foreign trade policy. The last segment. So, customs we have completed and uh, so whatever we have discussed in this, so from valuation and type of customs duty, one question guaranteed. Valuation and type of customs duty, one question guaranteed and the weightage will be of like uh, around 5 to 6 marks, 5 to 6 marks. Sometimes we get a question from valuation also, type of customs duty also. Worst come only, I am telling you, like one question from these two chapters. So, that weightage from these two chapters, <coughs> including MCQ is 8 marks. Including MCQ is 8 marks. Then, that is descriptive question will be 5 or 6 marks. MCQ some 2 marks we will get. So, 8 marks is the weightage of these two chapters. Which two chapters? Types of customs duty and valuation under customs. Then, duty drawback and baggage. From duty drawback and baggage, any one question is guaranteed. So, that will be again for 4 to 5 marks. 4 to 5 marks. This they are following for every attempt. Every attempt they are following. And then exemptions, every attempt they are asking one question for 4 marks. So, therefore, these 6 chapters itself will give you 15 marks out of 20 marks. 6 chapters. What are they? Valuation, types of customs duty, duty drawback, baggage and exemptions. These five chapters. So, itself will give you 50 marks. FTP guaranteed 4 to 5 marks. So, therefore, these six chapters alone if you read also, you will be getting 20 out of 25 guaranteed. Then remaining chapters, introduction to customs, classification, procedures, assessment and audit, warehousing, etc. and all, if you read, you will get 5 marks, okay. So, therefore, I just gave you the importance, which chapters you need to focus more. Then, foreign trade policy. So, this FTP, actually May 23 will be the last attempt for this FTP, because November 23, there is a new foreign trade policy that is coming up, because from April 1st onwards, Already they released a new foreign trade policy. So, therefore, doubtful only for November 23 exam, this old foreign trade policy. Now, what is this foreign trade policy? First of all, we need to regulate the imports and encourage the exports. Why we need to regulate imports? Because imports will create a deficit balance of payments position. So, because of which the rupee will depreciate and the foreign currency will appreciate. So, therefore, we need to regulate imports imports because imports lead to foreign exchange outflow. Then we need to encourage exports. Why we need to encourage exports? Because exports leads to inflow of foreign exchange. But exports are actually not dutiable. But imports are dutiable under customs. So customs department <coughs> will encourage imports and discourage exports because they are concerned about revenue. So due to that reason, this foreign trade, regulating the foreign trade is taken from customs and given to Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So, therefore, the applicable ministry for this FTP, foreign trade policy, is not customs department or finance ministry. It will be Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Now, what is the job of this Ministry of Commerce and Industry? 
they need to regulate imports and encourage exports. Accordingly, one act has been enacted that is Foreign Trade Regulation and Development Act 1992. And this Foreign Trade Regulation and Development Act 1992 delegated the powers to Ministry of Commerce and Industry. That Ministry of Commerce and Industry in turn delegated the powers to DGFT, Directorate General of Foreign Trade, like how CBDT is for direct tax, <coughs> CBIC is for indirect taxes. For foreign trade, we have DGFT. DGFT through their regional authorities from time to time will be giving a policy for the purpose of regulating imports and encouraging exports. That policy is called as foreign trade policy. So, foreign trade policy regulates, develops and promotes international trade. So, this foreign trade policy is actually a five-year policy with annual updation. And the difference between Customs Act and foreign trade policy is that foreign trade policy is the brain of international trade, what to import, what to export. Whereas, the body of the international trade, that is how to import, how to export, what customs duty payable, that is contained in Customs Act contains procedure, valuation and consequences. The current FTP is up to 2015-2023. So, therefore, up to 31st March 2023, they extended the current FTP. So, up to 31st March 2023. So, actually it was expired by 2020, but they extended for a further period of 3 years. And the contents of foreign trade policy are basic policy plus export incentives. That alone we have in syllabus. But this handbook of procedures, <coughs> ayat niryat forms, standard input output norms, harmonized system of coding, these are all not there. But these are all there in FTP. But what we have for CA final exam is only basic policy plus export incentives. So what does the basic policy says? Under FTP, imports are classified into broadly four. That is prohibited, then restricted, freely importable and reserved for state trading enterprises. Prohibited means those goods cannot be imported. For example, these goods made up of ivory. Ivory is there na? Elephant uh, that is ivory. So, goods made up of ivory is an example of prohibited goods that cannot be imported. Then second, nuclear reactors. So, cannot be imported without a license that is called as restricted. Restricted goods means you can import it but that requires a license that is known as restricted. Then freely importable means you can import it without any license. Freely importable does not mean no need to pay customs duty. This is not about customs duty. Here freely importable means you do not need a license to import. Then reserved for state trading enterprises. There are some articles which you cannot directly import. You need to import through state trading enterprises like if you want to import any petrol related products, petroleum products, you can import through IOC or ONGC. If you are importing any food related products, you can import only through Food Corporation of India. If you want to import any metals, etc., so it can be imported through MMTC, Multi Metal Trading Corporation. So these are some state trading enterprises, through them only we can import. So that is how imports are classified. Same way, exports are classified into three that is, prohibited, restricted, and freely exportable. So, means some goods cannot be exported at all, that is known as prohibited. Then restricted, goods can be exported, but that requires a license, that is authorization, that is restricted. Freely exportable means the goods can be exported without any license, that is known as freely exportable. So, what is this license means? License means authorization. So, this authorization will be given by DGFT through its regional authorities and authorization is not a right, means DGFT or regional authority may refuse to grant or renew. For example, you are making an application for authorization. When you are making application for authorization, they may not give the authorization or they may ren like refuse to renew the authorization if you are going for extension. So, authorization is not a right. Then restricted goods are subject to actual user condition. Actual user condition means what? The one who is importing the goods can only use those goods. That is known as actual user condition. Then every person who is importing or exporting should get a import export code. This import export code 
will be a 10 digit permanent account number of the entity. So, nothing but 10 digit permanent account number only will be considered as import export code. Then, what are the principles for the purpose of mentioning some goods as prohibited goods or restricted goods? So, why they will specify some goods as restricted goods or prohibited goods in order to safeguard India's external financial position? For example, certain luxury cars and electric cars are mentioned as you know restricted why because these luxury cars lot of outflow will be there foreign exchange outflow so in order to safeguard India's external financial position they may not allow certain goods to be freely imported they may restrict those goods then on export of foodstuff or other essential products for preventing or relieving shortages so already we had a scarce supply of some food material like paddy, wheat, etc. Now they may restrict export of these goods because end of the day people in India cannot die out of starvation. So due to that reason they may restrict these goods to be exported for preventing serious injury to the domestic industry. So there is a domestic industry with respect to manufacture of those goods and then so to protect the domestic industry also some goods may be specified as restricted or prohibited. Then on import or export for application of standards or regulations. For example, not all articles from China, Korea and all is allowed to be imported. So like uh, if you see, so in this Instagram and all, you will see lot of gadgets that these Chinese people are using for washing, for cutting vegetables, everything they use lot of gadgets. So these gadgets and all not allowed to be imported, not everything because there are some gadgets which may not meet the standards. So for which it may be prohibited or restricted. So for application of standards, then on import of fisheries for enforcement of government measures because India is exporting fisheries. So then on import of fisheries, they may regulate it. Then to imports to promote establishment of any particular industry. Why electric vehicles are restricted in India? because India wanted to focus on manufacture of electric vehicles. That is the reason why they are not giving permission for Tesla or some other electric cars to be imported because India has got huge lithium resources in Jammu and Kashmir. So they want to use this lithium resources and make batteries. So which means, so future they are looking at making electric vehicles in India. So therefore they may restrict import of that electric vehicles. That is to promote establishment of any industry or for protection of human, animal or plant life. That is, you know, in the name of some goods, if virus and all come into India and if we eat that food, sir, and if we turn into zombies and if we kill each other then it will be risk. So that's why for protection of human, animal or plant life. Then import or export of gold and silver. So then again it can be regulated. Then for the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. So there are already some natural resources. So which are like to preserve that exhaustive natural resources they may restrict export or for India's obligation under UN Charter. So India will sign a contract or agreement with the UN that these goods we will not import, these goods we will not export, so like that because of that or for protection of countries essential security interest. So for example, arms, AK-47, MI-6 rifles, these are all not allowed to be imported. Why? If it is allowed to be imported, then our country also will turn out to be like Africa. So wherein every person will be carrying one weapon and going, okay. So to protect the country's essential security interest. So these are the principles why they will restrict imports or exports, understood? Now this is an area which is not yet tested but actually it is an amendment for May 22 exam. May 22 they did not ask, November 22 also they did not ask. There is a chance of asking a theory question on this. What are the principles? for the purpose of restricting the goods or prohibiting the goods. Any five points you need to write, okay. That is why with examples I have discussed this. Then next, uh, in case of import of second hand goods, import of second hand goods, we have restriction. That is, if you are importing second hand capital goods and what are those second hand capital goods? Computers, laptops, air conditioners, diesel generator sets and photocopiers 
it is restricted even though when you are importing it in new form it may not be restricted but when you are importing it as second hand it will be restricted because these goods will emit lot of cfcs chlorofluorocarbons that spoil the environment that's the reason why import of these goods in second hand requires an authorization what are those five capital goods computers laptops air conditioners diesel generator sets and photocopiers other capital goods we don't have any restriction freely it can be imported and other goods other than capital goods so restricted that requires authorization then generally waste and scrap is always restricted waste and scrap because in the name of waste and scrap some medical waste or e waste should not come into india that's the reason why waste and scrap is generally restricted however if that waste and scrap is sold by scz to dta generally when you are buying from scz it will be treated as deemed import so but generally import of waste and scrap requires license authorization but when you are purchasing it from scz even though it is deemed import but that do not require any license then import of goods including capital goods used in projects abroad for at least one year requires any license no not require any authorization without an authorization we can import those goods say we set up a project there one power project or some uh, project we have set up where abroad and we purchase some capital goods there used in that project now we are relocating that project from abroad to india in that case we can bring all those goods without any authorization then import or export of gifts so you are importing like you are getting a gift from abroad say for example so like uh, you know now because of internet so being accessible everywhere so that uh, you started chatting with one person abroad and uh, that person fell in love with you so therefore that person is sending one gift to you from abroad and that gift is a restricted article but how will you know what product will be coming as a gift then it will not be called as gift you understood or not gift means i will not know what product it will be so therefore you are getting one article which is generally a restricted article but you got it as a gift then in that case if it is restricted articles so we don't need a license generally restricted articles requires license but here you don't know what article is coming so just a customs clearance permit is required suppose if you are getting a gift which is a greeting card etc and all then that is not restricted goods so customs clearance permit not required hope you understood what i said so that is you are getting a gift that gift contains an article which is restricted article no need of license but a customs clearance permit required you are getting a product as gift but that gift is containing a article which is not restricted then customs clearance permit not required customs clearance permit is just a document which we submit with the customs department that this article i am getting as a gift for my personal purpose so therefore you don't have to execute any license there then in case of export of gifts when you are sending the gift you know which article you are sending so therefore if it is restricted goods get a authorization if it is other than restricted goods no need of any authorization if the value is up to 5 lakhs in a year and if the value is beyond 5 lakhs a year then authorization required because government wanted to know who that playboy is because you are sending an article more than 5 lakhs in a year as gift means what kind of a human being you are and why 5 lakhs more than 5 lakhs worth of articles you are sending as gift means how many people you would have corrected so for that reason they wanted to know and that's why authorization is required that is this then next import of samples import of samples vegetable seeds bees and new drugs authorization required because in the form of vegetable seeds bees and new drugs so they will be bringing something called as virus into india so this vegetable seeds will contain some virus okay or this vegetable seeds will be genetically modified and that seed if you put into the air a plant will come that plant will give leaf and that leaves are actually drugs cocaine etc we can make out of that so that's the reason why authorization required then so some bees are imported so these bees are genetically modified 
if that bees bite you so then you will turn out into zombie so that's the reason why so that bees and all when you are importing authorization required you understood or not so too many movies i am watching you would understand so then <laughs> t up to 2000 rupees caf authorization not required so actually we are exporting t so but if you import t up to 2000 rupees because we import tea to understand what kind of tea that they need and accordingly we can make it and export okay so therefore we are importing some samples of tea up to 2000 rupees authorization not required same way samples up to 3 lakh rupees can be imported without payment of customs duty then in case of export of samples if it is freely exportable goods no restriction if it is samples of restricted goods then also no authorization but an application to dgft then these are some small small points you can read it okay this point number 7 to point number 12 just one time you read it then various export promotion scheme so what we have seen so far is basic policy then we have export incentives so export incentives total we have advance authorization and duty free import authorization this is for procurement of raw material without payment of customs duty this is one incentive then second we have epcg this epcg is for import of capital goods without any customs duty so that is a incentive so then we have number 3 merchandise export from india scheme is omitted and in that place we have rodt ep scheme rebate of duties and taxes on exported products then the next incentive is status holder under ftp so upon export performance when you achieve you will be given a status holder depending upon the status holder you will be getting certain benefits then next one will be export promotion zone schemes that is eou ehtp stp and btp what are the various incentives to them then next deemed exports so in case of certain transactions which are deemed as exports then what are the benefits so these are the various incentives now we will analyze it one by one first one is what <coughs> advance authorization duty free import authorization next one is what epcg epcg means export promotion capital goods scheme so i am just giving you the overview of the incentives first so advance authorization duty free import authorization what is the purpose of that authorization to import the raw material without payment of customs duty then epcg epcg full form export promotion capital goods scheme that is for import of capital goods without payment of customs duty okay then we have something called as rodt ep rebate of duties taxes on exported products when you are you are exporting some goods a percentage of fob you will get as a incentive that is rodt ep then we have status holder incentives that is depending upon export performance you will be given a star status so depending upon the star status you will be given some benefits that is status holder incentives and next we have eou ehtp stp and btp eou is export oriented unit ehtp is electronic hardware technology park stp is software technology park and btp is biotechnology park for them what are the incentives then finally deemed exports some transactions which are considered as deemed exports for that what are the incentives now take advance authorization duty free import authorization so <coughs> these two authorizations are for what for the purpose of procurement of inputs without payment of customs duty if you are getting advance authorization can you transfer that authorization to any other person no you cannot transfer that authorization to any other person but dfia you can transfer to any other person so if you have advance authorization what duties you are exempted from so look into duties that are exempted in case if you are having advance authorization all customs duties including igst and compensation says is also exempted so this date is 313 2023 it has been extended up to march so 313 2023 so change this to 313 2023
So, therefore, under advanced authorization, if you have advanced authorization, you can import goods without payment of any customs duty, including IGST, GST compensation, safeguard duty, anti dumping duty, anti substitute duty, everything. But if you have duty free import authorization, what duties are exempted? Only basic customs duty is exempted. So, which license is better? AR, DFIA, AA is better. But the disadvantage with AA is that advanced authorization is subject to actual user condition, which means you cannot transfer that license. But DFIA, duty free import authorization, so can be transferred once the obligation is completed. Now, which is better? DFIA is better because we can transfer, we can sell the license. So, like this, we need to evaluate which license is better and accordingly we can choose between A and DFIA. Then, what is the minimum export obligation? Means, if you are importing something, your export value should be 15 percent more than the import value in case of advanced authorization. If you are importing T, then your export should be 50 percent more than the import. So, that much is the value addition. Value addition means export value should be more than that 15 percent or 50 percent of the import value. But under DFIA, what is the minimum value addition for all goods? It will be 20 percent. Then period of fulfillment of export obligation means within how many years or months we need to fulfill this export obligation. 18 months from the date of issue of authorization if it is AA, if it is DFIA, 12 months from the date of filing of application. For gem and jewelry sector, for jewelry sector, so advanced authorization is applicable, but DFIA is not applicable. Fixation of standard input output norms. So, standard input output norms means for every <coughs> unit of output, how much of the input is required is known as input output norms. So, for AA, standard input output norms may not be there, even then advanced authorization will be given. But for DFIA, only when you have standard input output norms, then only a DFIA license will be given. Then, when advanced authorization will be available? Advanced authorization is issued on pre-export basis or post-export basis, that is, first you import, first you import without payment of duty use it in manufacture of finished goods, then you export, that is known as pre-export basis. First you export, how much of the quantity you used in export, that much you can import without payment of customs duty. So, irrespective of your export, if you are importing without payment of customs duty, that is pre-export. Depending upon your export quantity, once you export, means use the local material and pay customs duty on import material, export the finished goods. In that finished goods, how much of the raw material you have used, that much you can import, which is useful for subsequent export. So, then that is known as post-export basis. So, advanced authorization can be given on pre-export basis or post-export basis. But DFIA will be given only on post-export basis. Means, first you import the material, pay customs duty, use it in manufacture of finished goods, you export the finished goods. How much of material used in that export, that much material you can again import without payment of customs duty, that is post export basis. Then value addition, value addition means already I told you, so your FOB value of export should be more than 15 percent or 50 percent or 20 percent of the CIF value of import. For example, your CIF value of import is 1 lakh. How much should be your FOB value of export if the value addition is 50 percent? How much should be your FOB value of export? 1 lakh 50 thousand like that, okay. So, value addition will be calculated based on A minus B by B. So, FOB value of export minus CIF value of import divided by CIF value of import into 100. Suppose, if free of cost material is supplied by the importer outside India, then you need to include that material, notional cost of that material in both CIF value of import as well as FOB value of export for computing the value addition. Then next we have EPCG scheme, Export Promotion Capital Goods Scheme, like how AA and DFIA is for import of raw material without payment of customs duty, same way EPCG also import of capital goods without payment of customs duty. Now, 
export promotion capital goods scheme permits exporters to procure capital goods at zero customs duty in return the exporter is under an obligation to fulfill the export obligation exemption with respect to igst and gst compensations is also available then capital goods can be imported for what purpose pre production production and post production and what is the export obligation so imported capital goods without payment of customs duty how much you need to achieve as export obligation how much ever duty that you have saved on capital goods multiplied with 6 so 6 times the duty saved on capital goods you need to achieve as export obligation this is specific export obligation you can see next page <coughs> you have two types of export obligation specific export obligation and average export obligation specific export obligation means so your export should be 6 times the duty saved for example on import of capital goods you saved 50 lakhs then 50 lakhs into 6 times that will be 300 lakhs you need to export and in how many years you need to export 300 lakhs worth of goods in a period of 6 years and in that 6 years also first block of 4 years you need to export 50 percent means 150 lakhs in the next block of 2 years you need to export the balance not only this you should also maintain an average export obligation average export obligation means every year export should be at least the average of the preceding 3 years which means for example so average of the preceding 3 years is 30 lakhs means this year the export should be minimum 30 lakhs that is the meaning of maintaining the average it's like in cricket so you have a target target is so 205 runs you need to take so then you need to achieve the 205 runs that is specific export obligation and you need to maintain the run rate also that is average export obligation you understood so means in one year more export another year less export not allowed consistently we need to export that is average export obligation then suppose if I meet specific export obligation but not average export obligation then in that case I will not get the benefit if I already claim the benefit that should be returned validity of authorization authorization shall be valid for import for 18 months from the date of issue of authorization means when I should import the capital goods within 18 months then other conditions so import of capital goods shall be subject to actual user condition win smart so only those person who is importing the capital goods should use that capital goods and they cannot transfer that capital goods till the completion of export obligation but once the export obligation is completed capital goods can be sold or transferred then second hand capital goods are ineligible under this scheme only new capital goods you should import both physical exports as well as specified deemed export will be counted for export obligation then next uh, in case you are achieving 75 percent of the specific export obligation and maintaining average export obligation in three years then remaining 25 percent no need to achieve so actually we need to achieve six times the duty saved but out of that say for example 300 lakhs we need to achieve in that 300 lakhs 300 into 75 percent 225 lakhs we have already achieved in three years plus we maintain the average for three years now remaining amount 25 percent that is 75 lakhs we do not have to achieve that is this then under this scheme the capital goods are imported on full payment of applicable duties in cash and this this point is not applicable here so this later basic customs duty paid on capital goods is remitted that is so first we need to pay how this scheme will work actually advance authorization is like you can import without payment of customs duty but epcg how it will work first pay the customs duty after payment of customs duty then you will get the refund of that customs duty that is the meaning of this but in case of aa and dfia don't need to pay the customs duty at all but here pay and prove that you have completed the export obligation get the refund indigenous sourcing of capital goods and benefit to domestic supplier as deemed export so in case of aa dfia and epcg in all these three cases 
not only you are required to import without payment of custom duty, even locally also you can procure without payment of GST. Then we have MEIS scheme previously that MEIS and SEIS is now omitted, which is not there. Merchandise export from India scheme and service export from India scheme. Instead, we have RODTEP scheme that is rebate of duties and taxes on exported product. What is that? That is depending upon your exported goods, a percentage of your export you will get as a duty credit and that duty credit will be given in electronic duty credit ledger and the balance in electronic duty credit ledger can be used for payment of what? Only basic customs duty and so how it will be given? A percentage of FOB value you will get as a incentive. What you need to do is that, so you should ensure that you are bringing the proceeds, export proceeds within the time limit under FEMA. What is the time limit under FEMA? 9 months from the date of export. Otherwise, whatever rebate that has been granted under this scheme will be recovered and will be recovered from whom? Will be recovered from transferor or transferee, transferor. That's an amendment. That is, suppose if I got the benefit and I need to realize the proceeds within the time limit under FEMA. Now, that license, that is that scheme, that benefit under duty credit ledger, already we discussed in 51B, either the importer can use it for payment of basic custom duty or the balance in duty credit ledger can be transferred. Say I transferred it to you. Now, I could not realize the proceeds within the time limit under FEMA. Now, in that case, so that wrongly claimed benefit will be recovered from transferor or transferee. It will be recovered from transferor. If sale proceeds not realized within the time limit under FEMA, then the rebate granted shall be recovered from the person to whom the rebate is granted, even if such duty credit is transferred to any person. Then ineligible categories. So, in this case, we will not get RODTEP benefit. First, export of imported goods. Why? Because, <coughs> first of all, RODTEP scheme, benefit is given to you because you have paid some local taxes and duties other than GST. So, there could be some local taxes like state taxes, municipal tax or professional tax or some local body tax, etc. for that. Now, when you are importing the goods and exporting, where from you paid the local taxes on those goods, so you will not get RODTEP benefit. Same way, exports through transshipment. So, that is you are importing from one country and exporting to another country, that is transshipment. Again, there is no local taxes on those goods. Again, I am repeating, RODTEP benefit is given because you manufacture some goods in India and those goods will have some local taxes. And to give you the relief of that local taxes, they give this incentive. But when you are importing the goods which are exported or importing goods exported through transshipment, where are you manufacturing those goods in India? So there is no manufacture in India, means low, no local taxes in India. That's why you will not get RODTEP. Then export goods subject to minimum export price or export duty are restricted goods and prohibited goods are deemed exports and supply of products manufactured by DTA to SCZ or FTZ because we have not actually exported, we just sold it to SCZ. Then products manufactured by 100% EOU or customs bonded warehouse. Again, these goods are manufactured in EOU bonded warehouse means, so these are imported goods, we are not locally manufacturing it. On this EOU and bonded warehouse, there is no local taxes. Then products manufactured or exported in discharge of export obligation under AA DFIA. In case of AA DFIA, already you got the incentive, then again you will not get incentive under RODTEP. So this you have to buy heart, no other go. You need to remember this because in exam they will be giving so some cases and in those cases, which case you will get RODTEP benefit like that, they will coin one question. So now we need to take out these ineligible categories and other exports we need to see, total exports and the notified rate will be given in the question, that rate should be multiplied on these exports and you need to get how much is the benefit you will get under RODTEP. Then next, uh, status holder under FTP. Status holders means, depending upon your export performance, you will be given a star status. If you are achieving a export performance of 3 million dollars, you will be given one star status. 
if you are achieving 25 million dollars export performance to start like that 3 25 100 500 2000 you need to remember this 3 25 100 500 2000 you will get this star status then this export performance should be counted for one year or more than one year that is while counting this export performance it is not one year exports it is actually four years exports that is we need to take current year and previous three years so current year and previous three years taken together if it is three million dollars then you will get one star status current year and previous three years taken together if it is 25 million dollars you will get two star status and how many times you need to achieve this three million dollars 25 million dollars two times in a block of four years just to one time if you achieve this you will not get so two times you need to achieve means so in a block of four years two times your export performance should be like uh, two million dollars then you will get the one star status and while counting this two million dollars whether we take one year exports no first year and the prece preceding three years so will be taken for example we have uh, 2017 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22 like that. Now, here we have got, so, 2 million dollars, 2 million dollars and then here we got 5 million dollars, here we got 15 million dollars, here we got 20 million dollars, here we got 100 million dollars, here we have got, so, 150 million dollars. Now, this is for every year. Now, how to count the export performance for 2017, export performance will be current year and preceding 3 years. So, we do not have, this is the first year. So, 2 million dollars. 2018, 5 plus 2, 7. So, 2019, current year plus previous 3 years. So, 15 plus 5, 20, 22. Then, 2020, current year plus preceding 3 years. So, 20 plus 15, 35 plus 5, 40, 42. And then, current year plus preceding 3 years 100 plus 20 plus 15 135 so plus 5 140 dollars then again 2022 current year plus preceding 3 years 150 plus 100 250 so plus 20 270 so 285 dollars now this is the export performance now so first year and second year you got more than 2 million dollars so how much it should be 3 million dollars. So, 3 million dollars when are you getting consecutively 2 times? 2019. So, 2017 2 million dollars. Ignore. 2018 7 million dollars. Is it more than 3 million dollars? Yes. 2019 also more than 3 million dollars? Yes. So, you will get 1 star status in 2019. Then, when are you exceeding 25 million dollars in 2020? First time in 2021 second time so therefore in 2021 you will get two star status again <coughs> to get three star status you should achieve 100 million dollars so 2022 is 285 2021 is 140 so more than 100 dollars two times so therefore three star status you will get in 2022 understood or not this is how we need to compute then what are the benefits to the status holders authorization and customs clearances on self declaration basis they don't need any certificate from a officer and fixation of input output norms on priority within 60 days and they don't have to furnish the bank guarantee then two star export house and above that is except one star they can establish their own warehouses licensed warehouses and green channel clearance for above three star above three star means four star and five star green channel clearance then physical examination of goods is not there and all these all these people can self certify that the goods are made in india then this point is not applicable at present so no need to study that so this is about you know the status holder under ftp then export promotion zone schemes what are considered as export promotion zones eou ehtp stp and btp are considered as export promotion zones and what business they can do they can do any business other than trading other than trading they can do any business in this and they need to achieve 
a positive NFE. What is positive NFE means income in forex minus expenditure in forex they need to achieve in a period of 5 years. Suppose if they are not able to achieve in a period of 5 years, that 5 year period can be extended by 1 year. What are the benefits that they will get? They can import goods without payment of customs duty including IGST and on import of services, whatever GST they pay under RCM, they can take it as ITC and they can get it as a refund. Then next, whenever they are procuring goods locally, so they can procure the goods without payment of any GST. Then whenever they are making supply to a recipient, normally they will pay GST and whenever they are exporting goods or services, that will be treated as zero rated means export without payment of customs duty or GST and they will get the refund of ITC. So these are the various incentives that they have. Next, uh, conversion of DTA into EOU. Suppose if you are having a business in DTA and if you want to convert it into EOU, so you should have an investment of at least 50 crores in plant and machinery or your turnover should be at least 50 crores. Either your investment should be at least 50 crores or turnover should be 50 crores. Then suppose if you want to establish a new EOU, then there is a minimum investment criteria of 1 crore. Then any goods which are manufactured in EOU can be cleared to DTA, so but certain quantities can only be cleared. Then exit from EOU scheme. So whenever you want to come out of the EOU scheme, you can exit from the EOU scheme upon payment of the incentives whatever you have enjoyed. Then deemed exports. What are considered as deemed exports? So total we have 6 deemed exports concentrate. Sale to advance authorization holder. You are an advance authorization holder. I am selling some goods to you. For me it is deemed export. So you are advance authorization holder means what? You are actually exporter. You got a advance authorization because you are importing goods without payment of customs duty for export. Now you can either import without payment of customs duty or locally procure goods without payment of GST. So whenever I am selling goods to you, for me it is deemed export. Same way you are a EPCG holder. I am selling the capital goods to you, for me it is deemed export. So sale of goods to advance authorization holder, sale of goods to a EPCG holder, sale of goods to EOU. So, which will be treated as deemed export, first three. What are the first three? Sale of goods to AA, sale of goods to D EPCG, sale of goods to EOU. Then three projects, three projects, international competitive bidding projects. There are some international competitive bidding projects or nuclear power projects or projects under UN or international organization. To those three projects, if I am supplying goods, then it will be treated as deemed exports. What are they? Goods sold to international competitive bidding projects, goods sold to nuclear power projects, goods sold to you know UN or international projects, then also it will be deemed exports. So these are the six deemed exports. In case of these six deemed exports, what are the benefits? I am selling it to you, I can import without payment of customs duty, that is one benefit. Or I can import upon payment of customs duty, when I am selling it to you, I will get the refund of customs duty, refund of export duty drawback, understood or not? Just like duty drawback, import goods, pay customs duty, upon export you will get duty drawback, na? like that. I will import goods without payment of customs duty, that is one option or I will import goods upon payment of customs duty when I am selling it to you, so then I will get the refund of customs duty. So these are the various incentives that we have and any breach of these, you have to pay penalties under GST and Customs Act. So with this, we completed, so customs and FTP, okay. So with this, we finished and uh, so like majority I have covered, and uh, little bit fast, yes, I went because this is a revision and therefore you read it again once at your end so that you will be able to understand and uh, so when we start doing the questions, practice the questions, so then all these points will again be, you know, connected, okay. Fine, we will take a break and then we will continue.